Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we lift up our hearts in prayer because we trust in you. Lord, we know well the weakness and the insecurity of our hold upon this life. Comfort those who have lost loved ones during this global health crisis. When we wrestle with sad memories of mortal loss, give us the glorious hope of life eternal. Lord, provide our lawmakers with the confidence that your all-sufficient grace and power will enable them to become more than conquerors during this time of trouble. Remind them that no one who trusts in you will ultimately be disgraced. Mighty God, our forebears trusted in you and you delivered them. Be not far from us for you are the source of our hope. We pray in your great name, amen. Would you please uh, follow me in Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Senator from Iowa. Speak for one minute in morning business. Without objection. As chairman of the Finance Committee and head of the tax Task Force, I want to highlight a few areas of bipartisan economic relief we will be voting on today. Recovery checks to give Americans needed cash to provide for their families and get through our current health crisis. Look like this, $1,200 for individuals, $2,400 for married couples, 500 for each child. There's no minimum, no phase in. It starts out at the lowest level. Anyone with a social security number who is not dependent on anyone else should be eligible for a check under the income caps. We also have a very strong unemployment compensation additions to the, the present program in this bill. We also have incentives to help charities because they play a very important role in this recovery. My colleagues across the Iowa said, uh, aisle said last week that the business tax issues were corporate bailouts. That couldn't be further from the truth, and I think my Democratic colleagues now agree. This is about helping our workers keep their jobs. Our economic relief package to recover this economy has provisions to help businesses so that they have the case to keep the doors open and keep making payroll. We all worked hard along with the administration to get this job done. Now it's time to vote on this bill and deliver relief for the American people and to recover this economy, get the strong economy back that we had. I yield the floor.
Mr. President. Majority Leader of the Senate. It's only been 65 days since the first American tested positive for the new coronavirus on our soil. In barely two months, this pandemic has upended our nation. As of this morning, more than 175 million Americans have been advised to remain in their homes. More than half of our people are effectively sheltering in place. Hospitals in major cities are pushing capacity. Doctors and nurses are exhausting crucial supplies. And if that were not enough for Americans to fight to stay healthy, they're also fighting to keep their paychecks, to keep supporting their families. Combating this disease has forced our country to put huge parts of our national life on pause and triggered layoffs at a breathtaking pace. This strange new reality has forced our nation onto something like wartime footing. A fight has arrived at our shores. We did not seek it. We did not want it. But now, we're going to win it. Ten days ago, I laid out four urgent priorities for new Senate legislation to help our nation through this crisis. We had to get direct, direct financial assistance to the American people. We had to get historic aid to small businesses to keep paychecks flowing. Stabilize key industries to prevent mass layoffs. And of course, flood more resources into the frontline healthcare battle itself. One week ago, Senate Republicans laid down an initial proposal that tackled each, each of these emergency missions. Our members put forward bold plans to send cash to households, stand up historic emergency loans for Main Street, stabilize key sectors and put the full might of Congress behind our doctors, nurses, hospitals, healthcare providers, and the race for treatments and vaccines. I couldn't be prouder, Mr. President, of our colleagues. Our nation needed us to go big and go fast, and they did. The creative policies our chairman crafted in just a couple of days' time remain the central building blocks of the proposal we will pass today. But Republicans knew the nation had no time, no time, for conventional political gamesmanship. So the instant we released our first draft, I created a series of bipartisan working groups. I asked Republicans and Democrats to work together around the clock, literally around the clock, to make the bill even better. By Sunday, we had an updated proposal that was even stronger and contained even more ideas, literally from both sides, both sides. Republicans and Democrats had worked together to dramatically strengthen and rework unemployment insurance during this crisis. We had worked together to make sure lower income families could receive the full cash assistance and on and on. Well, Mr. President, I'll leave it to others to compare the bipartisan Sunday bill to the final version we will pass today and determine whether the last few changes really required or merited three days of delay, three days of delay in the face of this worsening crisis. But that Washington drama does not matter anymore. The Senate is going to stand together, act together, and pass this historic relief package today. Struggling Americans are going to go to their mailboxes and find four-figure checks to help with their bills. Why? Because the Senate stepped up. Many American families who poured everything into a restaurant or a shop or a small manufacturer are going to keep making payroll and keep their businesses alive because this Senate stepped up. Hundreds of thousands 
of workers in key sectors who might well have been laid off through no fault of their own will instead get to keep their job and continue their career because this Senate stepped up. And for the healthcare heroes who leave their own sleeping children and drive to the hospital for an all night shift, who spend hour after hour healing the sick, comforting strangers, and literally battling this disease. There will be more masks in their supply closets, more funding for their hospitals, and soon more new treatments to administer to their patients because this Senate stepped up. So today, Mr. President, the Senate will act to help the people of this country weather this storm. Nobody thinks legislation can end this. We cannot outlaw the virus. And no economic policy could fully end the hardship so long as the public health requires that we put so much of our nation's commerce on ice. This is not even a stimulus package. It is emergency relief. Emergency relief, that's what this is. No, this fight is not going to be won or lost in Washington. It's the American people who will beat this virus. Americans will keep making sacrifices to slow down the spread. Americans will keep pitching in and looking after each other. Americans will keep finding creative ways to stand united, even if they have to stand six feet apart. We'll win this fight because of people like Amy Jean Tyler, a stay-at-home mom in Oldham County, Kentucky, who's leading a drive to sew cotton masks for a local children's hospital. We'll win this fight because of people like Pastor Grant Hasty in Stearns, Kentucky, who's gathered volunteers to distribute more than 550 home-cooked meals. We'll win this fight because of people like Peg Hayes, who runs a distillery in Christian County, Kentucky, and is temporarily converting her bourbon-making facilities to churn hand sanitizer. We'll win this fight because national companies are switching production lines to make medical supplies because our largest high-tech companies are partnering with the government to throw supercomputing power right into the race for vaccines. We'll win this fight because of families, neighbors, and church communities that cannot even worship together in person because of small businesses, big businesses, public health, PhDs, and local entrepreneurs. It's been 18 years since every American was united in amazement and prayer as firefighters and first responders rushed into burning buildings on September the 11th, 2001. In the coming days and weeks, our nation is going to meet new heroes. Many may be police, firefighters, and EMTs once again. Many others will be truck drivers, grocery store clerks, and pharmacists who literally keep our supply chains running. Utility workers and delivery drivers who leave their homes so everyone else can remain in theirs. Teachers who somehow manage to keep educating their students over the internet while looking after their own kids at the very same time. And most of all, we're going to meet a whole lot of American heroes who wear scrubs and masks and gloves. Heroes who rush toward the six and wash their hands until they bleed and work around the clock to heal our friends and our families. When our nation comes through this and takes fight, when our nation comes through this and takes flight again on the other side, it will be because American heroes won this fight. All the Senate can do is to give them the resources to do it, and that's exactly what we're going to do today.
Mr. President. Senate Majority Leader. I ask you now, notwithstanding the provisions of Rule 22, the cloture motion with respect to the motion to proceed to H.R. 748 occur at a time to be determined by the Majority Leader in consultation with the Democratic Leader during today's session. Is there objection? Without objection. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. Do you have an announcement? Instant quorum oh, call. I ask the quorum call be suspended. Thank you. Without objection. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Morning business is closed. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of the motion to proceed to H.R. 748, which the clerk will report. Motion to proceed to H.R. 748, an act to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to repeal the excise tax on high-cost employer-sponsored health coverage. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. Mr. President. America has never seen anything like this before. To think that half of the people who live in the United States are under some order to either stay home or at least avoid contact with others, unheard of. This is an enemy, this virus, the likes of which we've never faced. As strong and determined as our nation is when it comes to these challenges, this is unique. And it calls for unique leadership. There are a lot of critics of the United States Congress for good reason, but I think what we've demonstrated in the last several weeks since we've addressed this coronavirus is that there is a capacity for common sense, bipartisan work, and a timeliness that is essential. The first two measures were passed in record time, one for $8 billion, <clears throat> that really opened the door for more medical resources. The second for $100 billion, uh, which tried to guarantee to people they would never have to pay to be tested for coronavirus, that there'd be adequate food supplies during this calamitous time, that we would have resources sent to the states for Medicaid reimbursement at new levels, that we would also engage people with family leave if necessary so that they could stay out of the workplace if they felt badly, and that we'd also have an idea that we would come together as a nation to move unemployment insurance with dispatch. That passed, again, in a timely way with a bipartisan vote. And then we came to the third challenge, a challenge the likes of which I've never seen in my time in Congress, and I don't imagine anyone else has because we decided in a span of about seven days to come up with a package of authorizations and appropriations which is larger than the annual federal budget for domestic discretionary spending in America. In seven days, we did what usually takes 12 months or longer, but we knew we had to because the need is that great and America was watching and wondering if we could rise to that challenge. There were some bumps in the road, and it's no surprise. An undertaking of that magnitude with this kind of pressure to get the job done quickly and properly is bound to create differences of opinion, and it did. There were moments of anxiety on the floor of the Senate and those who have followed C-SPAN. Uh, I've watched many speeches that reflected the emotional levels that were reached in this chamber. But the emotions in this chamber we're not that different than the emotions in most homes across America as people worry about whether this illness will touch their families, and if so, will they be able to conquer it? That emotion on the Senate floor led us to further negotiations in an effort to try to make a bill presented to us on Sunday better three days later. And that brings us to this moment. History will judge, as the senator from Kentucky noted earlier, as to whether there is an improvement that's been made to this bill over the last 72 hours. I'll just stand up and tell you I would testify definitely, definitely. Because just consider the first priority. We have to make sure that hospitals and clinics and health care providers at every level in America are prepared to rise to this challenge, and we know this is a challenge the likes of which we've never seen. When the governor of New York suggests that the hospitals of that great state expand their capacity by 50 percent as quickly as possible to take the incoming patients from this COVID-19 virus, and be prepared, he said, to expand it by 100 percent, we appreciate the magnitude of the challenge. On the Democratic side, our leader, Senator Schumer, has called 
it a Marshall Plan for hospitals and health care. I don't think that's an exaggeration. The bill that was presented to us on Sunday envisioned some $75 billion for that purpose, and many of us felt that was not adequate, as large as that number may be. So today we'll bring a bill to the floor that will increase that allocation for health care from the $75 billion in the bill just three days ago to $130 billion. Is it enough? Probably not, unless God spares us from the spread of this disease even further in the United States. But it says to those who are anxiously expanding their resources, expanding the number of beds, bringing in retired medical personnel, as the governor from Illinois, J.B. Pritzker, is doing, that we hear them and we're providing them the resources to go to work to fight this challenge that we face at every corner of the United States. The second thing that we set out to do when the bill was presented on Sunday was to expand the opportunity for unemployment insurance. Some have criticized us on the floor and said, don't get into structural changes. Well, you couldn't expand unemployment insurance without getting into a structural change because the system, which affects only a small percentage of Americans, is not adequate in most cases to keep a family together. If you lose your job and try to live on that unemployment check, it's hard to do. People lose their homes over that, their cars. They can't pay their utility bills. And so what we've done, it's been described as putting unemployment benefits on steroids. The amount of money which is going to be sent to families who are furloughed, laid off, or unemployed is dramatically bigger than it would have been if we hadn't restructured unemployment compensation. At the same time, the President and the White House suggested direct cash payments. We never argued against those, but said it's just a down payment. It's just a single check. We believe unemployment insurance is going to be a guarantee of payments for months to come. Since Sunday, we expanded the period of additional unemployment compensation from three months to four months. There's a big price on that, of course, but we think it's reasonable to give people peace of mind that for four months they'll be able to keep their families together as we work our th way through these medical challenges and, God willing, see our economy back on its feet. I hope that happens. I hope it's even sooner, but we're prepared for four months. The third thing we set out to do is one that's near and dear to me in my state, and I'll bet in most other states. We set out to compensate the state's and some localities, counties, and cities, which are expending substantial sums of money because of COVID-19 threats that they are facing. Let's face it, for the most part, our governors have been in the front line of defense when it comes to America's health care over the last several weeks. They've done exceptional things, and they've been called on to spend money in ways they never dreamed that they would be called on to spend. For example, unemployment benefits which involves state payments in many respects, have mushroomed and, and skyrocketed, sometimes 10 times the number that they were just last year at the same time. My governor, others, mayors, and the leaders of county government have come forward and said, are you going to help us? We're spending a lot of money because of this COVID-19. Well, this bill does it. It was not an easy task. We had to convince the other side that it was money well spent. And I'm happy to report that on a bipartisan basis, we reached that agreement. Some $150 million will be going to these state and local governments, as it should. Those are things that I believe will move us down the path toward resolving this challenge in America and doing it the proper way, always keeping in mind that the welfare of workers and their families is the paramount concern. First, the investment in the medical side to stop the onslaught. Second, the support for families and workers across America. There were some items that are still being debated on the floor here. Uh, you've heard it in the early statements by the majority leader. And those relate to the benefits to be given to businesses to keep them moving forward. We all understand the aviation industry is at the heart of the American economy. It is the, an engine in one respect to move it and a reflection of its activity in another respect. And that aviation industry is flat on its back. 
some 80 to 90 percent of the passenger load has disappeared. Hundreds of thousands of employees in the airline industry have come to us and asked for help, and we're prepared to do that. And that is part of the package that will come before us. The administration also asked for resources to be loaned to other businesses that need a helping hand. I'm not opposed to that. Some are, but I'm not. But I do believe accountability and transparency are essential. Since Sunday, we have dramatically changed this package so that there will be transparency and accountability on a timely basis as decisions are made by this administration to allocate these taxpayer funds to help these companies. Some of us learned a bitter lesson in the past when benefits were given to corporations and they were misused for stock buybacks and dividends and profiteering at a time of great national need. We don't want to repeat that story. We want to make certain that taxpayers' dollars invested in these corporations are really designed to get them back on their feet and the economy moving forward for the benefit of everyone who lives in this country. So that accountability and transparency are essential. And I believe this new agreement, some three days after the original one was proposed, is an improvement. Credit should be given to both sides for many of the things that I just mentioned because Democrats and Republicans had to agree for this to make the final package. But we believe what we'll vote on this afternoon, and I believe we'll enjoy strong bipartisan support on the floor of the Senate, is a dramatic improvement in the last 72 hours. Credit to both sides. We believe some of these ideas were essential, and that's why we voted as we did on the floor. But to reach this agreement and bring it forward, it took both sides. I want to salute my colleagues, starting with, of course, uh, the Democratic leader, Senator Schumer. He's put in some hours. I can't tell you how many times I've stepped into his office and, and Michelle, his uh, assistant, has told me he's in with Secretary Mnuchin. They spent days together, going till midnight and starting fresh early in the morning, trying to reach an agreement, which I believe we've finally done, finally. There are just a few little items left, but I don't think they'll hold us up. So to Senator Schumer, his staff, and to all my colleagues, ranking members, who pitched in in their committees of jurisdiction to try to come up with good ideas and to sell them in a bipartisan agreement, there was an exceptional amount of work. Special credit, too, to the staff, my own and the others who've come to work in this dangerous moment. We're being told to stay home, telework from home where you have to and where you can. In some cases, you can't. And those who did show up in the Capitol, including the staff that's here today on the floor, come at risk. We know that. Risk to their own health and the health of their family members and others that they love as we do. So I thank them for this. I understand that we may be gone for several weeks, and I think that is appropriate, And but for a national emergency which calls us back, and we will come back if that's necessary. I think we should take some time away from one another away from the Capitol uh, to really mind to our own health and the well-being of our own families and to work back home as best we can, teleconferencing in other ways, to let people know what we've done with this new legislation. I hope that during this period of time that I can engage my colleagues in thinking about another issue. Senator Portman, Republican of Ohio, and I have introduced legislation calling for at least an inquiry at this moment in history about remote voting or some different approach to voting that doesn't require our physical presence on the floor in times of national emergency. It just makes sense. The fact of the matter is, our meetings of the Senate almost every single day have violated CDC guidelines that tell us not to gather in a group of 10 or more. And yet we come to the floor because we have to, because this is life or death when it comes to these, this legislation that we're considering, and we know what our jobs are. We can find a better way to do this in the 21st century, using the technology that is, is available in so many different ways to have verifiable, accurate, honest voting for those who cannot or should not physically be present on the floor. I've spoken to Elizabeth McDonough, the parliamentarian of the Senate and her staff, and want to engage in a conversation. What, we're, what we know uh, is that this is historic, and it really is a dramatic change from what we've done in the past. But I don't think it's unrealistic. 
I think it, re it reflects the reality of where we are today with a public health crisis. It may reflect the reality of tomorrow, which could be some different national emergency or, God forbid, some terrorist activity that keeps us away from this Capitol building when we still have work to do. So I want to thank uh, Senator Portman, uh, Senator Klobuchar, who has really been one of the leaders in this effort, Senator Schatz, who I know uh, is a co-sponsor. We are now up to close to 20 co-sponsors on a bipartisan basis to move forward in this change in the Senate rules. I hope we can have conference calls during the time that we're physically away from the Capitol and move this idea forward. The House is considering the same thing as well. Now is the time to do it. It's time to bring this great body, the United States Senate, into the 21st century when it comes to executing our constitutional responsibility without endangering anyone, especially members and their staff and family. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Wyoming. Well, Mr. President, uh, for families, for health care workers, uh, for small businesses, people who are waking up today all across the country asking what's next, I believe that today we can report there is good news. Uh, the resolve and the determination of this Senate, working in a bipartisan way and working with the White House, have delivered a rescue plan, a rescue plan for the American people and for our American health care workers. Today we are going to pass new authorities, new resources, and new programs to deal with two crises that we as a nation are facing. One is the medical crisis, the coronavirus, and the other is the economic crisis that is a result, direct result, of the medical crisis that we are facing. The Senate is providing an overwhelming and a massive health care and re economic response package. We're doing both, and we have to do both at the same time. It's a rescue operation. The resources that our health care providers need and the resources that our economy needs. The health care resources are going to be surging for communities all around the country. Every one of the 50 states is affected. Over $100 billion for our hospitals and for the heroes who are taking care of coronavirus patients. And, and Mr. President, as you know, I'm a physician, practiced medicine for a long time in Wyoming. People go into medicine so that they can do a number of things. It, it, you, you go into medicine, and what we expect of our health care providers is to save lives, to cure the sick, and to prevent disease. For all of those men and women working in this profession, I will tell you, this will be their finest hour. We're hearing about heroes all over the country, and that's going to continue as long as this crisis is in effect. Because that's what we're asking them to do every day. Save lives, heal the sick, and prevent disease. We see that with our public health officers who are out there trying to prevent disease. We see it with, in the communities, people trying to heal the sick and to save the lives in the hospitals day and night. And what they're asking for us are resources, and that is now going to be provided in the bill that we're going to pass today and will hopefully soon be on the President's desk. So we're also surging dollars to individuals and to families and to businesses and distressed parts of our economy. Direct money. $1,200 per individual, $500 per child. You take a look at that, and $350 billion in bridge loans and grants to small and medium-sized businesses. Unemployment insurance to make workers, you know, we're talking about people who were working and ready to go to work the next day, but weren't able to because of the medical crisis affecting us. So workers who weren't able to work right now to make sure that they are made whole. Now, we have held the line against so many of the ideological issues that Democrats and specifically the Speaker of the House tried to put into this legislation. We made it clear lives are at stake. Those are debates for another day. The crisis is upon us and the rescue work needs to be done. I believe time was wasted. Time was what we should have passed this last Sunday. Time was wasted and it's time that was wasted that the American people don't have and didn't have. But today we are working on this action plan. Pass the Senate bill today to stabilize American jobs, to surge health care resources to the front lines. The House cannot delay. Mr. President, the House needs to get this passed today 
and sent to the President of the United States for his signature today. America should not wake up tomorrow and have to watch and wait and worry to see if the House was going to pass this bill. The House needs to act today. The American people need that reassurance today. But families, young people, everyone, they have committed to slowing the spread for the remainder of the 15-day window, about a week uh, more to go. People are doing it all around the country. People are going to continue to ramp up manufacturing and medical equipment, masks, ventilators, respirators, tests to save lives. People are going to cut, keep cutting red tape and pressing on scientific and medical breakthroughs for treatment and vaccines. Going forward, and I see that the minority leader on the floor, uh, going forward, we need to take a long, hard look at our supply chain. China has been exposed. We cannot allow ourselves ever again to be in any way dependent on China for medicines, for materials, or for minerals. Mr. President, my focus, along with what I know is the President's focus, is to bring America back stronger than ever before. We are a strong and a resilient nation. We will get through this. Our country's health care infrastructure and our economic resolve is today being tested. We will defeat the virus, and we will be back stronger than ever. I thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. From Washington. Mr. President, I come to the floor to thank my colleagues for all their hard work on this legislation and to urge my colleagues to move forward today because the state of Washington desperately needs this help. When I think about this package that literally has been crafted since Saturday about 10 o'clock and people running to go and collaborate, and yes, there were many challenges to that collaboration. I also think about the people who are on the front line in the state of Washington who have paid such a heavy price. From the factory worker we just lost in Everett, Washington to the COVID-19 disease, to the grocer at the Leshy grocery store who was just trying to help deliver groceries to a needed public, to the pathologist at the University of Washington who was a leader in this field but also lost his life. Real sacrifice and real crushing blows have been dealt in this disease. But today, we are responding with more help for our state. We are giving them more money for hospitals, more money for the front line with protective gear, more money for testing, and more money to support them as they continue the effort to try to stop this disease. It's so important that we give state and local governments and tribes the resources they need to be on the front lines in fighting this disease. And I thank our governor, Governor Inslee, for leading that charge every single day in trying to focus our response on this disease. Because we were the site of the first COVID-19 case, we have been at this since January 21st. And the sadness that we have all felt over the Kirkland nursing home where we lost so many patients, we hope will be a lesson for the rest of the nation to pay attention to the seriousness of this virus. We're here today, though, to also, besides giving that frontline support to states, to cities, to counties, and to our healthcare delivery system, we're also here to say we want to try to lessen the economic impacts of a shelter in place or social distancing. Our businesses, small businesses, have been hard, hit hard. Our restaurants, our other businesses who shut down, who don't have the same resources to come to Washington, D.C. and to lobby for aid and support, but are counting on us to create a program that small businesses can get both grants and loans. So the $360 billion in this program, I hope SBA will help dispatch with urgency to those businesses who have complied and have done their best to keep their employees while also shutting down their business. We also know 
that the unemployment benefits in this package, which will be for four months, will be a boost to giving people who are unemployed and the expansion of that definition to cover those who are part of a gig economy that may not have been covered in the past is important to give people the safety net to make it through this process. I wish we would have come to terms on even allowing for COBRA enhancements, particularly for the aerospace sector. I'll be filing a bill today to make sure that as we continue to move through this crisis, that we think about those who are going to have a shift or laid off, as we have seen in recent days in Everett, Washington, that they too could have health care beyond just one month of a COBRA health plan. It's so important in fighting this disease that not only we take care of unemployment benefits, but we also make sure people in unemployment have access to health care. We can't be in the midst of a pandemic and not give people affordable access to health care. I also thank my colleagues for other provisions of this package that are helping in giving individual taxpayers relief in the sense of a rebate check. Not only will individuals get a rebate check, but families a rebate check of $2,400 that should help those who have been hit hardest by this disease to help in these sustaining days in which we are sheltering in place in the state of Washington. There are so many more things that we need to do. And while I support the elements of supporting the aviation industry in this package, I wish that we would have gotten more requirements on the airline industries for the grant section of this bill. I personally believe that in the future, in a healthier airline industry, they should pay money back to the federal government. We certainly should be protecting the workforce during this time period, and that is what is most important to make sure that an airline doesn't take money from the federal government or go into bankruptcy and shortchange the workers and the workforce as has been done in previous packages to them. I fully support, though, the loan guarantee program and the loan guarantees that are so important and so qualified in this package to have very specific requirements to them. I also want to thank my colleagues from the banking committee who worked hard on provisions in this legislation to make sure there was more transparency in the process for who got access to the grants, I'm sorry, to the loans in this package. While we think of the processes we've been through before on TARP and the processes we've been through before on other lending, our colleagues here on this side of the aisle made sure that there were better requirements for oversight, inspector generals, uh, accounting of the resources, and to make sure that we knew exactly where these dollars were being spent. I know Treasury will have its hands full, but because of Democrats, we will have more transparency in exactly how those dollars go out the door. So, Mr. President, I want to thank Leader Schumer and his staff for working so diligently on this package. It has been a very hectic couple of days. And I would say a special thanks to the Commerce Committee staff, to David Strickland, Melissa Porter, uh, David Martin, Ronce Allman, who literally have been camped out for uh, probably since last Saturday, working and perfecting the language in these sections related to aviation. As I said, there's more work to do, and we all know there's more work to do. I know that I want to continue to fight for the aviation supply chain to make sure that when we come out of this crisis after an economic downturn around the globe, that the United States is well positioned to return the supply chain workforce to building one of America's best products, airplanes, one of America's greatest, actually America's single largest export, airplanes. But to do that, we're going to have to get through this crisis and protect what we think needs to be continued health care access to those laid off workers. So let's get these dollars to the front line, to our hospitals, to our states, for better equipment, for more supplies. Let's support them in doing what they do best, helping to fight this disease 
and th seeing this through to the other side of America's challenge. I thank the President and I yield the floor. Minority Leader, the First, Senate. let me thank the Senator from Washington for her hard and diligent work. No one, no one fought harder for the state of Washington, which like my state of New York is in such crisis, than the two Senators from Washington. And I thank Senator Cantwell for her great work up and down the line, whether it was the government, the companies, the people of Washington State, she was there. Now, M Mr. President, I say to the American people, Help is on the way. Big help. Quick help. I say to the American people, because Democrats insisted on making this bill better, we can now call it a bill that puts workers first, not corporations, that has a Marshall Plan for hospitals, and that has accountability, transparency, and watchdogs over much of the lending that is in this bill. Now, six days of subtle diplomacy, and here, in these mostly now empty corridors, we've shaped a bipartisan agreement on the largest rescue package in American history, which was sealed last night, a few minutes after one in the morning, when Leader McConnell and I came to the floor to announce we had an agreement. It was not a moment of celebration, but rather one of necessity. Facing an unprecedented crisis, it was the duty of the Senate to produce bipartisan legislation to send an immediate infusion of resources to our public health systems, state and local governments, small business, and American workers. As I said, from the start, Democrats had two main goals, a Marshall Plan for public health workers and hospitals on the front line and putting workers first, not corporations. Had we not asked for the Republican Party to recognize us by not going forward on those first two votes, this bill would have been much worse. Our actions made it much better. Not everything we wanted, but much, much better. And we're proud as a caucus and united as a caucus as the job we have done to improve this legislation. Because after all, this legislation will be with us not for days and not for weeks, not even for months, but probably for years to improve this legislation was worth taking an extra day or two, improving it after the Republican leader just put it down without consulting us and tried to say, take it or leave it. Now, like all compromises, this bill is far from perfect, but we believe the legislation has improved sufficiently to warrant its quick consideration and passage. Because many Democrats and Republicans we're willing to do the serious and hard work. The bill is much better than when we started. And starting yesterday morning, we all came together to get this bill done. We worked in a bipartisan way as this body should have worked and should work, and here we are. Once the language is ready, Democrats are ready to speed up the consideration of the bill as much as possible. We believe that the legislation has been improved sufficiently to warrant its quick consideration and passage. I expect the Senate can get the job done in the new few hours. Now, the American people watching should know what is in this bill, which has undergone many revisions over the past 48 hours. Many of the programs and funding authorities that are being finalized as we speak will go to them directly, the American people, and could make the difference in the next few months between putting food on the table and going hungry, between surviving this period of unemployment and financial ruin. So let me briefly run through the major components of the bill. First, as I mentioned, a Marshall Plan for the American medical system is now underway. This agreement will inject $150 billion into our hospitals and health system, headlined by a new $100 billion fund to provide our health system with whatever it needs to fight back. The grants in that fund will be available to everyone who is fighting coronavirus. Hospitals, nursing homes, community health centers, and all types of Medicaid providers and safety net providers. It includes funding for personal protective equipment, testing supplies, a surge in our health care workforce, additional Medicare funding, research into coronavirus treatments, and more. The funding will literally 
act as a lifeline as the number of COVID-19 cases continues to climb. So as I said, a Marshall Plan for American medical system is now underway. Second, workers first. Millions of workers, through no fault of their own, are losing paychecks with no way to cover their daily expenses and monthly bills. Coming to their rescue is a program Democrats devised to boost unemployment insurance. We call it unemployment insurance on steroids. The agreement increases the maximum unemployment benefit by $600 per week and ensures that laid off workers on average will receive their full pay for four months. These benefits will be much easier to access and will be expanded to include part-time, self-employed, freelancers, and gig economy workers. And the new program has a second, the first job of this program, get money into the pockets of people who are losing their jobs through no fault of their own, and it will come quickly and generously. But it has a second purpose. It will also allow companies to furlough workers so they, they can stay on as employees, so that when God willing, this crisis abates, they can quickly resume work with their employer and businesses can reassemble. When this crisis is over, we don't want every worker who's losing their job to scatter to the winds, and so many good businesses, through no fault of their own, will fall apart. By keeping them on furlough, paying them, the businesses can reassemble quickly. This proposal, unemployment insurance on steroids, will be the greatest expansion of unemployment benefits in decades, a social safety net wide enough to catch the millions of American workers who became unemployed virtually overnight woven with fibers strong enough to hold them through the worst of this crisis. As I said, we're going to pass unemployment insurance on steroids. Third, oversight, transparency, and accountability of all loans made to corporations. The Republican bill initially put the focus on rescuing industry and did not do enough to protect the hundreds and hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of workers there, those industries employ. But as a result of our negotiations, Democrats have secured crucial worker protections throughout the bill as conditions to rescuing large companies, including incentives for businesses to keep workers on the payroll during the crisis. For the nearly two million airline employees, Democrats have also secured direct payroll per payments to keep you on the job. Your collective bargaining rights will be protected and airlines will not be allowed to spend any grant money on stock buybacks or CEO bonus pay for the life of the grant plus one year. Democrats also secured tough new requirements on federal grants and loans to any industry. No stock buybacks for the length of any loan provided by the Treasury plus one additional year. Restrictions on any increases to executive compensation. A requirement to protect collective bargaining agreements. Democrats secured a prohibition on any Trump organization business or any business controlled by any other government leaders from receiving a loan from this bill. We're com we compelled the creation of Treasury, Dep a Treasury Department Special Inspector General to provide oversight of Treasury loans and investments, an accountability committee to protect taxpayer dollars, and a Congressional Oversight Commission as well. And there will be much needed transparency in these requirements as well. The Treasury Secretary must, by law, make public quickly the names and terms of loans or other assistance to corporate buyer, borrowers. I believe it was Justice Brandeis said sunlight is the great disinfectant. If any of these loans look untoward, if any of these loans don't look right, if any of these loans shouldn't go to where they're going, the public, the Congress will know quickly and that will put pressure on the Treasury Secretary not to do them and certainly not to repeat them. Fourth, resources of state, local, and tribal governments who are carrying the weight of their overburdened health networks on their budgets is there. This came down to the wire. Our Republican friends didn't want to do it, but I'm glad they acceded to our wishes here because local governments are hurting. They are spending more money than they have ever spent, and at the same time, their tax revenues have declined. And so we must help our local governments, and we will in this legislation. And it will be distributed between both 
the local government, the county governments, and the state. In the end, state and local governments will now get $150 billion, with $8 billion set aside for tribal governments. The relief is desperately needed, because state revenues have dried up almost overnight, leaving them with untenable choices about how to allocate their health care and other resources. Fifth, urgent help for small businesses. My dad was a small businessman and exterminator. He used to pace the floor Sunday nights at 2 a.m. because he didn't want to go to work. I know how small business people worry and suffer under normal times, let alone these difficult times. This bill offers $350 billion in loan forgiveness grants to small businesses to keep their existing workforce and to help pay for things like rent, mortgage, and utilities. It provides $10 billion in emergency grants to provide immediate relief for small business, business operating costs. And of course, there are many things besides in this bill. Those were the five things we pushed for. Small business was much in the bill that Leader McConnell put forward. All the rest, we as Democrats have pushed hard for and gotten in the bill. Now, there are other things too. Support for American families, including child care, education, senior care, housing, and more. One thing of particular importance to my state is public transit. The MTA is drowning after such a steep and sudden loss of ridership. Democrats asked for and now have secured $25 billion life preserver to keep those public transit systems afloat as well. And it's not just big cities. The bus systems in rural areas will depend on this as well. The bottom line is this. This bipartisan agreement will provide more resources to our public health system and protect American workers of all stripes. Now, I've said before, as I've said before, this bill is far from perfect. Many flaws remain, some serious. But by no stretch of the imagination is this the bill the Democrats would have written had we been in the majority. If Democrats held the pen, we would have designed the assistance to troubled industries in a completely different way. We would have added even more support for Medicaid, hospitals, community health centers, and nursing homes, a new patient protection, and new patient protections to ensure that everyone with coronavirus can access and afford treatment. We would have increased food assistance. We would have included mo more relief for student borrowers and prohibitions on evictions and foreclosures on Americans for the duration of the crisis. We've gotten many of those, but not all, on ev evictions and foreclosures. We would have put fir workers first in every single part of the bill. That's what we tried to do here as much as possible, but Senate Democrats are not in the majority. We knew this bill had to pass muster with a Republican administration and a failure to reach an agreement in this time of deepening, serious, painful national crisis was simply not an option. We have before us an imperfect bill, but a necessary one. Despite its flaws, it is far better than where we started, and it's time to pass it. Now, before I yield the floor, there are some people I have to recognize. The Republican chairs and Democratic ranking members and their staffs who have worked diligently on this legislation. Senators Leahy and Cardin and Shaheen and Warren and Reed and Peters and Wyden and so many more. I could name the whole caucus and their entire staffs. Thank you. This bill is better because of your long hours and hard work. The floor staff who kept this chamber open and running at all hours. We thank you. Secretary Mnuchin, Eric Euland, Mark Meadows, and their staffs, who have spent more time in my office than they'd care to admit, thank you. Now to my staff. I am blessed with the greatest staff a senator could have. They are so dedicated to the public good. They are so dedicated to this country, and you should have seen them working. Some Jerry Petrella, Megan Tyra had a little baby at home. Both of them have important roles in my staff. They met here, they got married, they're still here. They were day in, day out, but so was everybody else. So was everybody else. I want to thank my staff. And if the American people saw the work you did, they'd be so proud. So, thank you from the bottom of my heart. 
Our colleagues and our staffs have committed themselves in this way because they understand the sacrifices being made by the American people in homes and hospitals across this great nation. The working families who are at home, missing paychecks, playing teacher and provider and caregiver all at once. The thousands of Americans who are volunteering to help understaff medical facilities. The small business owners who are watching the labor of their lives evaporate in an instant, but are still paying their workers as much as they can manage. The nurses and doctors and healthcare workers who know better than anyone the risk of contracting this disease by treating infected patients, but go to work every day, working longer shifts to do God's work anyway. To them, to all Americans, I say this, help is on the way. Big help, quick help. We are going to take up this bill and pass it to care for those who are now caring for us and help carry millions of Americans through these dark times. This is certainly not the end of our work here in Congress, but rather the end of the beginning. The crisis continues to deepen. There will be difficult days ahead, and the worst may be yet to come, and we certainly may have to come back and do further legislation. But we know right now help is on the way, and we will not stop working till we see our nation through this time of extraordinary challenge. I yield the floor and note, note the absence. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It is great to be back uh, on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Um, it's a heavy obligation that we have before us. On March 17th, I was contacted by the Tri-County Health Department to note, notify me that on March uh, 10th, I had, uh, 11th, I had been in a meeting with a Coloradan who later tested positive for COVID-19, and at the advice of the Tri-County Health Department and the attending physician in the Capitol, I entered uh, self-quarantine to protect my colleagues, uh, our community, and our family, and that time has now expired uh, as of this morning. I certainly regret the fact that I missed a vote that passed 90 to 8 uh, to uh, complete phase 2 of our help to address COVID-19. I wish I had been here because the vote would have been 91 to 8. But throughout that time that I was uh, in quarantine, I had an opportunity to visit with thousands and thousands of Coloradans, uh, telephone town halls in every congressional district, to hear from business leaders, to hear from individuals who have lost their job to hear from business owners who are terrified about what happens next, to hear from parents who are at home with their kids who are out of school, not knowing if they go back at all to school, uh, how to figure out to, uh, how Zoom works, how to figure out how Skype works, how to figure out how technology works to teach their kids at home. Throughout this process, I've adopted a three-pronged approach to what we must do as a country to get through the crisis at hand. Number one, we have to address the immediate health epidemic. What we are doing to, as the experts say, flatten the curve to stop the spread, to provide the resources, the tests, the protective equipment that we need to our states to make sure that they can fight this invisible virus. What we can be doing to uh, give them the tools, the skills they need for the heroic efforts of our frontline healthcare providers, the doctors, the nurses, the clerical staff, the janitors, the classified workers, all of the people who have been so heroic to provide health care to our people. That's phase one, making sure that we stop this epidemic and address the needs of the American people. Uh, phase, uh, prong, prong two of this three-prong approach is about making sure that we provide individuals with immediate assistance, uh, people who are terrified about what happens to their job, how they're going to make ends meet, what they're going to do to put food on the table, how they're going to pay their rent, how they're going to pay their mortgage. Will they have a restaurant to go back to? That's prong two of this approach. Prong three, of course, is to get our businesses up and running again to make sure that when this health epidemic is over, this health emergency is over, we can make sure we have an economy that snaps back and runs strong. And we will do that because we as a country will rise together. We will do it united. We will do it because we in this country know how to overcome great challenges. 
We're taking these measures to quarantine and self-isolate, not because we're fearful of the virus, not because we're afraid of what will happen if we don't, but we're doing it out of love for each other. We're doing it out of love for our neighbors and our community and our parents and our grandparents and our children. We take the guidances of the health experts and the public policy experts seriously because we want to share that love with people to stop the spread so that we can avoid the surge that could overwhelm our health care systems because we know under the best case scenarios, best case scenarios, we're looking at a situation that could utilize 95% of every hospital bed in this country for the next year. We do this out of love for each other and for our community and to protect one another. In Colorado right now, we have roughly 1,000 plus confirmed COVID-19 patients. We've lost 12, perhaps more, by the time I'm giving this speech today in Colorado. These lives, those who've tested positive, their loved ones are all in my prayers today. The governor of Colorado obviously issuing emergency declarations. I just spoke with the governor a few minutes ago to talk about how we can continue to provide the resources that Colorado needs. Over two million people across the Denver metro area are now in some kind of a shelter-in-place order, ordered to stay at home. Our nation is uneasy, our future is uncertain, and the level of anxiety that our country faces is the highest I've ever seen it. But we don't need to have uneasiness about our future because we will rise together. We will come together as a nation to overcome this. We know that our future, the future of this nation will be prosperous again, that our economy will be thriving again, that our communities will be able to celebrate what we have overcome because that's what we do in this great nation. We rise, we rise together, we stand together. Coloradans have stepped up in every way possible in a uniquely Colorado way, you have hemp businesses that are now producing cotton swabs for medical needs. You have whiskey distilleries that are producing hand sanitizers for hospitals, for home health care. We have protective equipment that's being donated by the Denver Broncos and by marijuana industry and by so many other businesses across the state of Colorado who are stepping up in ways that make all of us proud. They're checking on their neighbors. They're checking on their friends, they're making sure that elderly people in their church that they've met are okay, making sure that we check in with our loved ones and those around us. We've been able to get to successful tests up and running in different places across Colorado, helping different organizations and different healthcare facilities find new ways to process this overwhelming burden. And as this place has passed phase one that gave millions of dollars to the state of Colorado and so many states around the country, as we've passed phase two, which prepared additional testing and nutrition programs and uh, other, uh, uh, other ways to meet this challenge, we now turn to phase three. Phase three addresses all three prongs of uh, my approach. It addresses the health emergency, it addresses assistance to individuals, and it addresses the ability of our economy and businesses to snap back when we address this health emergency. It needs to pass now. It should have passed days ago. I don't think the American people give a, give a hoot whether this idea was a Republican idea or whether this idea was a Democrat idea. I can tell you on my teletown halls that I have did and my conversations I've had with American people around the state of Colorado, they haven't once said to me, well, we hope the, we hope the Republican-only version passes or we hope the Democrat-only version passes. That's not what they're saying. They're saying, do your doggone job because we're scared about what happens next. Pass the relief that we need to get them back on their feet to make sure they know they're going to be able to have food on the table to pay rent. I can't imagine what somebody who built for 50 years as a small business must be going through every hour we delay wondering if that 50-year dream is going to stand and survive. Shame on the people around here who said, you know what, let's have one more day of delay, one more hour of delay. Because a Republican could get their way, or a Democrat could get their way. When I was at home, not once did I hear anybody say, could you stall a little bit more for partisan purposes? 
the American people, are rising above the fray. They are meeting this challenge in the spirit that I hear in every conversation I have. They're donating blood. They're sharing that love that I talked about with their neighbors, their communities. They're figuring out new ways to be together even when we're supposed to stand apart. That's what the American people are doing. And we're bickering about phase three, and we'll have phase four and phase five, but you know what we've done? Instead of patting ourselves on the back, you know what we've done? We've managed to get back, I hope, to the starting line. We didn't run through the tape. We haven't finished the job. We've made it, I hope, to a place where we can now know we're back at the line and we can run together to fix what will be tremendous needs and to address tremendous needs of this country, to answer the anxiety that every single one of our constituents has. That's what Congress should do. That's what Congress must do. And I am glad and I'll be proud to vote for this bill today because we have to get this job done and there's more work to do. We have to make sure that people understand that the recovery benefits that they're going to be receiving will help answer that anxiety to hopefully give them hope. That the new categories of unemployment insurance that have been created under this will also give them the ability to know it's going to be okay. To know that the small business loans that are being made available will help that restaurant stay in business. You know, I talked to Eve and Aurora, and she didn't know how she was going to survive because, yeah, she had converted her whole business to takeout, but she didn't know how successful that would be. To Roberta in Pueblo, who had the same questions about how her restaurant was going to survive. This small business loan will be able to help people pay payroll, to bring those back onto payroll that they may have let go because they didn't know how they're going to make ends meet, to pay them, to pay their utilities, to pay their rent, to pay their mortgages, and to have that loan forgiven to keep this economy in a place where it will be vibrant again. Because that's what we do in this country. We don't look back, we look forward. And in Colorado, we look up to that great Rocky Mountain horizon, and we don't look down, we look up, and we see the next horizon. And we strive for that optimistic, optimistic next day. That's what we do in Colorado. And I know this country does the same. You know, I talked to a 70-year-old Coloradan in Weld County, Colorado, who on a teletown hall, you could, you could hear it in her voice. She didn't know what she was supposed to do because she was old and older than than the experts say should be out and not following guidances. But she said, I can't find the, the disinfectants and the cleaners that, that I need. How do I find that? So we were able to find her relief. And the grocery stores have stepped up and they've provided special hours for people. And they've, they're delivering to people like the woman that I spoke to. They're providing information to their communities and they've got clerks They've got cashiers. They've got people stocking the shelves who are on the front lines of this fight as well, keeping our communities safe. So to all of them, thank you for the work that they are doing each and every day. It's important to recognize in this country that we've seen great challenges. I remember my grandmother who passed away this past year talking about her experiences in the Great Depression. This country's been through uh, the Great Depression. We've been through the Great Recession. We will make it through the Great Infection. That's what we do as a country. That's who we are as a people. The Senate will approve this bill today, and the House must approve it without delay, no excuses, no delay. Pass the doggone bill now. The American people have expected this for a long time. Shouldn't have taken this long. Do your job. Do our job. Get this done. We will act out of love for our communities. We will act out of compassion. And we will rise to the spirit that has made this country great. I've heard so many of my colleagues come together and talk about a wartime footing or they've talked about how we've mobilized in a way that uh, 
maybe the people have never seen in their lifetimes. It's reminded me, though, of what Thomas Paine wrote in The Crisis during our revolution, which actually George Washington read to his troops. And here is what Thomas Paine said. I call not upon a few, but upon all, not on this state or that state, but on every state. Up and help us. Lay your shoulders to the wheel better here to to have too much force than too little when so great an object is at stake. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and repulse it. We were taught in Sunday school that our struggles lead to perseverance. That perseverance leads to character. And that character gives us hope. We will get through this, America. We will start with this bill. We've got a lot more work to do. But to my colleagues, do our jobs. Get it done. No excuses. I yield the floor, Mr. President, and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
I'm President. The Senator from Maryland is recognized. I would ask consent that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, the people in this nation are hurting. We know that. They are very concerned about their own health. They're worried that they may be carrying the virus and they take it home to their elderly parent who could be uh, come down with the virus. They are worried about how long this social distancing and commuting from home and staying at home is going to be required in order to control the spread of the virus. They're worried about their economic circumstances, whether they're going to get a paycheck. And I am pleased that today we have an agreement with our leaders to move forward on the third stimulus package to deal with this crisis of COVID-19. I first want to express my appreciation uh, to our leadership. I have been in uh, daily, almost hourly communication with Senator Schumer, and I know how hard he's worked to make sure this package really reaches uh, the medical emergency that we have, that deals with the workers to make sure that they are protected and they are uh, protected in whatever we do, uh, that provides the help for state and local governments that provides the much needed attention to these particular issues and that we have accountability on any of the monies that are going particularly to our largest companies in this country. So I want to express my appreciation. And I am very pleased that our first priority, our very first priority, is to deal with the public health challenge. This is including what's happening in my state of Maryland and what's happening in every state in our nation. So I am pleased that in our state, it's Team Maryland. Our congressional delegation is working very closely with Governor Hogan and his cabinet, and we're working very closely with our county executives and our mayors and our private sector to do everything we can to protect the public health of the people of our state. We've done what we can locally to make sure testing is available so we understand the dimensions of this problem, and the governor has taken extraordinary steps in order to increase our medical capacity uh, in the likelihood that we're going to see a significantly increased number of those people that have the uh, coronavirus. Yes, we need to stay at home unless it is an urgent reason for us to be outside of home. And I'm frequently asked by my, uh, by, by my friends, why aren't why don't we do as much as we can in the United States Senate remotely? I think we should, including voting. So we need to distance ourselves and minimize social contact in order to prevent the spike of this disease, which would test our medical capacity to handle it. So I was pleased that the third supplemental, the agreement that's been reached that we will vote on hopefully today, that it does have a surge in our medical capacity, a Marshall Plan, to deal with our health care needs. Uh, I, I could go through a lot of the specifics. I think some have already been gone through, but I particularly appreciate the fact that we have $100 billion for our hospitals and health care facilities, including clinics uh, uh, in, in this bill. I am pleased that there is a 20% increase in hospital reimbursement rates. And I want to thank Senator Grassley and Senator Wyden for including in that provision a unique clause for the Maryland hospitals so that they can be qualified for this. Maryland has, as I think some of you know, an all-payer rate structure, and uh, we had to make sure that these provisions would apply in Maryland, and I thank them for their attention to that detail. There's also money in here for our hospitals to be ready for preparedness, which I think is extremely important. And there is a separate line of uh, appropriation for our community health centers and our federally qualified uh, health clinics. That's critically important. They're, they're being st stressed uh, as, uh, as the needs are increasing and as the cost of treatment is increasing. We need to replenish the national stockpile. We know the concerns on protective gear. We know that. We know that ventilators and respirators are in short supply. We got to make sure that we have adequate replacement of what has been taken out of our national stockpile and available now to deal with the surge that is coming under any scenario so that our healthcare workers have the protective gear that they need and our patients have the medical facilities and the respirators that they need. We also have plussed up the work being done 
to deal with the development of a vaccine. I'm pleased that NIH is getting the monies that they need in order to do the work. We, we know that we're not going to have a vaccine in time this year, but we want to make sure that we get it as soon as possible, and it's on a fast track, and these funds will help us develop that vaccine for the future needs of controlling this type of a virus. But in the meantime, we're also putting resources into therapeutic drugs, drugs that can help people that are sick today. Those drugs are not yet available, but we want to make sure we do everything we can to make them available as soon as possible. Uh, FEMA has been uh, bumped up substantially in this bill for good reason, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, and that brings me to the point that is a major improvement that's been brought in this legislation to help our state and local governments. They're the front lines of providing these public health needs, and we need to, to provide them the resources they need. So FEMA needs to be properly finding, uh, 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 appropriated, and we have the money in here to help FEMA, but we also need direct help to our local governments to deal with this, with this, uh, with this problem. Uh, and we see that our state and local uh, public health officers are getting extra money, better reporting, so we know exactly what the status is in each of our communities. All of that's important for our Marshall Plan to control this disease and get it under control. But I wanted to take this time to talk about a matter that I was working on on small business, and I mentioned that, recognizing we've got to get our economy back on track. The best way to get our economy back on track get this virus controlled, get people able to get out, to work, and to buy, and, to, and participate in our economy. That's the best thing we can do. But this package also recognizes that unless we help businesses and workers today, we're not going to be prepared for our economy uh, when we're able to rebound. So uh, my role as the senior Democrat on the Small Business Committee uh, working with uh, Senator Rubio, the chairman of that committee, was to make sure we had a robust provision to preserve the growth engine and innovation engine of our economy, and that is small businesses. There's more job growth for small companies. There's more innovation in small companies. We need to preserve the, uh, the ability of small companies to get through this time. And quite frankly, they don't have the same deep pockets that large companies have. They don't have the same availability of credit that large companies have. They don't have the same banking arrangements that large companies have. They don't have the same flexibility that large companies have. So we have to provide special attention to small businesses. And this package does that in a very, very robust way. So first, I already mentioned Senator Rubio. I thank him for his leadership. The two of us were working together well before this week. And that's why we were probably further along on helping small businesses than the other parts of this package dealing with the various economic uh, areas. Uh, Senator Shaheen was a valuable member of our team. I've worked with Senator Shaheen on small business issues for a long time. Uh, she was a key player in putting together the package that we have to present to our colleagues here in the United States Senate. I also want to acknowledge Senator Collins. It was the four of us that were meeting regularly, communicating regularly, that recommend this package that you will be shortly uh, voting on as it relates to small business. So I also, if I could, I'd like to acknowledge uh, members of my own staff that have worked literally 24-7. I've talked to them at the various times during the night and day, uh, and uh, it, it's been very stressful for all of us, but our staffs get no rest whatsoever. So to Sean Moore and the entire staff on the Democratic side of the Small Business Committee, uh, thank you on behalf of America's small businesses and workers and on behalf of our country. And to Ron Storhoff, who's been doing a lot of these provisions on my staff in regards to the the, the tax issues in regards to a lot of these other issues. Uh, thank you, thank him for all of his work. And, and to Lauren G, who's our health person, who has not only helped us put together this small business package, but she's been available to help um, Maryland health providers and, and patients to try to get through where we are today. All that's reflected in uh, the bill that we will be voting on later. And I know on the Republican side, there's been dedicated staff who have done equal work
to make sure that we have a bill that we can present today. So let me go over, if I might, some of the provisions that we have in here for small businesses. Uh, we have three new programs, three new programs to help small businesses in our community. They'll have different titles, but every one of them provide grant help to small businesses. I'm going to repeat that. You might hear this is a loan. No, these are going to be funds that go to small businesses that do not have to be repaid. These are grant money. Why? Because a small business owner can't incur more debt today when they have no idea how they're going to be able to survive in the future. We've got to provide immediate help, immediate help. It's got to be substantial, and it's got to be in a way that they know that they're not encumbering their future. And that's what we do. We want to get that message out that this is going to be immediate help to help America's small business. One program provides $350 billion of relief to small companies under 500 employees. $350 billion. It is, it is triggered by going to your financial institution and getting what's known as a 7A loan. But let me caution you, it's going to be forgiven if you follow the rules here. But you, you go to a bank, they are a financial institution, you do a 7A loan, it's 100% guaranteed by the federal government, so the bank has no risk factor here. There are no payments due for a year, so even getting into this loan, there is no obligations for uh, uh, cash outlays on behalf of the borrower. The fees have been waived. So this is a cost free opportunity to get the cash you need to keep your small business open. That's the purpose of this new program uh, under the Small Business Administration. The amount of the loan. You take your average payroll before the coronavirus was here, and you, you, you take your monthly average payroll and multiply it by 2.5. Basically, what you're getting is two months of payroll for your workers, plus an extra, uh, it comes out to an extra 25% of your payroll because it's two months of that. Now, what eligible expenses, what can you use this for? Well, you can use the, the uh, uh, two months of payroll for payroll. Pay your workers, keep them employed. It saves you the cost of rehiring if you had to furlough or, or, or lay off workers. You can keep them employed. You can use the extra funds to cover their expenses or, that you have on their health care or, or the related expenses. You can use the extra 25% for rents or mortgage payments or utility bills. So it gives you a cash to conduct your business for the next two months. It gives you the ability to keep afloat so that you're ready to rebound when the economy rebounds. So who's eligible? As I said, companies under 500, but we went beyond the traditional 7A eligibilities. For the first time under 7As, we're also allowing nonprofits to be able to get into this program so that they will also be able to stay afloat because we know the important work that nonprofits do for our community. They are also eligible. And we gave some relaxation to the 500 rule for locations that were for restaurants or hotels that have multiple locations. This is a program that's aimed at keeping businesses open and ready, small businesses, for when we get through this coronavirus. And then this amount of money that you borrowed is totally forgiven. Totally forgiven if you maintain your workforce to the pre-coronavirus level or bring back your workforce to the pre uh, coronavirus level during the stated period of time of this bill. So if you keep your workforce or bring back your workforce, the government's going to help you maintain your ability and make sure your workers get paid and their benefits are maintained. It works very well with the other provisions that are in other parts of this bill, such as the unemployment insurance benefits. Yes, if you furlough workers, you can collect unemployment benefits at basically full salary for the next four months. So that's also available to small businesses. But we want you to also know that you can keep your employees employed. 
there, ready for the business to rebound, as we hope it will shortly. Uh, so that's just one program. We have other programs available. We have a new program, which is labeled as a grant, a $10 billion grant program for emergency cash availability uh, for small businesses. There are many small businesses that have a hard time going to a bank and getting a commercial loan. There are many small businesses that need cash today. They can't wait for that process to work its way through to get that check from the Small Business Administration through one of their financial institutions. It's going to take a little bit longer for them to be able to, to get that done. So we have emergency disaster relief loans in the first supplemental. We made it clear that, uh, that uh, small businesses qualify for emergency disaster relief loans uh, if they've been adversely impacted by the coronavirus. Uh, these are direct loans coming out of the Small Business Administration. These are not uh, uh, loans that are from financial institutions. We have included that in the first supplemental. We now allow you to make that application. And with that application, if you need to get cash immediately, the SBA can write you a check for up to $10,000. And we want that done within three days. We want that money out in days, not weeks. We hear that all the time from small businesses. We need help now. Well, this program, and I, and I was pleased to work on this program. I filed legislation on it. This is a, a need that's out there today and will be available uh, to uh, small business owners. Now, we have a third program. That's two programs. You can get this uh, basically two-month uh, help from the federal government to pay your payroll and, and related expenses. You can get a $10,000 uh, immediate cash advancement on that through applying for a disaster relief loan and, and showing a need at this stage. And then there's a third program. There are many small businesses today that have existing loans under the Small Business Administration. These are 7A loans or 504 loans. 7A is the traditional loan. 504 are the, are, the, are the larger loans. What this bill does is provide $17 billion of relief. So those who have these existing loans do not need to make any payments on those loans. They're forgiven for the next six months. I particularly want to acknowledge Senator Kuhn's work on this. This is a bill that we've been working on and it's only reasonable to, to relieve. We're asking others to relieve debt. Let us do it for our small businesses under the 7A and 504 programs. So as you see, Madam President, there's a lot of provisions here that, that help our small businesses. Uh, I want to tell you that there are other, in addition to those three I just mentioned, I'm pleased that we do have contract protection in this bill, and let me explain what that means. If you're a, a business, and have a contract with the federal government. This applies to all businesses, not just small businesses, but small businesses that are particularly impacted by it. But you can't perform that government contract because you can't get access to the facility because it's shuttered as a result of the coronavirus. This bill allows you, the federal government, to make sure you have adequate funds available to pay your workers so that the, those individuals who should have been working at the federal facility will get paid during this period of time. We've also provided money for the women business centers and the minority business development centers that are there in our community. Why? Because we got to get the message out to small businesses about these new tools, how they can access banks to get these 7A loans that are forgiven that are actually grants, how they can apply to the Small Business Administration for disaster relief loans and get a cash advancement, how they can get relief from their current 7A and 504 loans. So we give money to these institutions so that uh, these entrepreneur uh, service groups so they can help women businesses and minority businesses get access. And I must tell you, Madam President, we've also put a clear intent that we expect that financial institutions to make loans to all size small businesses in all communities so that all communities can benefit uh, from this legislation. We've, inc we've increased the size of express loans under this. And, and I just want to compliment the work of, of, of other 
uh, working groups, particularly on the tax provisions. Uh, I was very pleased to work with Senator Wyden. The two of us worked on what's known as a retention credit, which allows uh, companies uh, that have furlough workers to bring those workers back and get a credit up to 50 percent of that sal of that wage uh, up to ten thousand uh, dollars from the as a tax credit in order to bring back those workers well for some small businesses that may be a better option than what i've outlined before in regards to the the two two and a half months of of uh of of, of aid based upon payroll you have a choice if you can do better under retention credit it's a new credit use that credit if not use the other small businesses are given more flexibility thank you senator wyden for uh, helping us i'm also going to acknowledge senator warner who was very instrumental uh, in, in getting uh, that provision uh, adopted so madam president you see there is a whole range of uh, of tools in here to keep small businesses operating paying their workers so they don't have to reinvent their employment their employers, employees after this crisis is over, that they can keep qualified people uh, employed, they get the paychecks, and our economy is ready to get back into shape. Now, there, there are many other provisions in this bill, including the cash payments under the IRS, $1,200 per taxpayer, that will help in this regard. When you put this all together, this is a robust package to bring our economy, to hold our economy uh, so that it can perform at a level that it's ready to take off again without the dire consequences of people not having income in order to pay their bills. Through these small business provisions, small business owners can keep their businesses intact. Through unemployment insurance, those that are laid off or furloughed can get their salaries. Through the IRS checks, people will have some cash. Through some of these other programs, we are providing relief, like delaying the time of paying the employer's share of the FICA taxes. You put that all together, there is a lot of help out here to keep our economy going during this crisis with particular focus on the workers and on small business. Last point I should point out, the self-employed, the gig economy are fully covered under the small business provisions. They're fully covered under the UI provisions. We are trying to make sure that we preserve our economy, that we preserve workers and their families and their abilities to pay their bills. And I think when you take a look at this whole package, the challenge will be to get the information out to, the, to our constituents, to these businesses, to these workers, so they know what's in this package so that they can act now. Because quite frankly, people are desperate, companies are desperate. When malls are closed as they are in Maryland, and you're operating a small business in that mall, have no business at all, you don't know how you're gonna make your next payroll. You've gotta make decisions today. That's why it's important that we vote on this bill today. We get it to the president as soon as possible, get the information out to the, to the small businesses and to, and to the workers and to all businesses that we are here to help keep them open, to keep their, the paychecks flowing, to keep our economy moving, that we're in this together, we're gonna to get through this period of time, our economy is gonna come back, but we want you to know to take advantage of these tools so that we can minimize the adverse impact of the coronavirus. And with that, Madam President, I would yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Oklahoma is recognized. This morning, Technical Sergeant Marshall Roberts of Oklahoma came home. It was a dignified transfer in Tulsa, Oklahoma earlier this morning. And there were a lot of people that wanted to be there, but because of COVID-19 could not but a lot of other folks were. Tech Sergeant Marshall Roberts was killed in, a, in Iraq Wednesday, March the 11th, when his unit was engaged by indirect enemy fire 
while they were sleeping. He was 17 miles north of Baghdad. He's deployed with the 219th Engineering Installation Squadron, a subordinate unit of the 138th out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was in the process of building communications infrastructure as part of the fight against ISIS. The operation that Robert served in, Operation Inherent Resolve, has been a vital part of protecting our nation and bringing stability to the region. Robert's enlisted in the Oklahoma Air National Guard in May of 2014. He was killed in action as the first Oklahoma Air National Guardsman who has died, but the 20th Oklahoma National Guardsman who has died since September the 11th of 2001. The perpetual comment that I heard from the folks that I talked to about Tech Sergeant Roberts was he was one of the good guys. He was always known for having a smile on his face, was selfless, he served others all the way to the end. The night of the attack, there's a truck launcher that fired off 30 Katusha rockets at their camp as folks were sleeping. 18 of those rockets landed inside the camp facility. As the noise happened around him, Sergeant Roberts told his fellow airmen to get up, get going, get their body armor on. And as he stepped away to go warn other people to do the same, the rocket came. But some of the people standing right there that he had told them to get their body armor on, he saved their life. He was posthumously promoted. He was posthumously promoted to technical sergeant. He was born January the 29th, 1992 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Marshall's parents, Sally and Randy, raised him in Owasso, Oklahoma, where he graduated from Owasso High School. His beautiful daughter, Peyton, who has been the love of his life. On November the 15, 2018, Marshall was married to Chrissy Harris. She was also in the 138th, and they met and started dating, as both being a part of the National Guard there, the Air National Guard. Their deep love for God, their deep love for their country, and their obvious love for each other was a significant part of the 138th. Everyone knew them, knew what they were like, and were glad to be called their friends. He was a brother, he was a son, he was a father, he was a husband, and our state and our nation grieves him today coming home. Fun story about he and Chrissy, though. They met and started dating, as I mentioned, while they were both serving with the 138th. She had been in the 138th for 15 years, so she had actually been there longer. They dated four years before they got married in 2018. They've been married just less than two years. They were both avid football fans, but there was a major problem. Chrissy's a, Chrissy is a Kansas Chiefs fan and Marshall's a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, and that's a problem, definitely. But he fixed that by proposing to Chrissy at the Steelers-Chiefs game. I have to tell you, for the family, for the folks that uh, stood there today in Tulsa as he came home, they found a way to be able to love on each other. They found a way to be able to serve each other. And to the very end, they're still sacrificing for the country. Because, because of the COVID-19 that's happening right now, they've chosen not to have a public memorial service and a close time for the family. And they're delaying that time till it's safer for all of the family and for all the community to be able to participate. Literally, their family continues the grief and the wait one more sacrifice for their country and for their community. Today, all of Oklahoma is using a hashtag to just share messages with the family. A simple hashtag, hashtag TSGT Marshall Roberts. That's hashtag Technical Sergeant Marshall Roberts, if you want to know all the abbreviations on it, to be able to share a message of support and love for the family. Our nation is grateful. 
and we grieve with you for the loss today. Thank you to him and to his family for wearing the cloth of our country and for doing everything that our nation asked of him to the very end. Our nation lives in freedom because of folks like Marshall Roberts. And we will continue to stand with Chrissy and Peyton and with her family. With that, I yield. President. Senator from Oklahoma. Mr. President, we're in the process of passing a, a very large economic package to help stabilize our economy through the middle of all that's happening with COVID-19 globally and in the United States. The heart of the package we're passing today is almost identical to what we brought actually Sunday night, which was a bipartisan proposal, which ranking members and chairmen of all the major committees had worked together to be able to get this done. The key elements of it are still there. It's unemployment insurance for Americans, including a $600 plus up to be able to go through the process. There is uh, support for small businesses that will actually pay the payroll. We don't want individuals to end up on unemployment insurance. It's better if they stay connected to their same company. So it has a unique new proposal that's built in to be able to say a small business can go to any bank rapidly to be able to get a loan there, which will convert into a grant if they maintain their current employee numbers. That keeps people connected to their business and keeps people assured of a job at the end of all this when it all finishes out. It is a grant program for larger businesses that's designed to say if you're a very large company, uh, you're not going to get a grant, you're going to get a loan at this process. And at that moment you get a loan when if you don't have capital and you don't have access to it right now because of all that's going on, you could get that. This is also has a feature built in where individuals will receive just a check for $1,200, every adult does. That is built in to be able to give immediate economic support to all of those folks across the country. Now, all those features were already in the bill, already through Sunday night. Now, there have been some tweaks that some folks have brought up that some of our Democratic colleagues really wanted to be able to engage in, and many of those changes have been heard and been added, and some we have said, absolutely not, it's not connected to COVID-19 at all. But there's some things that some of our Democratic colleagues really wanted to make sure they got in. And through all the negotiations, some of these things were changed. For instance, they really wanted to make sure that energy companies couldn't get any support. So they fought hard to be able to make sure there is no additional money for the president buying additional oil to put in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at this lowest price now. So it will actually cost us more money in the future but it was their intention to say we don't want oil companies to get any kind of support in this downturn. They also wanted to make sure that there was great transparency because they didn't trust the Trump administration, so they built in an inspector general and a whole bunch of additional people to be able to watch the Treasury through the process. And they put in a neat little feature that they demanded, and that was that no son or daughter or family member or any individual that works with the presidency, vice presidency, or in the Congress could get any of, not the grant programs, the loan programs. In fact, it was interesting the language they demanded, no son-in-law could get that. I wonder who that could be targeted towards. A particular son-in-law that might be there. Literally, a lot of this fight that we've had over the last three days is because they were demanding that there was no way that the president or any of his family could get any kind of loan or benefit from this program at all. So we spent three days three days of delay because they had some additional demands for some things they wanted to do 
significantly targeted a lot of the president and his family. I understand they don't like the president. I get that. We want to do everything we can to be able to protect the workers. That's why we had all these programs in place already and why we had done a lot of bipartisan work to be able to get it done. It's done now. Let's get it going. And our encouragement is to be able to have the House be able to finish this up as quickly as possible and to be able to get the support to the American people. What has been interesting, though, is in the, the speeches that I've heard on the floor today from my colleagues and from many individuals and in releases that I've seen, his folks have mentioned their prayer. They've mentioned with God's help, we're gonna get through this. They've mentioned the struggle that we're going through as a nation and how we're praying for each other. And it keeps reminding me of something. It's a very old Psalm of Ascent. Psalm 121. When the Jews would come into Jerusalem for the different feasts, they would sing these Psalms of Ascent as they came off the eastern hills and would start rising up towards Jerusalem. And the psalm they would sing, I think, is pertinent for our time right now. Psalm 121 reads, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Now remember the mountains here is the capital city, Jerusalem. It's the seat of government for them and the center of worship. But it's the seat of government for them. And they would sing, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from harm. He will watch over you. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. It's interesting to me that the people would come in marching into Jerusalem, the seat of government, singing the song, I lift up my eyes to the mountain, but where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And of all the things that are going on in Washington, D.C. right now, you'll hear people here repeating over and over again, our hope is not in government. Our hope is not in how much money we can spend. We understand full well. When we lift up our eyes to the mountain, to this hill, we understand full well where our help comes from. And it's not from all the folks in this room. Our help comes from the Lord, and we're grateful that he neither slumbers nor sleeps. With that, I yield the floor. President, Senator from Arkansas. The deadly coronavirus that emerged from China late last year has now spread across the globe. The Chinese Communist Party deceived the world, even their own people, and unleashed the worst pandemic in a century on us all. Now it falls to us to defeat it. Here at home, a strange and unsettling hush has fallen over much of the country as businesses close and millions of Americans brace for what's to come. In New York, Seattle, New Orleans, and elsewhere, preparation for the virus has ended. The virus has arrived in force. The urgent battle to suppress it has begun. In emergency rooms and ICUs, courageous doctors and nurses are already locked in a battle to save the lives of their patients. Protective gear is in short supply, but their regard for safety and even family comes second to their duty. The days ahead will be a close run thing in those cities as they struggle to keep their hospitals open and functioning. But make no mistake, the China virus will spare none of us. From the high rises of the big cities to the hills of 
of the Ozarks. Soon, the Senate will finally pass desperately needed emergency legislation for our nation, including a massive infusion of funds to our health care system. But this legislation isn't about stimulus. It's about survival. With this legislation behind us, Americans are beginning to ask, what's next? Yes, the virus is testing us already, and it has already touched most of us by closing our churches, shuttering our businesses, and threatening the jobs and retirement savings of millions of Americans, and of course, threatening our lives. It's only natural that so many are wondering anxiously when and how this unprecedented crisis will end. And when it ends, will their jobs still be there? How will they put food on the table? How will they pay the bills? Americans want to know the plan so they can do their part. More fundamentally, they want to know that there is a plan. Upended routines combined with worry about the future naturally breeds frustration. We are citizens, after all, not merely passive carriers of a deadly pathogen. This frustration has given rise to a new and growing argument that Americans can't wait any longer, that we ought to open back up and take our chances with this virus. After all, we can't stay inside forever. We can't, as the saying goes, let the cure be worse than the disease. The urgency to stave off economic collapse is, of course, understandable. And it's tempting to think that we face a simple choice between shutting down to fight the virus and opening up to save the economy. But the choice is not so simple. Some thoughtful observers note that the seasonal flu and automobile accidents kill more Americans annually than has this virus. That's true as far as it goes. But we're just at the beginning of this pandemic. And I have to add, the Javits Center in New York City has never been converted into a field hospital for the flu and car wrecks. Granting that, some say, perhaps we can reopen in a few days, since our elderly are most at risk from this virus. Quarantine them, keep them safe. The argument goes, while the rest of us get back to work. But there are 72 million Americans over the age of 60 in this country. Many of them raise children, live alone, or work outside the home. They can't wall themselves off from the world, nor should we wall them in. Moreover, tens of millions of younger Americans have pre-existing conditions that put them at elevated risk from this virus. Are we to quarantine all of them too? Because even younger and healthier Americans are not safe from this pandemic. The China virus attacks the, the lungs of the young and the old alike. Of the cases we know about, the virus appears to send about one in seven younger people to the hospital. It's true that survival rates for younger patients are better, but even their recovery depends on a functioning healthcare system. If we give up on our efforts to control this virus now, our medical system will be overwhelmed. Hospitals will collapse. Care will be rationed. Doctors will face the terrible choice of whom to save and whom to let perish. And not just for patients of this virus, for every American who needs intensive care, whether from heart attack or stroke or car wreck or anything else. Besides, if left unchecked, this deadly virus will continue to wreck our economy as surely as it has already. It wasn't President Trump who shut down businesses after all. And it really wasn't even governors and mayors though they issued the orders. Government-enforced closures were largely a rearguard action by communities that had already ground to a halt due to the virus, or that soon 
would have come to a wrenching stop in the teeth of the pandemic. Who among us would take our kids to a restaurant tomorrow if we open back up? Our economy isn't seized up because of government dictates, but rather because our people are understandably fearful of a dangerous virus. So an immediate reopening without the resources in place to fight the virus isn't an option. Our hospitals would be overwhelmed. Our brave doctors and nurses would succumb to the illness. Our businesses would keep their doors closed or would quickly close their doors again as workers and customers stayed away. The supposed choice between saving the economy and fighting the virus turns out not to be much of a choice at all. We can't yet stop the strong measures that are in place because we have no better option in the short run. But neither can we continue them forever. The American people can only hold out for so long. So we must come up with a better plan and fast. That plan starts with this big pause as we protect ourselves and each other. We simply don't have the resources today to fight any other way. But it won't end with this approach. We must use the precious days and weeks ahead to lay the groundwork for a new strategy to fight the virus, a strategy that will allow all of us to gradually get back to work. For that to happen, we'll need to scale up our ability to rapidly test for the virus, as they have in South Korea, so we have a sense of where the virus is and where we must keep it contained. Already, America's public laboratories and companies are rising to the challenge, processing tens of thousands of tests. But our ability to test must grow even faster, and it is. We'll need masks, too, billions of them. And we'll need local personnel trained and prepared to do widespread contact tracing for those who test positive. We'll have to develop procedures for strict quarantines of those who test positive or those who've been exposed to the virus with zero tolerance for breaking quarantine and endangering our fellow citizens. Once these elements are in place and the first wave of this virus is passed, then we'll be prepared to reopen our cities and communities while remaining vigilant about new outbreaks. These preparations will ensure we're ready to sustain our way of life until our scientists can create what we so desperately need, therapeutic drugs and, ultimately, a vaccine. A vaccine may take a year or more before it's available, but these other intermediate precautions must go into effect much, much faster. America must indeed reopen. When we do, these decisions must be based on local conditions, not an arbitrary nationwide timeline. Our governors and mayors understand their local conditions. They can make gradual, rolling, calibrated decisions in a way that is responsible when the tools to effectively fight this virus are ready and available. What I've outlined may seem like a daunting, even an impossible challenge. But our nation has overcome far greater challenges before. Already, America is rising to take on the China virus. The giant of American industry is wakening, retooling our factories to join this fight, just as we did during World War II. Never bet against America's workers and American ingenuity. And all across this country, Americans are springing into action. We know the vital role our doctors and nurses will play in the coming months alongside our first responders, our factory workers and farmers, our grocers, and on down the list. Ask yourself now, how can you help? Can you keep your distance from those most at risk? Realizing that the China virus preys on our most earnest desires for society and companionship. Can you offer your charity to a friend in need? Can you pick up groceries for your elderly neighbor? Can you keep your workers on payroll and benefits just a little longer, too?
until our legislation kicks in? Can you postpone your tenant's rent for a month? Can you pray for deliverance of our nation and the world? These are just a few of the things we must do as a country to make reopening possible and life bearable in the months ahead. We're all in this together, so we'll need to have each other's best interests at heart. Many years of comfort in these have perhaps conditioned us to ask only what we're free to do, not what we're called to do. But the old disciplines of peril and privation threaten to return. We'll need old notions of duty to maintain order in the face of them. The darkest days of this crisis are, in all likelihood, still ahead of us. Let us face up to them bravely. Let us acknowledge the troubles ahead, and let us devote our whole energy to winning the, this battle quickly so that the normal life of our nation can resume. Mr. President, I yield the floor. President, Senator from Texas. Mr. President, during times of disaster, crisis, or hardship, I am, I never fail to be inspired by the generosity of Americans, including folks in my home state of Texas. I think about how we came together in the wake of Hurricane Harvey to lead search and rescue operations clear debris, and rebuild communities and lives. We saw strangers forming human chains to rescue a driver trapped in a car, restaurants offering free meals to first responders, and a Houston legend known affectionately as Mattress Mac opening his furniture stores for those in need of shelter. One volunteer said, I've met more of my neighbors in the last 24 hours than I have in the last 20 years. Well, these heartwarming stories of Texans lending a hand to one another are a source of comfort, even during the toughest times. Right now, when extending a physical hand is one of the worst things you can do, because it violates social distancing rules, there's still plenty of neighbors helping their neighbors. Folks in Texas, like around the country, are staying home to keep themselves and their neighbors safe. And we're seeing new and creative means of supporting one another. For example, a number of distilleries across the state have switched their production from vodka or whiskey to make hand sanitizer. Demand surging and hand sanitizer in short supply. More and more hospitals are struggling to keep it in stock, and these distilleries are stepping up to fill the void. <clears throat> Jonathan Lackrich is the head distiller and co-founder of the Enroute Republic Distillery in Denison, Texas, and said they got a call from the Texoma Medical Center asking if they could help. Of course, he said yes. But businesses like this aren't alone. Beloved Texas grocery chain, HEB, has taken steps to make shopping easier for seniors who are at most risk if they contract the coronavirus. HEB partnered with Favor Delivery to take grocery delivery, a service many Americans already utilize, and make it more accessible to seniors. They can pick up the phone, place an order, and have everything they need delivered to their front door within a few hours, all without having to leave home. We've also seen other organizations working to adapt to these challenging circumstances. The Boys and Girls Club of Greater Houston partnered with the Houston Food Bank to open a drive-through pantry. Families can get a 
whole week's worth of healthy meals without ever stepping out of the car. Of course, it's not just businesses and organizations who are helping out. People are helping other people. People are donating blood to alleviate the critical shortage that hospitals are facing. And all of us should consider, if we can, donating blood. They're leaving notes in neighbors' mailboxes, offering to run errands and pick up supplies. On social media, school teachers that are at home are offering to help parents with their math, science, or other subjects that they may be struggling to teach their kids while they're at, at home and not at school. Neighbors helping neighbors, friends helping strangers, Texans helping Texans. That's one thing I love about this great country. Our communities always jump into action to help any way they can. They do what it takes to survive a crisis and keep one another safe and healthy until we emerge on the other side. Mr. President, it's time for the Senate to do its part. There's been no event in my lifetime that has had this big an impact on the physical and economic health of our country. Every day we learn about more new cases, rising unemployment, and unprecedented market volatility. We have a responsibility to act and to act quickly in response to this dueling crisis. Already, we were able to work and send two bills to the President's desk for signature. The first sent vital support to health care professionals and first responders who are doing everything they can to treat patients and prepare for more cases. We also provided initial funding for development of a vaccine, clinical trials, and more diagnostic tests. The second bill we passed focused more on the small businesses and the individual workers who were impacted economically. It included changes in unemployment insurance so that those who find themselves out of a job can promptly take advantage of these benefits and made paid sick and family leave available for workers impacted by the virus. That's what we did in these first two bills. Were they perfect? Well, no. The second bill in particular fell short in a number of areas. It was largely negotiated by Secretary of the Tre Treasury Mnuchin and Speaker Pelosi. But we decided that in the interest of the greater good in the country and the people who were hurting during this crisis, that we in the Senate would pass it expeditiously. As the saying goes, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We acted quickly to get both bills to the President's desk because the circumstances demanded it. Sadly, over the last few days, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been oblivious to the sense of urgency that every other American seems to understand. After the original intense bipartisan negotiations, we were finalizing a third relief bill, which included by definition, ideas from both Republicans and Democrats. We were optimistic that we'd be able to take up and pass the bill on Sunday, or at least get it started and pass the bill on Monday, but clearly that didn't happen. Our Democratic colleagues blocked us from even debating the bill, not once, but twice. The minority leader said the bill, which his members had helped write, wasn't good enough. He spent the next three days trying to change the bill to include provisions that he thought were more important priorities during a national emergency. Things like tax credits for solar panels and tighter emission standards for airlines, proposals that have absolutely nothing to do with this crisis. After a few incredulous days, America woke up to the news today that our Democratic colleagues are finally ready to stop this posturing and this obstruction and to get this job done. After blocking this bill twice and holding up this emergency lifeline, 
Here's what the major, minority leader claims as a victory. He says the Democrats expanded unemployment insurance to help laid off workers and those who are self-employed. But Mr. President, as we all know, that was already part of the bill that had been negotiated between Democrats and Republicans. Then the minority leader said Americans will get direct aid, but we've been talking about that for weeks. That was part of the bill that Democrats blocked twice. And let's get this, let's be clear about this. Here we are, members of the United States Congress, getting a paycheck, and they have the temerity to block two times emergency aid to people who aren't, who have no income at all, through no fault of their own? It's outrageous. Then the minority leader said he secured unprecedented aid for America's hospitals, but as it turns out, that was part of the bill Democrats blocked twice. It was the subject of bipartisan negotiations, and we thought a consensus. Well, the bill that Democrats blocked twice was a bipartisan bill to begin with. Democrats and Republicans worked together and agreed to each of these points before the first votes were cast. The minority leader's members had spent countless hours negotiating with Republicans. That's how you get things done. But then he single-handedly tries to take credit for the work that they have done. For days, Democrats needlessly blocked a bill that would have bolstered our fight to defeat this virus and protected our economy in the process. I am absolutely angry that they chose to waste so much valuable time when there are so many different people in need. But I'm also relieved that they finally agreed to quit playing their partisan games so we can vote on this legislation today. This bill sends desperately needed funding to hospitals that are struggling to manage an influx of patients and helps fight the shortage of masks and other personal protective equipment, one of the priorities my governor had mentioned to me. It provides the direct financial assistance that was already in the two bills that our Democratic colleagues blocked. A family of four will receive up to $3,400 under this legislation, which will go a long way to throwing that lifeline to them and cover their rent, groceries, electric bills, and other expenses until they can make other arrangements, like apply for unemployment insurance under our beefed up provisions. This legislation will also provide relief for small businesses that are struggling to stay afloat. Many of the bus these businesses have had to shut down because they've been ordered by the government to do so. And now they need some help to make sure that the jobs they currently provide will still be available when we get to the other side of this crisis. And particularly, they need, we need to make sure that the employees they depend on and will, will depend on in the future will still be there when they reopen their doors. With both the physical and economic health of our country in crisis, this bold legislation is our best path forward. I appreciate the work that's been done by so many around the clock for the better part of the past week to get this bill finally to the floor. And I look forward to supporting it so that my constituents, the 29 million people that call Texas home, will get help as soon as possible. As we prepare to pass this legislation and send it to the House, I urge them to act quickly. But you may recall, Mr. President, it was Speaker Pelosi who flew back into town after a week-long recess, dropped an 1,100-page bill, and made all these outrageous new demands, clearing out their partisan or ideological outbox or wish list. Well, incredibly, now that there has been an agreement here in the Senate with the administration, Speaker Pelosi hasn't even called the House back into session. Matter of fact, they had a they gaveled in session and out of session today, and they won't be back in session until tomorrow. Speaker Pelosi has a huge challenge. Unless she can get unanimous consent to pass a $2 trillion bill through the House, she may well have to call back 
in the session the entire House of Representatives with restricted flights because of the lack of demand and the cost cutting that airlines are going through with the concerns about people sheltering in place, maintaining social distance and good hygiene to stop the spread of this virus, Speaker Pelosi has created a terrible problem for herself. But more importantly, she's created even more of a problem for the rest of the country because we need to get this passed out of the Senate today and out of the House and to the President as soon as possible. The American people are depending on us to respond responsibly in a bipartisan way during an emergency like this, and we cannot let them down.
Mr. President. Senator from Tennessee. Are we in a quorum call? No. We are not. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, I have to say, last night was an unusually late night here in Washington, and we were all impatient, and our staffs were impatient, the press was impatient, and as we talked to people across the this, this state, what we realized was they've long been running out of patience, and I've talked about that some on this floor, but for every factory worker and hourly worker and small business owner and songwriter and uh, gig worker, they've all been telling me they are running out of time. And they have just really been very anxious for what was going to come about out of this chamber. And I know that in the days and weeks ahead as we work through getting relief to communities and individuals and small business owners and large companies that there's going to be a lot of blame that is going to be thrown around. There are going to be some that are going to blame politicians. There are others that are going to blame the way the economy is structured. There are others still who are going to blame the health care system. But I will tell you I think that there is a necessity to have a discussion about why we do have this current crisis, and it is because of the leadership of the Chinese government, the People's Republic of China, that leadership in Beijing. And we have gone round and round with activists and media on the point, and I shouldn't have to point out that when we say that China is to blame for the spread of the novel coronavirus that we call COVID-19. We do not mean the Chinese people as a whole, but yet we have some that do not want to say this is where it came from. I think we should stop that and we should move forward with decisions based on fact, with decisions that are based on data. And we need to begin to collect those facts and to collect that data as it pertains to this disease. This is how we get to the antivirals. It's how we get to having a vaccine. And it's how we look at lessons learned so that we don't go back through this again, so that we plan to tackle some of the unexpected occurrences that will come our way. And as we talk about facts, we do know that COVID-19 originated in Wuhan, China. From there, it spread rapidly and it has had devastating consequences. The economy is crumbling. We're working desperately to shore it up. Innocent people have been in the hospital or sick. I talked to one Tennessean this morning who said, I'm happy to report my husband is coming back around. He has been suffering for the last many days with COVID-19. We've got world, the world's healthcare professionals and what are they doing? They are working to the point of exhaustion. And what you have is Beijing's reckless communist dogma, and they're trying to blame everybody else. And today we are going to move forward with the rescue package. This is the phase three package. It is the fourth tranche of money. I'm including in that the president's emergency declaration, which put about $50 billion toward fighting this. And as we do this, and as we say, what is our way forward on, on addressing this? What we have to do is realize that our relationship with China is going to need to change, and change for the better. There is no denying that the way they have conducted themselves has put that relationship on dangerous ground. And today, I invite my colleagues to support 
the bicameral Senate Resolution 553 and acknowledged that Beijing intentionally spread misinformation to downplay the severity of COVID-19 and baselessly denied the risk of person-to-person -person transmission of the disease. They refused to cooperate with international health authorities, including the CDC. During the early days of the outbreak, they censored doctors and journalists. We all remember what happened with the late Dr. Lee when he tried to give us the warnings, and on top of everything else, they maliciously ignored the health and safety of ethnic minorities. Mr. President, this is the easy part. The facts are there. All we have to do is acknowledge the facts that are there and use this as a beginning because this resolution is, as I said, it's bicameral, it is bipartisan in the House, and we have no reason not to push it forward and send the message that we realize what happened to cause a global pandemic. And after we acknowledge Beijing's gross malfeasance, we're going to adjust the way we think about China in the context of the economy, of our national defense, technology, human rights, and pharmaceutical manufacturing. When you think about it, the fact that Beijing intentionally downplayed the deadly nature of COVID-19 should come as no surprise. For decades, decades, China has made a business. It has been their business to search out our vulnerabilities, exploit those vulnerabilities. And then what do they try to do? They try to use that as leverage against us. So it is time for us to say no more. Now here is another component, and I've talked about this this week on the floor, our pharmaceutical supply chain. On February 27th, 2020, this year, the FDA announced the shortage of a drug used to treat victims of COVID-19. Imagine that, there was a drug shortage. They attributed the shortage to difficulties obtaining the active ingredient in this pharmaceutical. The active ingredient, they are called APIs. Now, they couldn't get it from this site in China, which was the site that manufactured it, because that site had been affected by COVID-19. So here we are, we need this component to go into a pharmaceutical, we cannot get it because the factory that produces this has been affected by COVID-19. And it's not the first time that this has happened. In 2016, we saw a shortage of an important antibiotic when the sole source of its production, the only place on the globe that produced this antibiotic was in China. And that factory was shut down, couldn't get it. Our vulnerability is not limited to one drug or even just a handful of drugs. In 2007 and 8, 246 people died after taking a contaminated blood thinner that came directly from a factory in China. They died, 246 people, just like that. Routine inspections didn't catch the contaminant and the drugs flowed right into our medicine cabinets. 2010, regulators have also found serious problems with batches of thyroid medication, muscle relaxers, antibiotics. And this week I got an email from a Tennessean he said, I saw what you said on the floor, and I want to let you know, I take a heart medication, and it was just recalled because it contained a carcinogen, and it was made in China. Think about this. These are the pharmaceuticals we take to return ourselves 
to health and wellness, to manage chronic conditions. And here we have example after example of things that are contaminated are not what they're intended to be. These are basic, common medications. In 2018, the FDA recalled several blood pressure medications made in China that were contaminated with cancer-causing toxins. Now, I would imagine there are a few people that come to work every day in this building that take a blood pressure medication. What if you had been taking one for a period of time and it contained the cancer-causing toxins? Americans deserve better than this from their pharmaceutical supply chain. If we allow this to continue, we are going to do so at our own peril. I encourage my colleagues to support the bipartisan Securing America's Medicine Cabinet, or SAMC Act. Senator Menendez has worked on this legislation with me, and I'm grateful to him for his support. Mr. President, you are working on legislation that would address some of these issues. Bring this pharmaceutical manufacturing back into the United States of America. We need to end Chinese control over our health and wellness in this pharmaceutical supply chain. This may seem like something that is too large or too risky an undertaking, but we have already paid dearly for our reliance on Chinese drug manufacturers, and it's not going to stop because that vulnerability is leveraged in the hands of madmen in Beijing who seek nothing but power and will go to any lengths to acquire that power. They don't care who they hurt. That's clear with this global pandemic. They don't care if it is innocent people that are sick or maybe even that lose their life. And they defy us. They defy us when we try to stop them. It's time that we rise to the challenge and that we return the supply chain. I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Well. Mr. Alexander. Mr. President. Senator from Indiana. Are we in a quorum call? Yes. Could we lift the quorum call? Without objection. Mr. President, I've been here a little over a year. I keep mentioning that often because what a year it's been. Uh, in the, that stretch, there's not been a period of time where I think there's been so much urgency for us as a Senate or the other chamber to do their job to deliver for the American people. We're in the midst of a crisis that, in building a business over 37, 38 years, you've constantly got hurdles to jump. You never really know the clear outcome. You try to have a great strategy with good implementation, good tactics that would be your salvation through thick or thin. When it comes to the coronavirus, it's not like we haven't had other recent issues, but nothing quite like this. To where it started in another country, it's gone across the world, and it now looks like that vector into our country, we may be dealing with it on the broadest scale. 
I'm a guy that believes in free enterprise. I don't like it when government has to step in, but I don't know what we would have done otherwise in this case. Until we tamp the disease down, until we get that curve flattened, no one is going to be at ease. We've invested three, four weeks of actual guidelines. We knew it was coming way before that. I'm hopeful that we've been doing a lot of the right things even before we were required to do them. So we can't relent on that course. On the other hand, never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined an economy could be affected like it has. Get stories from my home state of Indiana all the time. And not only from the places like hotels, restaurants, bars, airlines. I think our senior senator actually either went home or came out here, might have been the only person on the plane. That's a graphic example of how this is impacting commerce. The hotel owner I talked to, 2% occupancy in the week before. So we've come together. This past weekend, we worked through it. I think that's the first time since I've been here that on a legislative matter, we've done that. Had Democrats and Republicans at the grassroots level working to deliver what I think is a good package. It focuses on, number one, who needs it the most, workers that have been displaced and small business owners. It also has got stuff in for the broader part of the economy. Urgency is the key. We're working through right now some short-term corrections, and I hope that doesn't thwart the process. We should have had this across the finish line Sunday evening to where it could have been delivered on Monday morning, and we would still have the nation on high alert about what we're going to do here, and it can only come from here in this case. I'm going to segue into we need to get that done today, and I'm going to be for it. Each state, each senator, each representative is going to have to deliver to the small business owners, the individuals that have been displaced by this. And I've got a team back in Indiana that has taken on just a, well, a big spectrum of casework. And I invite you, when this legislation gets across the finish line, to make sure you reach out to our office. Many of our cases, regrettably, have been along the lines of helping folks interface with the VA. Uh, sadly, I wish there were fewer of them, but we've had really good luck. We interfaced when a cruise ship had Hoosiers stranded and were able to follow up on the process to make sure they came back. Currently dealing with cases where you're stranded overseas. Whatever it is, come to our Senate office. We've got a great team and they've helped a lot of Hoosiers out already. I want to end on a positive note. I think this has got the country down because everything you see is in the context of negativity. I like the fact that aspirationally, many are already talking about what we're going to do when we come out of it. And through prayers and through all the stuff Americans, Hoosiers have done, I think we're going to see that curve start to flatten. And I like the approach we've taken to put the emphasis on the disease because until those numbers go down, no one is going to be at ease. So as we look to the future, Monday was that thir first threshold, 15 days. We need to reassess, take all the information we've gained and gathered, and make the right decisions going forward. I trust our governors and our local gover governments across the country to do the same thing. And we will come out ahead. We are going to flatten the curve and make sure that we're taking care of the most important thing first. And I think that's going to be here hopefully sooner rather than later. And then we also need to be aspirational about what is going to really get this country back to business as usual. And that's when we can have Main Street going back the way it was a month or two ago, when we can recapture 
the best economy that we've probably ever had in history. And I know Hoosiers will do, do their job. They will be aspirational. And Americans across the country will do the same. I yield the floor. I notice the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. President. Senator from Georgia. I would ask that the uh, quorum call be vitiated, please. Without objection. Mr. President, we're on the cusp of a historic uh, bill today, bipartisan bill, that uh, we took a different approach thanks to uh, Republican leadership, um, where we put the leaders of each of the committees, both Democrat and Republicans, to focus on their portion of the needs behind this COVID-19 crisis. Before I get into my remarks today, though, I want to remind uh, the colleagues here today that um, we have sponsored a resolution recognizing and thanking all the people in America who are stepping up and, as others said, put their own health and their family's health at risk to make sure that their neighbors and friends and patients uh, and business partners are uh, taken care of. I'm talking about supply chain people, healthcare workers, transportation um, workers, um, all the people in the country, ag industry, uh, all the people in the, in, in the country who are keeping the essential needs of our population going. While restaurants are closed, they have takeout services, even here in Washington, D.C. Uh, that is not an easy thing to do for those folks. It's a lost leader. They're losing money on it, and I wanted to make sure that we recognize in the midst of this crisis how Americans are responding. Americans always respond to crisis in a better way than anybody else in the history of the world, in my opinion. Sometimes we're not always the, the quickest to recognize that we're in a crisis, but right now we are responding to this one right here before us. As a matter of fact, Mr. President, I believe we have two crises today. One is obviously the, the medical crisis, the healthcare crisis that uh, we now are characterizing as COVID-19 virus. Uh, we know how it originated, and we know uh, now what other countries are learning from that who are ahead of us in the cycle. But because of that, we have a uh, connecting uh, economic crisis that we're trying to deal with in this piece of legislation today. I hope we can get this done tonight. I don't see any reason why we can't. We have a deal. There are some questions here in the last hour, but uh, I think we'll get those done and hopefully get this voted on and sign or get this voted on tonight. As we deal with these two crises, though, Mr. President, it's my suggestion that we look at this. Uh, how we address dealing with this crisis in three phases. One, we're in the middle of the first phase right now, and I would characterize it as mobilization, where we're identifying the severity of the disease, we're identifying who is the most vulnerable, we're identifying what we need to do to deal with it, and we're mobilizing behind that. We see a dramatic increase in the number of tests, thanks to Vice President Pence. Uh, we still have shortages of testing kits and uh, swabs and reagents and even testing machines, but we have things like in my state where one of our major hospitals Emory University Hospital has their own testing. They can do it in a matter of hours versus days, and they're making that available to other hospitals in the state. This is all hands on deck. And they'll probably lose money doing that, Mr. President, but they're willing to do that. We have an apparel company in Georgia who has now shut down their business in apparel, and they have good orders, profitable orders. They're putting those aside to make masks to try to help fill the need there in those shortages. But the mobilization phase is, is where we are today. We're identifying based on the experiences of other countries, what we might expect here. We have hot spots in our country, just like other countries have had. We saw what happened in Wuhan and Hubei province in, in China. I've been there. It's a very old population, older population. They were late getting to the identification and treatment and, and isolation, and uh, we see the repercussions of that. But what we can learn from is that they are ahead of us in the cycle. However, they dealt with that in the early days. We see now how they have dealt with that crisis and what's happening to the numbers, and we can learn from that. And I'll talk about that in a second. The second phase, though, is transition. And this is one, I don't, I'm not sure we're in it yet, but we're about to go into it 
partly because of this package, and that is to make sure that we protect the parts of the economy where we can so that when we do start to come out of this, just like every other country ahead of us in the cycle has done and is doing right now, that we'll have our businesses in a position to reconnect with the employers, our employees uh, that they've worked so hard to develop. And of course, the third phase is full-on recovery. And that is to do the things then to get the economy back on its strong footing, to make sure then we address the shortages of what we found in, in our current preparation of this. For example, we didn't have a strategic stockpile of some of these essential medical in, uh, uh, essentials that we needed in the identification, testing, and treatment of this particular uh, virus. That recovery will take some time, but at the same time, the way America always responds to this is that I believe we can respond very quickly if we get the transition phase correct, and that's what I want to talk about today. As we look at the medical crisis, though, we understand now through a lot of data outside of the U.S., and I will kind of caveat this, that each country's experience is just a little bit different. I would also comment that there's a lot of noise in the data that I see around the world right now. The medical community is doing a great job of trying to aggregate this data to see how it applies to our needs here at home. I give our doctors and nurses and caregivers the, the highest thank you I can uh, for what they're doing here and all over the world for that matter. But what the experience is in Italy might not be the same as it is here. The experience in South Korea might not be the same as it is here. So we have to look at those and, and be very careful that we don't try to extrapolate either the severity or the lack of severity as being applicable here. This particular, what we do know though, before I get to the bill, is that in the, the World Health Organization just this week has published an update to their numbers and they're characterizing the, this disease this way. And, and look, every, every country has a little bit different uh, infection rate, a little different mortality rate. Um, I believe the United States, because we haven't tested as broadly as some of the other countries like South Korea have done, we don't know what the denominator is yet. So we really don't know what the mortality rate is or the infection rate for that matter. But this is what the World Health Organization is doing. Just to put this in perspective, that about 80% of the people infected with this COVID-19 virus will probably have a mild, that's the way they characterize it, a mild experience with this um, disease. 15% will be serious enough to go to a hospital particularly, and then of that 5% will be critical patients, typically generally toward the more vulnerable patients, elderly, people with respiratory uh, existing diseases, and uh, our potentially immune um, deficiencies. As we deal with that medical crisis, and we've poured a lot of resources toward that in the first two phases of, of uh, help, and in addition to what the president did with his $50 billion uh, allocation earlier, this bill, almost $2 trillion of aid, as, as, uh, as we see it, toward businesses and communities uh, and states to make sure that we can weather this storm. This bill, let's be very clear about this. This is not about companies. This is about employees. This is about the people who work for employers, either in their own business or in somebody else's business. This is all about employees. It is merely a financial bridge to get through this period of time to get into that recovery phase that I'm trying to describe here a little earlier. It's about the employer-employee relationship and to make sure that we keep that relationship intact. Look, in the last three years, we've created seven and a half million new jobs. Prior to this crisis, this Covara, Covara um, uh, uh, virus crisis, we had an, an economy that was just booming, created seven and a half million new jobs. We had uh, seven and a half million job openings, as a matter of fact, and only five million people looking for work. So we had a situation where we had uh, the economy moving in the right direction, and then this hits, and we want to make sure we don't lose any of those jobs. And for that reason, we focused on the employer-employee relationship. Yes, we, we plussed up unemployment benefits for the state so that they're not overwhelmed, but we made sure that the employer had the liquidity to keep these people employed. And in that vein, we did not want to have a liquidity crisis, which we could very well have right now because of shutting these businesses down. We didn't want that liquidity crisis to turn into an insolvency crisis. We can deal with the liquidity issue. We, it's very difficult to come back and deal with uh, companies that have gone insolvent and are now in bankruptcy proceedings. That is a very long and difficult process. It's difficult to come back from. We do not want to do that, and that was the primary purpose of most of the facets of this bill, some $2 trillion. I'll say this about that. 
There are two major components to do that. One is a small business continues. Now, a little over 50% of the work, people who work in America work for companies that have 500 employees or fewer. That's a new learning for me. That's changed dramatically. But it is the engine. This is not new news. This is, this is the engine of new job growth. We know that in the last three years. Well, we have $350 billion directly uh, uh, targeted toward those small business um, small businesses who can then, by the way, go to their existing local banker and get this facility done, a government-backed loan guarantee. In addition to that, there's $454 billion directed at other businesses, plus another $58 billion towards strategically important industries uh, like our airline industry and so forth. And again, most of this money is in the form of loan guarantees to provide liquidity to keep the employee employed with their employer. It's no more difficult than that. But one other thing that's not being talked about, and I want to highlight this, and that is $454 billion is historic. That's a lot of money. But it has the ability through the Treasury that they can actually lever that up in terms of the way that the money is, uh, goes out to banks. It can be levered up to 3 or $4 trillion. So what we're talking about here is the potential of up to $5 trillion of liquidity into our economy. This is historic. It, it should be enough to shock the system to see, okay, there's going to be liquidity there. There may be some growing pains in the early days, but the liquidity is going to be there to weather this storm, to bridge this crisis. I want to look at what's next. Talk about this transition uh, phase and maybe even the recovery phase for a second. The first thing we have to do is we have to really learn from other countries that have already, they're ahead of us in the cycle. For example, it took about six to eight weeks for China, even with their uh, mistakes, it took about six to eight weeks to go from zero to their maximum number. But we know that the, the, the disease has a life cycle. If somebody is infected with it, if they survive, they come on the backside. And so far, there's over 70,000 people that have had the disease in China and are healthy now. We know from anecdotal evidence on the ground that about 80% of the employed workers in China are beginning to go back to work and almost 90% of factories. This is outside of Hubei province, outside of Wuhan and Hubei province. They're going back to work. In South Korea, the learning there is testing, testing, testing. But more than that, they also track contacts. Now, there are 50 million people in South Korea. We have 330 million. It's a little different here, but in certain cities and states, they can certainly look at doing that. So we have to learn from countries like South Korea and Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, and even China, because they're ahead of us in this cycle. We should be in the first few weeks of this cycle going from, our, from zero to whatever our maximum number is, but it's the number of active cases that's the most important, not the number of total cases. So the mortality rate is yet to be determined because we don't really know the denominator. But I believe if we can test more, and, that, and the acceleration curve, according to Vice President Pence, is underway right now, that we will have that ability to do. Contact tracking is another, and then isolation is another one we have to think about, unfortunately. We have hot spots. In the Ebola crisis in Africa, what we learned from the medical community was if they could put a full port, court press on the areas of flaring where we had uh, the disease flare up and isolate it where they didn't have people traveling outside of those areas. So, Isolation by geography and demography are unfortunately called for if we're going to do everything we have to do to control this disease in the time frame that we should. The third thing I'll highlight briefly is I believe right now this shows that we were behind in terms of our preparation for a pandemic like this. There's no question about it in the country and the world. We can point fingers and blame. I, I, that's not my purpose today. What I want to talk about is this. In America, and if we, can, if we can bring the world's resources with data, this is the big thing. We have limited data in the United States. There are other countries that have a lot of data. I believe if we aggregate that data and create a Manhattan Project-type effort to go toward vaccines and treatments, that we can absolutely be ready for flu season next year if, in fact, this particular COVID-19 virus has a seasonality. We don't know that yet. In conclusion, Mr. President, there is no question that this is a moment of challenge in America. I will say this, that President Trump, for all his distractors, early on stepped up and, and was a strong leader. I said this several years ago. He reminded me of Winston Churchill, irascible but effective in getting results. And that's what we've had early on. Right now, we need a steady hand to make sure we don't kill the economy while we kill this disease. And my only point is in this transition period, and nobody has all the answers yet, 
we need to start asking the questions of what can we do in this transition period to find a balance between protecting life and protecting the economy long term so that when people get well, they'll have a job to go back to and we'll have an economy that can help the world prepare for the next pandemic that we're talking about here. The American people have the best spirit, I believe, in the history of the world when it comes to dealing with this crisis. I've talked about a couple of examples in my state. The airlines right now are another one. I know that Delta is, is one of the uh, primary uh, airline carriers we have in the country. They're keeping some flights on. I know I'm, I have a reservation on a commercial flight later this week, and I asked my assistant, uh, you, you sure I can get a seat on that plane? She said, yeah, there are only five people who have booked a seat on that plane. So it shows that people are trying to do their part here. Neighbors, people going to grocery stores for their neighbors, taking care of uh, picking up mail, doing anything they can to protect the people that are at risk. In small communities, we know how to do that. In major cities, it's more difficult, but it's even possible there. I'll conclude with this, Mr. President. There is a day coming, and it's not that far off, that we'll be behind the top end of this curve in America. We will have lost some lives. That's unfortunate. We all regret that. But what we have to do now is to make sure we prepare ourselves for this transition phase that while we're coming and still dealing with people who are getting the disease, the disease is on the wane and the economy needs to be brought back so that we can make sure that we can prepare this country for the next round that we may or may not see in the future. With that, I yield the floor. I received a call a few hours ago from someone I've known for a long time, a gentleman in his, I would say, early to mid-90s. And he wanted me to stop saying that what we're facing is an unprecedented challenge. And I was taken aback. I mean, none of us have ever lived through anything like this or confronted a situation this painful or, for, or so dramatic. And so he challenged me to do something that I'd actually done a few years ago, but as it shows, you know, even a few years erodes memory about uh, things that happened long in the past. He challenged me to say, you know, everybody's comparing this to the last time we had something like this. It required the nation to react like we did in World War II. And so it caused me to go back and look a little bit about the, to, at the years before that great and bloody conflict. It's interesting, in the years leading up to 1941, President Roosevelt had an effort to pack the Supreme Court. And it was incredibly controversial. It ended up falling apart in 1937. It ended up falling apart, actually, because members of his own party turned against him. And it actually weakened him in what would that tail end of his second deal. President Roosevelt was so upset about what members of his own party had done to him that in 1938, he did something unprecedented at the time. He got involved in Democratic primaries and tried to defeat, take out, members of his own party who had opposed him. Not only did he lose badly in that effort, I think he only won one of those seats that he went after. As a result of what he did, his party lost six seats in the Senate, 71 in the House, and ultimately, in this very chamber, a Republican, Robert Taft, was able to put together a coalition with conservative Democrats and basically block President Roosevelt's agenda leading into 1940. Then in 1940, Roosevelt did something else that was unprecedented and highly controversial. He announced, although it was legal, that he was running for a third term. He was at that point defying a long precedent that had been set by the nation's first president. And then to make matters even more interesting, his own vice president, who had turned on him on the court issue, he had to kick him off the ballot. He, in fact, he told them, if you nominate him as vice president, I will refuse the nomination. And ultimately, he was reelected on a promise, ultimately reelected by a pretty big margin, but he had to make a promise, I will keep this country out of war. This sets the stage going into November, December 1940. A president that had spent the last three years battling his own party, had seen his own agenda slowed and stifled, and then had to kick off his own vice president 
After getting involved in primaries against his own party, he loses a large number of seats in the House and in the Senate, has a coalition form against him to block him, and then has to make a promise, we're not going to war. All the while, understanding that what was happening in Europe would eventually reach us, and he was preparing for war. And why he made that promise was pretty fundamental. Going to war was not popular in this country. Millions of Americans, particularly those at the time you couldn't really travel abroad, had no connections to Europe, they looked at World War I as a European war, and they looked at a second world war as just another trick to get America sucked back into a war that had to do with Europeans and not with them. Prominent voices, the chief among them, Charles Lindbergh, traveled the country blasting the president as a warmonger in the strongest possible terms. There was actually a student anti-war movement. Now, not as many people went to college at that time as did in the 60s, but it was really a precursor to that very movement. Why? Because these young people in college were the ones that were going to be sent to war if there was one, and they wanted no part of it. And then, in the blink of an eye, at 7.48 a.m. on the 7th of December, 1941, the Japanese attacked the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. They sunk four of our battleships. We lost almost 200 airplanes. And 2,300 Americans perished on that very day. Even to the end of the war, it remained the third bloodiest day of that very bloody conflict. America was not ready for war. They had started a draft by a one-vote margin. They were able to vote it into place. They had begun some basic rearmament, but we had lost a significant percentage of our Pacific fleet. And frankly, to this day, there are legitimate questions, not about whether the Roosevelt administration knew in advance that this was happening and allowed the attack to happen. No, those are conspiracy theories that they should have known. This was a massive intelligence failure. In fact, up to 30 minutes before that attack, the ambassador to Japan was here negotiating with the United States over an oil embargo. And America, by the way, was not a society at peace. This was a nation deeply divided, a segregated nation that discriminated against citizens of color. There were very serious labor disputes going on throughout the country. Many still wore the scars of a deep and painful economic depression. And yet, in the blink of an eye, this nation was confronted with an enemy and had no choice but to put aside all that had happened to that point. Everything, all the problems they had with the president, all the problems they had with each other, even those Americans that had been discriminated against were willing to do that. Tremendous testament to the contribution they made to the effort to win that conflict. And in the blink of an eye, literally every aspect of American life was changed overnight. Think about it. One minute you are a student demanding that we stay out of war, and the next you are volunteering for service. One minute you're a housewife, you're a retiree. The next minute you're back at work or at work for the first time in your life at a factory, making munitions or something else needed for the war effort. School kids, children, were put to work in farms because so many people had left farming to move and fill the industrial jobs because the men that would have otherwise fulfilled those jobs were now wearing a uniform and dying by the hundreds every day and then by the thousands all over the world. We rationed food. There was food rationing. You could only eat so much. A family only got so much. Gasoline was rationed. I think it was three gallons a week, if I'm not mistaken. Clothes was rationed. You know, the government stepped in and said, you can't build kitchen appliances, no refrigerators, no ovens, no vacuum cleaners, none of it. We need all of our industrial capacity to fight and win a war. People on the coasts, and you still see Old pictures of this to this day, off Miami Beach, off New York. People had to have these, turn your lights off at night and close the shades to your window because there were German U-boats just off our East Coast. People were asked to make tremendous sacrifices. 
Not for three months, not for six weeks, for th over three years and longer. And sacrifices ultimately, perhaps the greatest of all, they sent their sons and fathers off to die on, in the defense of this country and of our freedoms. I do not mean to diminish the challenges that are being asked of us now. There isn't five minutes that goes by that I don't get a call, a text, or an email from a small, build, small business who just two weeks ago was having its best year ever, talking about hiring new people, and now they're bankrupt, they're done, they're finished, and they may never reopen again. From a young couple I talked about earlier today in a video that I made, two weeks ago, recently married, planning to start a family, both had good careers. The next minute, both out of a job, not sure if the place they work in will ever exist again, not knowing where to go. One minute, you're the father in a family or the mother in a family who has never had a day in your life where you were not employed by someone. And the next, you're being told, go to a website or call this number, you need to go get unemployment. They don't know how to do it. They've never done it. So I do not mean to diminish the sacrifices that our people are already making. I simply mean to put it in perspective and also to give a little bit of clarity as to what will be required of us to win this war. Because in the end, our enemy is not a nation state. It doesn't wear a uniform. But it has invaded our nation in a way that's required us to do things we have not been asked to do or anything close to it since late 1941. So what are the lessons to be taken by that era in our history? By the call I got today saying, stop saying this is unprecedented. The lesson to be taken is, number one, in moments like this, government action matters. It is important that we have a functioning government that can address problems in the space in which government must act. That is what is being asked of us here today. What is being asked of us is not to pass a perfect bill or to pass legislation that will cure the virus or to pass a law that has everything we've ever wanted. What's being asked of us is can you function as a government? Can you do the most basic things that a society needs from its elected leaders at a moment of true crisis? Can you do that? And so far for three days the answer sadly has been no. I hope the answer at the end of this day will be different. But the second thing it teaches us is, you cannot confront a challenge such as this with just government. That war was not just won because of political leaders or our armed forces. It was a whole of society effort. Every day, Americans were being asked to do things they had never done before in places they had never been, not just to make sacrifices from what they couldn't have, but sacrifices in what they were asked to do affirmatively. That will require the same of us now. And I want to tell you, there are people already doing that as we speak. The examples are too long to mention. But all over this country, there are people that are doing extraordinary things, stepping up, doing more than they've ever done, because they have to. They know they must. I have no doubt that if our government leaders do their job and are willing to do their part and provide people transparent, clear, truthful guidelines about what we face and what lies ahead and what is expected of them. They may not be happy and people may not be excited about it, but they will do it. I know they will do it. They are already doing it. The third lesson is the awesome power of our country when a diverse population of go-getters, the most creative people that have ever walked the earth, come together, put aside their differences to confront a threat they face in common. And again, that is not possible. You can't ask of that of a society. You can't ask people to put aside their differences, put aside the trivial, put aside the things they don't agree on, and focus on the one thing that threatens us all. You can't ask them to do that if you're not willing to do it yourself. And it appears, at least up till this moment, that we have failed to do it. I hope today is a difference in that regard. We shall see.
But it takes me back to the point I made originally. What is our job in this? Well, let me say that we're, we are asking, and I say we, those of us in government at every level, are asking of our people to do some very difficult things. We're asking high school seniors, including one that lives in my home, to be the first in I don't know how many generations that won't have a prom, won't have a senior trip, won't have a graduation. Now, I know all those things may seem trivial and pale in comparison to World War II, but for a 17-year-old, these are a rite of passage. And there are many high school seniors in this country that will not get that this year. We're going to ask small businesses, and have asked them already, you need to close your doors. You can't open. You can't work. You can't make money. You can't allow customers to come in. We've asked people not to go to work. In fact, we've told them not to leave their homes. Over half this country is on an order, don't leave your house unless you're going to the doctor, the pharmacy, the gas station, or the grocery store. We're asking nurses and doctors to confront a virus that can infect them and their families and kill them and their families, just like anybody else, to do so on double shifts, oftentimes without the gear and the equipment to protect them. We're asking truck drivers to drive all night, also vulnerable to the virus, also worried about all the other things all of us are worried about, drive all night, because tomorrow those shelves need to be stocked with all the things that people are buying because they're afraid it's going to run out. And how can we ask that of our society? If for three and a half days, we can't even vote on a law. We can't even walk to the front of this place and lift our finger up or down and say yes or no. We can't even do that. Spending the taxpayers' money on behalf of the taxpayers in a moment of critical crisis? I don't mean to be negative because, frankly, I hope that today is a day we'll get this solved, but there are still other people that have to weigh in here, in the House, outside commentators, people still emailing and texting, can we change this, can we change that? I just don't know how we can ask people to do all these things we need to ask them to do, and in return tell them, by the way, we're going to take our sweet time to do our part, and our part's the easiest one. And you can just imagine, extrapolate what we're facing now and take it back to 1941. Imagine if back then people would have been saying, boy, this is a great chance. This is a good opportunity to get back at FDR. This is a great opportunity now. He's in war. Let's roll back the New Deal. Let's really stick it to him for what he did six years ago with that court thing. Or the reverse, if he would have said, boy, this is a good opportunity to use the war powers that a president has to steamroll my political opponents. And, and, and put in place whatever I want and run them over. Or imagine if we were saying, we need to build a lot of ships, but I'm not going to vote to build it unless you're building it in my state. I don't want to go any deeper into that because I don't mean that to say that some of the issues that people raise around here are not legitimate issues. They are. But sometimes the legitimacy of the issue, the importance of the issue, has to be weighed on a scale against the gravity of the moment. And I would say to you, if we were dealing with permanent policy in a normal course of business or even in a moment of a cyclical economic downturn, we'd have some weeks to make some of these decisions. We've already taken too long. People got laid off today. People will be laid off tonight and tomorrow and the day after and for days to come even if we pass this bill. Imagine if we don't. What we are facing is, is the toughest thing this generation's ever faced. There's no doubt about it. And perhaps with the exception of gentlemen and people like the, one, the gentleman that called me this morning, it would be the toughest thing we ever face in our lives. World War II was worse. This virus is terrible. But it will not last as long or kill as many people as that war did. But it will kill far too many people and last far too long. But it will last longer and kill more if we don't take action now. And that requires everyone to finally wake up and realize this is not 
this virus doesn't care who you voted for in the last election. It doesn't care what you write on Twitter, what snarky remarks you come up with in your commentator moment on cable news. It doesn't care about any of that stuff. It doesn't care who you plan to vote for in the next election. It will infect you, it will kill you, it will kill people you love, it will kill members of your family, it will disrupt your community and your economy. It doesn't care about any of this other stuff. And it really is important for us to realize, not for just for this bill, but moving forward, that there's no such thing as an outcome here that's good for half of us and bad for the other half. There is no possible political victory here. None. There is no outcome here in which half of us are going to be able to go back and say, boy, we really looked good and we made those guys look really bad and people are going to reward us for it. They're not. I promise you that when someone has lost their job and doesn't know where they're going to go and are stuck in their home and their lives have been turned upside down and a member of their family is in intensive care and they wind up at a hospital that's been overwhelmed and they can't care for them, they are not going to be, the last thing on their mind is going to be partisan politics or pre-existing differences. If you don't believe it, we're about to find that out, unfortunately. There is no outcome here in which half of us is happy and the other half are upset. It's a cliche. We use it all the time. I can't think about a better example than this one. We are truly all in this together. There will, there, the, the carnage, the damage that this will do to our country is extraordinary. It will know no geographic bounds, no political affiliation, no demographic differences. This is a virus can, that can infect the heir to the crown in, in Britain just as easily as it, a 92-year-old retiree in a Florida nursing home. And so I hope that the gravity of the moment finally sinks in and that we take the necessary actions quickly. And if there's something in this bill you just really don't like, I don't mean to diminish it. If we can fix it, we should. But at this point, I'm going to tell you that there is nothing wrong in this bill. There's nothing in this bill that will damage our country more than our inability to act. No matter how bad some provision in this bill you think may be, and I say this to both sides, there is nothing in this bill that will damage us more than doing nothing will. By far, the most damaging thing that can happen is not any provision of this legislation. It is our inability to act and to send a message to the American people that their leaders can't function, that their government doesn't work, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, but in a moment of crisis. And so I hope that that, whatever differences may still exist at this moment, and I'm trying to be fair because I know a lot of people have finally seen the full text of it in just in the last few hours, and if you've caught something that can be fixed, it should be fixed. But I, I plead, I don't know what other word to use, that we don't leave here tonight without having passed this bill. Because I honestly don't know how this nation and our people can afford one more day of this. Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Madam President. Senator from New Mexico. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam President. Are we in a quorum call? We are in a yes, quorum call. Yes, I would ask, Madam President, to vitiate the quorum call. Without objection. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you today, Madam President, and thank you for the recognition. Today, New Mexico and the nation face a pandemic the likes of which we have not seen in over 100 years. And today, the Senate must act to pass the largest relief package for the American people in our history. First, I'd like to extend my thoughts and prayers to everyone who is personally affected by this coronavirus pandemic. I thank the healthcare workers who are working long hours and risking their own health to save lives. They are performing a national service. The numbers of infected individuals and the rapidly rising death toll are staggering. If we do not follow public health experts' advice, the totals could be truly horrifying. In New Mexico, we have over 100 diagnosed cases, and today the first death in our state was reported. A senior citizen from Eddy County in the southeastern part of our state passed away on Sunday. All New Mexicans are facing new challenges, a threat to our health, a threat to our economy. My top priority is easing this hardship and making sure New Mexicans have what they need to stay healthy and to stay economically afloat. With that in mind, I'm rising today to tell New Mexicans relief is on the way. Relief to American workers who have put, been put out of work and to small businesses that are making impossible decisions because of the coronavirus pandemic. Relief to our hospitals and frontline health care workers facing an overwhelmed health care system in the coming weeks and months. And relief to states and local governments that are doing their best to take care of their residents and maintain essential services. State and local governments are desperately in need of assistance. Only the, the federal government can, can provide and tribal governments to whom we owe trust and treaty obligations to provide health care, education, and community assistance, particularly in times of need. After days of furious negotiations, I'm pleased and relieved that Democrats and Republicans were able to reach agreement on what will be the largest federal relief effort in our history. The times demand a response of this magnitude. The stay-at-home orders, which make no mistake, are necessary to stop the virus, threaten the livelihoods of millions of working families that live paycheck to paycheck. Millions of small businesses are in dire need of help. They power our economy, but simply can't survive during the kind of economic downturn we now face. The federal government has the power to make sure that people can take the public health measures that are necessary while also staying afloat financially. We are here in the Senate, we here in the Senate need to make absolutely sure that everyone, not just those at the top, that everyone is taken care of and can weather this crisis. I'm strongly supportive of the small business relief in this bill, which includes loans of up to $10 million that can be forgiven and turned into grants if employees are kept on the payroll. This relief will go through the Small Business Administration and be available to any business or nonprofit under 500 employees. With Democrats at the negotiating table, we worked toward that goal. And as a result, American workers will receive four months more of unemployment insurance instead of just three. Because so many Americans are now out of work, we need an expanded unemployment insurance plan. This plan extends unemployment to the self-employed, 
for the first time. It increases the maximum benefit by $600 per week. Many workers will receive their full pay under this expansion. Just to give an idea of the magnitude of this problem in my home state of New Mexico, during the week of March the 9th, we had fewer than 800 claims for unemployment. This last week, we had 11,000, and now we are receiving 7,000 every day. Also, because Democrats stood firm, our health care system will see an infusion of $55 billion more dollars into the Marshall Plan for health care. The total public health care investment in this bill is now $150 billion. We will establish a $150 billion relief fund for state, local, and tribal governments to help cover costs of fighting this virus. New Mexico is eligible for up to $1.25 billion from this fund. And we will bring accountability and transparency to the relief for industry and large corporations. This relief bill puts in transparency and independent oversight and also make sure that elected politicians, including the president, are not the beneficiaries of this fund. We face a national crisis of monumental proportions. And I'm heartened that Republicans and Democrats in this body joined together over the last several days to face this crisis together as a nation. This is what we do as Americans. And I have hoped that as we continue to face down this crisis in the coming weeks and months, we will continue to do so in a united fashion. As Vice Chair of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, I've been particularly focused on making sure that Indian country is not left out and ensuring that tribes who are on the front lines of this public health and economic crisis have the resources they need and deserve. Together with my Democratic colleagues, I fought for and secured an $8 billion set aside for tribal governments and their enterprises. This tribal relief fund will provide the 574 federally recognized Indian tribes with flexible resources, resources they need during the COVID-19 response. And I'm glad we found bipartisan agreement on this. We also secured over $2 billion in emergency funding for tribal needs. And this includes over a billion dollars for the Indian Health Service that will be used for everything from expanding medical services to purchasing equipment, to promoting public health education, to expanding telehealth services and increasing disease surveillance and over $700 million that will go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Indian Education, and the, eight, the HUD Office of Native American Programs. These funds will assist tribal governments as they make their way through this crisis and support their members. Support BIE schools and tribal colleges and universities so that students continue with their education. And provide housing for those most in need who are impacted by this terrible virus. These are key victories, but we're not done. We must uphold our trust and treaty responsibilities to all American Indians and Alaska Natives. And so Congress must do more to respond to the unique COVID-19 related public health and economic crises in Indian country. Tribes are some of the most vulnerable populations with the least robust health care systems. We have a very scary outbreak on the Navajo Nation, and I'm sure that we need to weigh in and help there. For our next response package, and believe me, we're going to have to monitor this closely, and we're in all likelihood going to be back here again. We must make sure Indian country has equal access to federal coronavirus resources. Senator Heinrich and I fought hard for New Mexico priorities. We are working hard 
on issues that have to do with our national, national labs, one of our very, very top employers, in fact, probably the biggest. New Mexico's creative economy can't be left behind. Sitting as the lead Democrat on the Appropriations Subcommittee that funds the national endowments, I pushed for an additional $75 million for both the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. These funds will support local artists and arts programs through this tough economic time when arts and cultural venues are shuttered and artists and all others are out of work. There is no doubt that these are exceedingly difficult times, but together we can get through this. I would like to remind everyone to follow the public health measures recommended by the experts. Staying at home is the best thing we can do to slow the spread of this virus and ensure our health care systems are not overrun. These measures are a firebreak that cuts off the fuel for this virus and prevents a catastrophe that overruns our hospitals. Social distance, wash your hands for 20 seconds, we all have an important part to play in containing COVID-19 and keeping ourselves and our neighbors and our communities safe. The state of New Mexico is under a stay-at-home order. I commend Governor Lujan Grisham for the quick and decisive action that she has taken, and she is focusing in on this like a laser beam. I know these measures are difficult and a hardship for many, but we will only be able to revive our economy once this public health crisis is abated. If we just let the virus run its course, we could lose over a million people. Some estimates are two million, one to two million. That would be totally unacceptable and devastating. And because of the frontline healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, and the technicians, and all those who support that work, hospital janitors, cafeteria workers, and so many others, this public health crisis will see an end. Thank you to everyone who is risking their own safety to help others, and thanks to all the Senate staff that is here on the floor and the people that work here. In the days and weeks and months ahead, we must continue to closely monitor all aspects of the impact of coronavirus on our nation's health and economy and continue to decisively and aggressively respond to the needs of the American people. I am confident that, working together as one nation and one people, we will meet and beat this crisis and come out on the other end stronger. To conclude, we must pass this bill without delay. This is a good compromise, and we must act now. Madam President, I uh, note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Madam President. Senator from Vermont. Madam President, I ask consent to call the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, Senators have been working very hard to respond to the crisis that's facing our whole nation. Each one of us has certain things in our states that might be unique, but we also are here for all of America, and all of America is suffering. Uh, I know my, my staff, my staff in Vermont, my staff down here, the appropriators, the appropriation staff have been working every day, every night till midnight or later, weekends, nobody's had any time off. Um, I've been proud to work with them, even though we have set up, as I would hope all would do, a way so we could teleconference and we can work remotely. Earlier this week, we were faced with the prospect of a bill that was very one-sided. Uh, Republicans and Democrats had not done what we do best, sitting down and putting it together. We were given almost a, a take it or leave it bill. And I applaud Senator Schumer, who said, Come back together. Let's, let's not pass that bill, which leaves out so much of America, so much of the people that we represent. Let us come together, both Republicans and Democrats, and find a better bill. Now, late last night, actually, it's close to this morning, uh, agreement was reached in principle on such a bill. The appropriators do only a part of it. But Senator Shelby and I have tried to work together to have something where all the Appropriations Committee, or the vast majority of the Appropriations Committee, Republicans and Democrats would agree, and we did that. And that's what we had before us. I'm sorry that there seemed to be some slow up now. I think that. Uh, Senators have, and senators again of both parties have worked so hard to put together something we can all agree on. We have something we should be able to agree on. We should be able to vote. I agree with the discussions that, uh, speaking of just our, our party, uh, discussions that Senator Schumer had this morning. We all know that none of us got every single thing we want. Uh, and just as I'm sure my Republican friends have not got every single thing they want. And is any bill perfect, especially something of this unprecedented magnitude? Of course not. But we're at a point where reality has to overcome rhetoric. We have to stand up and be the conscience of the nation as we have been in the past and can be today. And it's time for senators to come together and vote. Uh, I know on our side, Senator Schumer, under his leadership and the others, we're ready to do that. We, it's interesting. I, I don't think people realize that even in our caucus, we go across the political spectrum. We all had different things we wanted. I'm the dean of the Senate. I'm the most senior member here. I have things that I want. I'm not going to get everything I want. And neither is the presiding officer. Neither is anybody here. But. America would get a lot more than it has now. A lot more than it has now. Let's do this for America. Let's pass this bill. Let's bring it up. Let's vote on it. Let's stop saying, oh, but yes, you have 98, 99 percent of what I want, but I've got this other little piece, or I've got this other little piece. No. As Americans, we should say it's reality time, not rhetoric time. Reality trumps rhetoric any day. Let's go ahead and vote. I commend those senators in the Republican Party and those senators in the Democratic Party who have worked so closely with each other. I know we have an appropriations, but in so many other parts we have. And 
it's time to say, okay, let's vote. With that, Mr. President, I will suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Senator from Iowa. I ask that the corn call be suspended. Without objection. Uh, I know we have a very important piece of legislation before us to uh, turn this economy around and help out our battle against the virus. While we're waiting to vote on that, I come to the floor for a couple points that I would like to make. The first one is to honor a famous Iowan. To, uh, to, this month is called Iowa History Month. So I come to the floor to speak about one of Iowa's favorite sons, Dr. Norman Borlaug, whose birthday is today. He's considered the father of the Green Revolution. Raised on a farm near Cresco, Iowa, Borlaug is credited with saving more lives than anyone in history with his breakthroughs in agronomy. It took him several years to accomplish what a lot of scientists do now in a laboratory in regard to fighting diseases in plants, and he did this in Mexico and India. His work helped to overcome malnutrition and famine across the world, saving over one billion lives in the process. His achievements won him the Nobel Peace Prize, but not only that famous prize, but also the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Congressional Gold Medal. Uh, I think that there's only five or six people that fall into the category of winning all three of those prizes. His achievements also prompted the state of Iowa to honor him with one of Iowa's two statues in the Statuary Hall here in the U.S. Capitol. On another subject, some pundits and even members of this body have suggested that it's inappropriate to criticize the Chinese Communist Party for its mishandling of the corona virus that originated in Wuhan, China, because it distracts from bashing the president. We went from mainstream media outlets routinely referring to the virus by its origin to this being totally politically incorrect. There's an excellent timetable published by Axios that lays out the Chinese cover-up that prevented early action to contain the virus. The Chinese pro-democracy activist, Mr. Wai, warned that General Secretary Xi is ordering people back to work prematurely, risking another massive outbreak of what he calls Wuhan pneumonia. Telling the truth, about the Chinese Communist Party's misdeeds does not preclude talking about how we can improve our own response. We can learn from free countries like South Korea, which has been able to contain a widespread outbreak, and Taiwan and Japan, who appear to have been able to prevent widespread outbreaks. So, this is not the time for political correct correctness or political point scoring to get in the way of telling the truth or working together in a clear-eyed way to address the challenges at hand. I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
President. Senator from Delaware. Mr. President, are we in a quorum call? We are, Senator. Mr. President, I ask the proceedings under the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Mr. President, I came to this building, this Capitol, about 12 hours ago today and recorded first thing this morning a video to share on social media with folks back at home who have been eagerly asking what's up, what's happening, what's next. And my message was simple. After days of disagreement and of tussling, of fighting and of crafting, we have a deal and I am ready to vote. Let's move forward. Twelve hours later, I stand in a largely empty chamber with an odd sense of foreboding, as I have all day, as have many of my colleagues, wondering what is taking so long? What is the delay? What are the remaining issues? And I am hopeful, prayerful even, that we will resolve what is left, move to this chamber, take up the text, vote it out, send it to the House, send it to the President, and send two trillion dollars in support to our nation. But let me tell you, as I have waited today and yesterday, as I've taken phone calls from folks from Delaware, for whatever reason they all say, when will the Senate act? And we faced a challenge over our last couple of days between moving swiftly and moving wisely. To put together a package of this size with no hearings, with no committee proceedings, with no detailed legislative process means it is rough hewn, means there are rough edges, means there will be mistakes in this bill. Is it perfect? No. In fact, in some pieces, we will discover as it unfolds far from it. But across the country, just as in this chamber, there is that sense of anxiousness, of anxiety, of when will it happen? Just a few weeks ago, the vast majority of our country was reading about coronavirus, about COVID-19 as something happening in distant countries on far shores. They read about sort of concerns about its alarming and rapid growth in Asia and then Europe. Things started changing as the stories got more dire and more grave as public health officials began to predict a global pandemic, as the World Health Organization announced it a global pandemic, as scientific leaders began to say that the United States would inevitably be touched by it, as our colleagues from the Pacific Northwest told us about how their communities were being affected, as extended contacts and friends and acquaintances on social media and then on the press shared how they or members of their community had become infected. And as it began to move across our country, it began to impact a remarkable range of institutions from baseball to Broadway, the closures of all sorts of treasured American institutions, every major sports league, every major public gathering. And as now state after state has issued edicts as city and county alike all over our county has all over our country have asked people to close their restaurants and their bars their small businesses as hotels have no occupants as airplanes fly with no passengers it's become haunting eerie the sense of an imminent disaster just before coming over here i read an article in the new york times about how in my region in the mid atlantic it has hit in the borough of Queens, in the city of New York, in a public hospital known as Elmhurst, yesterday, 13 patients died. And in a riveting account, the nurses and the doctors describe a catastrophic situation. Public health officials, trained health aides stretched to their limits, tested as they hadn't been before, struggling to get personal protective equipment, to have enough ventilators, to have enough ICU units. And I'll tell you, as over the last couple of days, I've talked with the heads of each of our major hospitals, folks who run skilled nursing facilities, nonprofits, community health centers, as I've heard from 
nurses and doctors I know, the level of alarm and concern has steadily risen in recent days. So folks, tonight as I stand here on the floor of the Senate, I am mindful that our nation is suffering, that there are people all over the world, but particularly here in the United States, in the states that we represent, who are anxious, who are unemployed, who are uncertain, in some cases, now too many, who are infected, who are hospitalized. It has come home to this chamber as one of our colleagues has tested positive and one of our dear colleagues, husbands, spouse, is hospitalized. We know members of the House and the Senate, of our staff and our immediate community have been touched by this dread disease. And we are now at a critical moment in our modern history. Simultaneously, a public health crisis and an economic crisis. I've heard too many people say it's unprecedented. It's not unprecedented. The United States and our nation have made it through tougher times than this. To say that the Great Depression and the Second World War, the Civil War and the Revolution, the hard work of labor organizing and the desperate work of throwing off the shackles of segregation and of Jim Crow, to say that those weren't tough and difficult struggles misses the significance of our history and the things we've overcome. But for most of us, for most of our families, for most of our communities, this wave, this pandemic, this virus, and the combined health and economic disaster that is upon us may be the greatest test we have faced. So how have we answered? Thousands of businesses already closed. Millions of people already unemployed. And a nation fearful of a pandemic swamping the resources of our hospitals and our health systems. Let me just speak briefly in broad strokes to what is in this bill, which we have finally ultimately hammered out after days of disagreement and in advance of our getting the final official text. In the broadest strokes, the help that will be delivered to the American people by this bill starts with individual assistance, something the President has championed and the Democrats have supported. We've had different versions of it, but we've roughly agreed on $1,200 to every adult citizen, making below $75,000, and it phases out to those making below $100,000 with $500 per child, your average family might well see three to $4,000. These checks will come out in weeks, delivered directly for those with direct deposit through the IRS or by check to those harder to find who haven't filed recently but are eligible. This is a remarkable direct support to help millions of Americans have cash in their family checkbook to get through the unexpected hardship of these next few months. There's more than $100 billion in this bill to support our health workers on the front line and the hospitals that make our public health possible. possible. You heard that story about Elmhurst Hospital. In my own home state, there's hospitals, rural and urban, large and small, that without this support will struggle to make it through this period. The heroes of this period are the folks who are working, the folks who are cleaning offices, trains, hospital rooms, often without enough protective equipment, often without health care themselves, often without adequate pay, the folks who labor at night here in this Capitol in our offices to make sure they're clean and safe from this virus we can't see, the folks who work in public hospitals, work long hours. They're orderlies, they're nurses, they're the paramedics and the ambulance drivers who deliver the sick, and they're the surgeons and the doctors who direct their care. And one of the things I am proudest of that is in this now that was not in this several days ago is $150 billion to states and counties and cities. In the 10 years I spent in county government, I came to deeply respect the men and women who helped keep our county government afloat and our community stronger, safer, and healthier. This support, this direct support to the states and the counties on the front lines of this epidemic will help them get through it. There's a $500 billion fund, the subject of much discussion and debate, that as initially written and proposed, 
would help sustain some of our iconic industries like the airlines, but with almost no transparency in terms of the terms of the loans or the grants that would be given, and almost no restrictions on how the companies to receive them might use them for what purposes. Broadly speaking, after days of fighting, we've come to agreements that I support and embrace. Restrictions on buybacks and dividends and executive compensation, guarantees against layoffs and against the destruction of collective bargaining agreements, and broadly speaking, transparency and accountability. One of the things I am most proud of is that there will be now an accountability board, a pandemic response accountability committee, both an inspector general, a special inspector general, and $80 million in this bill for the operation of that accountability committee. Let me move, since I see I have a number of colleagues who have joined me on the floor, to just a few other points if I could. There's $350 billion in this bill for the Small Business Administration to disperse to small businesses and to nonprofits all over our country with this, an incentive structure to change it from a loan to a grant to those who would retain or rehire their workforce. As I've heard from restaurant owners, from hotel owners, from those who work in bars and restaurants and hotels in my community, those are the folks who've been hit the first and the hardest by the closures. This provision will allow those small businesses to reopen quickly and robustly when we get on the other side of this pandemic. And I look forward to working with my colleagues, with the SBA administrator, with the SBA lenders in my state and around the country to make sure it's done well and that it's done quickly. I wrote the bill that added $17 billion more so that 320,000 current small businesses who are current SBA loan holders get six months of relief, moves them off the agenda of the SBA staff and the SBA lenders to clear the decks for them to administer this $350 billion. And I supported Senator Cardin in his initiative to add $10 billion for small, rapid grants to the most severely impacted businesses and nonprofits. This section of the overall bill, where Senators Rubio and Collins, Cardin and Shaheen negotiated most of it, struck me as the most bipartisan and most productive. There is so much more in this bill I could speak to. The ways in which the resources of the Federal Reserve are going to be deployed to help medium businesses and small businesses. The ways in which the private sector in my home state has stepped up to partner and to deliver critically needed resources, whether it's refurbishing ventilators or donating surplus PPE from the construction sector that they don't need today, or it's the university that's closed its research labs but makes its resources available to our hospital. There are some remarkable efforts at partnership going on in my community and around the country. But at the end of the day, we have a critical question. Is this bill perfect? No. Could we improve it by more time here arguing with each other, offering more amendments, debating further? Yes. Is there something I badly wanted that did not get in this final bill? Absolutely. We've had nine major states delay their elections, delay their presidential primaries because of this pandemic. And I urged that a bill written by my colleagues, Senator Klobuchar and Senator Wyden, that I joined be added in text to require every state to have a plan to vote by mail during this pandemic. If our troops could vote from the front lines in the Civil War and Second World War, by gosh, we should have a plan to vote even if this pandemic continues. I was disappointed that text is ultimately not going to be in this bill. $400 million will begin to help those states that want to vote by mail, to expand and strengthen vote by mail, and I will be back. I will be back to insist on this provision in the next bill. But as I have said to many colleagues in the last few days, we cannot all get everything we hope for and want and believe to be important in this bill. We must put down the tools of partisanship and personal interest and sectional concerns. We must put down some of the things we most hope for. We must put down the tools with which we so often fight each other. And we must come together and take up the implements of national purpose, of compromise, of consensus, and deliver these resources to a nation anxious, concerned, and at times even angry at all of us in the Senate for what they see as too long a delay. So with that, 
Let me just say to my colleagues, it is time for us to take up this bill, rough hewn as it is, pass it through this chamber, send it to the House. I've urged my colleagues in the House to pass it promptly, send it to the President's desk for signature, and then let us all get to the hard work of making sure we do the best we can for the people we represent with this historic stimulus package, this remarkable Coronas relief package that is going to deliver $2 trillion of assistance and support to communities all over our country. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Nevada. Thank you. Mr. President, I rise today to let all Nevadans know the important steps Congress is taking to respond to the pandemic we are facing right now. The novel coronavirus presents a global challenge to the health and economic security of Nevada and the United States. My thoughts today are with those in Nevada who are ill or suffering with the virus and with the families of the six Nevadans who have died because of this disease. I also want to thank the brave men and women on the front lines of this crisis, the first responders and healthcare workers who are battling to save lives, putting their own health and the health of their families at risk. I know there is a lot of fear and confusion in our communities right now. Please know this, though. I am working closely with Governor Sisolak and the Nevada delegation to ensure that our state gets the resources it needs to stem the spread of the coronavirus, to treat those who need medical attention, and address the needs of struggling families and businesses. I also know that we are Nevada strong. I've seen over and over again that when things get difficult, Nevadans come together. When a gunman attacked the Route 91 Harvest Festival in Las Vegas, I saw how Nevadans from all over the state worked heroically to help victims and support families. And Nevadans are uniting now, too. I am proud to say that across the Silver State, people are doing their part to reduce the impact of COVID-19. Our governor, Steve Sisolak, has shown tremendous leadership in working to slow the spread of the coronavirus. As Governor Sisolak has pointed out, if home means Nevada, we need everyone who can stay home for Nevada. Our nurses, doctors, and health officials are working tirelessly to care for the sick and to increase our capacity to deal with the cases in the future. First responders, local health authorities, sanitation workers, and retail workers are on the job around the clock to make sure that essential services are available to Nevadans. And our gaming, entertainment, and hospitality industry leaders took unprecedented steps to stop the spread of infection, including by closing their doors. And so many Nevadans are contributing by working from home when they can, caring for school-aged children, volunteering to help make masks or buy groceries for elderly neighbors, and avoiding social interactions that could spread the virus. Everyone, every single Nevadan, each and every American has a role to play in this crisis. We need everyone to do their part by following the advice of the experts and taking practical, common sense steps like washing hands and practicing social distancing. And my colleagues and I in Congress have done our part as well. The Senate has come together in a remarkable and bipartisan fashion to act on three bills to address key health care priorities and to protect workers and industry from the economic impacts of the public health crisis. Earlier in March, we set aside $8.3 billion to support hospitals, community health centers, public health offices, medical suppliers, and researchers across the country. And then next, we passed the Bipartisan Families First Coronavirus Response Act to provide free coronavirus testing 
to expand food assistance and mandate paid sick and family leave for workers. And I am proud to have fought alongside my colleagues in Nevada's congressional delegation, including my friend and colleague, Senator Jackie Rosen, to pass today's third relief bill. We must pass this today. It is quite simply the greatest single investment in our economy and healthcare system in modern American history. And we need it. In 2007, our state was hit hard by the recession. Through tremendous effort, we came through it, but our economic recovery was slow. This time, we want to make sure our economy springs back quickly after this crisis has passed and that workers have good jobs to return to when it does. That's why we need to pass these far-reaching measures to provide immediate relief to individuals, families, and businesses suffering from the economic impacts of this pandemic. Nevada has an economy that's unique in the nation. Our hospitality industry generates nearly $68 billion annually and supports more than 450,000 jobs across the state. So I have been focused on standing up for our gaming tourism and hospitality workers. I also wanted to make sure that when we offered relief to big companies, there was oversight, transparency, accountability, and worker protections in place. This bill does that. I am grateful to the many small businesses in my state who have taken the hard but necessary action and closed their doors or reduced their services at this critical time. This bill supports them as well by providing forgivable loans and grants so that they can open the doors again as soon as it is safe for them to do so. Most of all, I wanted to make sure we supported Nevada's workers and their families, the hardworking people our industries employ. That's why I worked with my Senate colleagues to ensure that key protections for Nevadans and all Americans were included in this relief package. We fought to expand unemployment assistance so that it includes part-time, self-employed, and seasonal and gig economy workers that make up a key part of our labor force in the Silver State. Whether you're a dishwasher at a hotel on the Strip or you're a hairstylist in Carson City, you will be eligible for up to four months of unemployment benefits. And yes, we locked down direct payments of $1,200 for each adult and $500 for each child up to a certain income level so that our hardworking families would have money in their pockets to recover from this pandemic. And we successfully pushed to shore up our hospitals and our healthcare infrastructure to get them more money for protective gear, supplies, and tests so that they can provide patients the best possible care while at the same time protecting themselves. So we made sure that we also included our local, state, and tribal communities. We set aside $150 billion for our governments who are bearing the brunt of costs for local health care systems. That's why I support this legislation, and that's why we have to pass this tonight. And I would be remiss if I did not say thank you to the incredible staff that worked so hard for this past few days, 24-7, to put this relief package together in a bipartisan way. From Leader Schumer's staff and Leader Schumer, the negotiating team, the senators that I get to work with every single day, their hardworking staff, and my staff as well, who worked late nights to make sure that we were fighting on behalf of Nevadans. Listen, I know this is a difficult time for everyone, but we are going to get through this just as we persevered before. And we'll do it by rallying to help one another, as Nevadans always do. There will be moments of challenge ahead, and each of us has a responsibility to answer these questions. Let's listen to the experts. Let's take care of one another, and let's be kind and understanding of what we are all going through. But let's not lose sight of the beauty of our everyday lives, that familiar rhythm we're all eager to restore. In Nevada and across the country, we will be back at our workplaces again, solving our everyday problems. Our children will be back at school, learning for themselves how to make the world a better place. 
And yes, we'll begin the long task of grieving those we have lost, but we'll also be celebrating marriages again and marking births with a newfound joy. We will get through this together. And I promise everyone in the Silver State that I will be fighting in the Senate to make sure we rebound from this stronger than before so that Nevadans can get back to work. Mr. President, I yield the floor and ask that we pass this bill tonight. I know you feel the same way, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to get that done. Thank you very much. Mr. President. Senator for South Carolina. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to <clears throat> compliment my colleagues, Senator Rick Scott, Tim Scott, and Senator Sass. Today, when we were getting briefed about the bill, something hit me like a ton of bricks, and there are a lot of good things in here. Uh, there's money for health care providers, hospitals, nurses, and doctors. Uh, there's so many good things. The country's under siege. And I was one of the first Republicans, Mr. President, to join my Democratic colleagues. I think I talked to Senator Durbin. We need to do something more on unemployment insurance because the Collins-Rubio construct, I think, will help, but some people are going to fall through the cracks. Never in my wildest dreams, Senator Durbin, did I believe that what we have done is to pay people more not to work than to work. Under this bill, the $600 payment on top of state benefits actually allows people to have their income almost doubled in certain circumstances. And I want to help people. I want to make sure that you, if you lose your job, that we cover your wages. But under this bill, you get $23.15 an hour based on a 40-hour work week not to work. And if you're trying to hire somebody in South Carolina in the next four months, you got to compete with that wage. And if you're working in a restaurant or probably not now, but if you're working anywhere for $15 an hour, somebody's making $23 an hour and you're working. It's just not fair. It's going to hurt the Rubio Collins construct. Restaurants that are out of business, we want them to be able to borrow money to pay the payroll to keep people connected to, the, to, to their employer. Now, what do you do when you make $23 an hour being on unemployment? How do you keep that waitress or bartender at $15 or $17? You've made it a nightmare for small businesses. They're being pitted against their own employees. So to Senator Durbin and everybody else, the reason we're doing this is because they tell me it takes six to eight months for unemployment commissions at the state level to figure this out. What are we asking you to do? To get unemployment, you've got to tell us where you work and how much you make. And what we want to do is fill in the difference between the state unemployment benefit and your actual wages and stop there. We don't do that under this bill. There, you're, there are people getting paid more not to work than they were in the workforce. It's going to be hard to not incentivize people to leave their job. You can be unemployed at $23 an hour in South Carolina. That's more than a lot of people make. So I'm just urging my colleagues, we need to fix this now. No matter how well-intentioned, you're going to make the next four months impossible for small businesses to hire. And I can promise you this, if you pay somebody $23 an hour not to work, they're probably going to find a way to get there rather than staying in the workforce where I'm sure they'd rather be. We have created a perverse incentive not to help the unemployed person, but to destroy the ability to stay employed. So with that, I would just say to my colleagues, thank you for trying to bring common sense back to the body. I am very much for this bill. It does help a lot of people, but we've created Pandora's box for our economy, and I wish we could fix it tonight, and if we don't, we need to keep trying and trying and trying. And with that, I will yield to my colleagues. <clears throat> Senator from Florida. Under this bill as it's written now, the government will pay many Americans more to be on... Oh, Mr. You <laughs> need this, don't you? <laughs> All right. Under this bill as it's written now, the government will pay many Americans more to be on government assistance than they would make if they're working at their regular jobs. I support expanding the unemployment insurance program. It's the best and quickest way to get money to people that need it most. But we should not create a system 
where unemployment insurance benefits, benefits are higher than a salary. We cannot pay people more to not work than to work. This is basic common sense. Most people will choose the bigger check, and I don't blame them at all. No person who understands anything about business, economics, or human nature would create such a perverse and ridiculous system. This bill creates an incentive for workers to be unemployed for the next four months. Fact. Without workers, our economy cannot reopen. Fact. If our economy reopens essentially, if our economy remains essentially closed for four more months, we will be in a very deep recession. Fact. You may ask how I know how do I know all this? I grew up poor in public housing. My mom worked three jobs, and my parents were constantly struggling to find work. I know what it's like to skip Christmas and see the family car repossessed. And on the end, other end of the spectrum, I've run businesses, both small and large, and have had great success. That's exactly how I know these things. This isn't conjecture, these are facts. There are many good things in this bill, and there are many provisions that I wholeheartedly disagree with. But the worst thing we could do right now is create a disincentive to work. We cannot get our economy up and running again. We cannot recover from this. But we, we can get our economy up and running again. We can recover from this. But it will take a lot longer if we don't amend this bill to eliminate the perverse incentives. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me be clear, abundantly clear. I plan to support this legislation tonight, but I do want to fix it first. Our amendment is a very simple amendment. But first, it is our responsibility to the extent possible to take care of the American people. I want to provide 100% of the salary while an American is laid off because of COVID-19. 100% of the salary of someone laid off because of COVID-19. My goal is to do it the right way. The right way is that you get your income as if you're still working because you've been laid off because of COVID-19. Not a raise for not working. Not 200% of your income while on unemployment. The goal is simply to keep you whole while you're unemployed because of COVID-19. I cannot stress enough as a former employer and frankly, as a former employee. The relationship between the employer and the employee is critical. Our nation is built on the dignity of work. What this bill does without fixing it is it simply says you can earn more money by being on un unemployment than you can while working. That is an incentive that is perverse. We cannot have intended to encourage people not to work and make more money than to go back to work and receive your normal pay. With that, I yield. Mr. President. Senator from Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. President. As Senator Tim Scott just said, and as Rick Scott and Lindsey Graham just said, this amendment is really, really simple. All we're trying to say is that we should help everyone who needs to be helped without us accidentally creating a disincentive to work that's not good for anybody in the country or the country as a whole. We're in the middle of two unprecedented crises right now. We have a public health crisis and we have an economic crisis into which we're just entering and we don't know how long the valley of this recession is gonna be, but I wanna be sure that every American who's watching tonight understands exactly what this debate has been about this afternoon. This debate is how you can be both pro-worker and pro-recovery, to be kind and charitable and actually also simultaneously affirming the ongoing dignity of work and the necessity of work as our country battles through this virus and ultimately rebuilds our economy. Nobody here is arguing about whether or not we should help workers. Everybody on both sides of the aisle tonight wants to help workers. This is a debate about whether or not we're gonna let a poorly drafted bill knock this nation still harder in the coming months by unintentionally increasing unemployment. That's what this debate is about. Right now, as the coronavirus is threatening our economy, 
we know who the real heroes are. The real heroes are not politicians. There are a lot of people who have been working all night, five or six nights in a row, but the heroes that are gonna beat this virus and rebuild America are not politicians. The heroes are the men and women who are stocking shelves, the men and women who are picking up trash, the men and women who are driving trucks and delivering takeout, many of them converting restaurants which used to be sit down into takeout restaurants, putting food on the table for a lot of their neighbors. The Americans who are keeping the pharmacies open, they're the heroes. The daycare workers who are doing stuff to watch other ER doctors' kids, those are the heroes. The heroes are the Americans across all 50 states, across every town and village and suburb and city that are doing the work, the ordinary jobs, but now under extraordinarily painful and difficult circumstances. They're the heroes, the scrappers, and the doers, and we should be celebrating them, affirming them, and helping them once we get through this crisis to get back to work. This bill has lots and lots of good stuff in it. I intend to support it as well, but there are pieces of this bill that are broken and that we can fix tonight. And if we don't fix them tonight, it's gonna to exacerbate our problems and we're gonna be back here in a month and in two months trying to fix these problems. These are the Americans who are gonna get us through. They're the people who are gonna keep our supply chains alive and those supply chains are the lifeline for lots of Americans right now. Here's what's wrong with the bill. As it's currently drafted, it threatens to cripple the supply chain for many different categories of workers, some in health sectors, some in food prep and food delivery. This bill, as currently drafted, creates a perverse incentive for men and women who are sidelined to then not leave the sidelines and come back to work. This bill creates a perverse incentive for many employers who should be wanting to try to maintain the employer-employee relationship. It creates a perverse incentive for them to sever that employer-employee relationship. Many other pieces of this bill try to tackle this problem in a really constructive way. The $350 billion for the Small Business Administration, it is trying to build bridge load programs that help employers and employees be connected and remain connected through this downturn. The unemployment insurance piece of this should not work at cross purposes to what the bill is about in the overall uh, argument. Nobody has a problem with the generous unemployment benefits that are in this bill. Nobody has a problem with the generous unemployment insurance benefits that are in this bill. They should be generous amid the national crisis that we're in, but we don't want this piece of the bill to create an incentive for folks to stop working, to have their employers push them away when the employer and employee should be trying to rally around and together to help us build through this crisis. So we wanna do something really simple. We wanna fix what's broken here by saying that unemployment insurance benefits should be capped at 100% of the pay you had before you were unemployed. This isn't just about people who've already been made unemployed. This is about people who are going to be made unemployed in the coming weeks. All this amendment says that we're voting on in a few minutes is that we should cap the unemployment benefits at 100% of the wages you were just receiving while working. There, it should not be something the US Congress does to create an incentive where you'll get paid more by not working than you get by working. That's pro-recovery legislation that tries to keep our supply chains humming and tries to help us together, 325 million Americans come together to beat this thing, we should vote for workers, we should vote for recovery, and we should vote to beat this thing and come out stronger on the other side. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator Illinois. Mr. President, I'd like to address this issue because I think it's important that we explain where we are today and why we have reached this point. I can recall when Senator Graham crossed the aisle a week or so ago, perhaps, and started talking about unemployment insurance and his goals with unemployment insurance. It sounded consistent with the language and conversation I'd heard in our own side of the aisle, our own caucus, to use the unemployment insurance system as a way to make sure that people were able to really weather the storm when it came to the public health crisis we face. The number of people who are filing for unemployment has gone up dramatically. Two million new unemployment claims filed last week compared to 218,000 nationwide in previous weeks. So we know that the number of people who have lost their jobs, laid off, furloughed, fired, uh, is growing just in a, in a fashion we've never seen before. I've seen it reported in my state. I'm sure each of you have seen the same. But let's get down to the bottom line. And I ask my colleagues to just bear with me for a minute. 
What you are describing is what we initially set out to do. And then we met with the representatives of the United States Department of Labor. I was in one of the task forces for the Senate Finance Committee, and I sat there as a representative from the U.S. Department of Labor came in and said, Senators, you don't understand 50 different states' computer systems when it comes to unemployment benefits. We can tell you point blank that only six or eight states out of the 50 could possibly do what you want to achieve. They tell us it will take them months to reprogram their computers to make the simple calculation, what appears to be a simple calculation, that says you never get paid more in unemployment than you were making on the job. That was the reality. We didn't make that up. This wasn't a democratic dreamed up idea. This was the Trump administration, Department of Labor, telling us that when they looked at the state departments of labor, they couldn't achieve what you want to achieve with your amendment. In other words, if you go forward and you're successful, I don't believe you will be, but if you were successful, what we would end up with is frankly a deadlock, no increases in unemployment insurance benefits. Now let me tell you, beyond this administrative problem, which was not our creation, was identified by the Trump administration, beyond this administrative problem, there are two or three things I want to say as a bottom line. First, we are determined to make sure that the workers come out at least whole, if not better, through this terrible experience they're going through. Now, this notion that the workers would come out better is not unique to the Democratic side of the aisle. The cash payment proposed by the Trump administration, $1,200 per adult, $500 per child, for some will be a benefit, may even be a small but important windfall that comes their way. So be it that working families across America would end up with this cash payment from the Trump administration, I don't object to at all. But the Democrats have said that's one and done. That's an airdrop of cash to people. What about the next week and the next month? That's why we brought up the unemployment insurance. Now the $600 figure we came up with was an attempt to make sure that everyone was whole at the end of the day. I will concede your point. Some workers, some, may end up coming up ahead because of this calculation of $600 a week. They may come out ahead. I'm not going to stand here and say I feel badly about that. I don't feel badly about that at all. When less than half of the people in America have $400 in their savings, the notion that we might end up giving people another $1,000 or $2,000 at the end of four months, to me that is not something that we ought to be ashamed of or run away from. That is a real possibility, and it may happen. I will support that just as I supported the Trump administration's cash payment to that same family. They're going through some tough times and they have for a long, long time. How many of us have given speeches on this floor about income inequality in America and some of the hardest working people still unable to make it paycheck to paycheck, week to week? So let's give them that helping hand and not apologize for it for a minute. We're standing with these workers and their families and I think you want to as well. But the way you want to calculate it, we are told, cannot be done. It cannot be done in a, in a fashion that brings relief to these families when they need it right now. I mean, let's yield. I will just a minute. I'm happy to yield as soon as I finish. But I want to make this point as clearly as I can. I believe that this is not a windfall. Let's assume that instead of $600 a week, your calculation makes it $450 a week. So $150 times 16 weeks, that's four months. How much is that going to come out to? $2,400? Is that going to mean that someone now becomes lazy and won't go back to work? I don't think so. I think a lot of people will use that money and need that money and are given a helping hand and will put it right back in the economy. That's what this is about, that these families can keep their homes, pay their utility bills, put food on the table, and put the money back into the economy. That's part of what we're trying to achieve here. If we err on the side of giving a hardworking family an extra $1,000 or $2,000 because of our approach, so be it. No apologies. We didn't design the system. We were told we had to work within the design of the system. We've tried to do it. We think the $600 a week is a reasonable way to do it. And I'll yield for a question. Thank you, Senator. The six. $100 a week, I think if I do the math quickly, times 16 is about $9,600 added on top of the additional $1,200 per person or $2,400 for a family or $2,900 if you have kids is an important number that we should consider. Uh, I think you have hit on the point that we should all be willing to agree upon that the systems of unemployment throughout our country 
uh, perhaps are working on antiquated equipment that may need to be updated so that we can, in fact, keep people whole during their unemployment. I would love for us to work in a bipartisan fashion to try to figure out through the Department of Labor how to fix the problem so that those folks who deserve the benefits get all that they deserve, but that we actually have a system that's nimble enough for us to meet the need state by state without exceeding the need so that when we're in this position again, as we're looking at phase four or phase five, we're not again having a conversation about systems that are so antiquated or perhaps even obsolete that we're doing something that was not never that was not intended. I'm not suggesting that we can get that done tonight. I'm not even suggesting that we can get that done over the next few months. I am, however, concluding that we should work to get it done. I don't disagree with my friend from South Carolina at all. I, I really Thank agree you. with you completely. We are in the midst of a national emergency. That's not my announcement. That's the announcement of President Trump. I believe it. When you look at all the people now filing for unemployment, when you look at the hardships they're facing, the, the lifestyles which they've had to live to try to comply with shelter in place and all the rules that are going out here, the number of people filing these unemployment insurance claims, they tell us the reality of the situation. The notion, as you said, $9,600 times three, three times four months, it basically comes out to about $30,000 a year, roughly. That's what the $600 is calculated to mean on an annual basis. So on a four-month basis, if we end up giving people an extra 1000 or 2000 it is not inconsistent with what the Trump administration says they want to do with their cash payment. In the meantime, if we are going to move forward, and I hope this crisis comes to an end quickly, if we're going to move forward into a new phase, phase four, phase five, whatever it is, let's work together to try to upgrade these systems, to make them work the way we want them to work. But in the meantime, wouldn't we want to err on the side of standing with working families and their employees? Wouldn't we want to do that in this first effort? I think it's the happy, reasonable and thoughtful way to do it. Happy to answer, answer that question if the gentleman will yield. I'd be happy to yield for a question from my friend from South Carolina. Uh, uh, I, I would say that on both sides of the aisle, would you not agree that we are both trying to get to the place where we are, in fact, keeping the average person, especially the working class people, whole as we ponder and discuss this amendment? Would you agree? Of course. And, and, and that's and my, my final thought is that my goal isn't to come down here and have a disagreement as much as it is to illuminate a very important part of the process that if we can get it fixed throughout our country, that as we tackle these issues in the future, more folks on both sides of the aisle will have greater confidence in giving these resources to the states so that our people can be whole. That's all I wanted to say. No disagreement. I'd say to my friend from South Carolina, no disagreement. But the U.S. Department of Labor says we cannot do that at this moment. And at this moment, when people are hurting so badly, when they've lost their jobs, they're furloughed, they're laid off, and they're worried about paying their bills, the Trump administration says we're going to send them a cash payment. We say, and I hope it's a bipartisan statement, we're with you too. It isn't going to end with that one cash payment. We're going to stick with you and make sure your unemployment insurance benefits are going to keep you and your family together. And if by chance you come out a little bit ahead in this process, with the cash payment or with this calculation of this formula, so be it. So be it. At this moment in history facing this national emergency, we would rather err on the side of you being able to pay your bills and keeping your family together. Future needs, we can discuss. We can debate. We can see what we can do with the state systems. But for the time being, no apologies. $600 a week from where I'm standing is exactly what Democrats are committed to. I hope Republicans as well. Because our belief is that this is the moment when we need to st stand with these workers. I might say I support Rubio and Cardin and their efforts to help small businesses. I think that's the right thing to do. Bipartisan from the start and really without much controversy. Have we asked any of those businesses to produ produce net worth statements before they receive those benefits? No. We're not doing that. We understand this is an extraordinary moment. And we may do something different if we're thinking about long-term policy, but for the immediate policy, let us do the right thing. Let's err on the side of helping working families who are out of work. And that's why I would oppose this amendment if it's going to be offered by the senator from Nebraska. And I came to the floor to explain how we reached this point, and I hope that others will consider my point of view. Thank you. I yield the floor.
Mr. President. I would just say very briefly that I appreciate uh, the comments from the senator from Illinois explaining his position. It, it seems to me that from where he started, um, he should actually be supporting the amendment, um, and then we should figure out what we would need to do to push on the Department of Labor to actually modernize their systems. Um, but I, I just want to say in public something that has been negotiated for the last eight or nine hours, and we haven't been able to get conversation partners really on that side of the aisle, which are you are absolutely right that the Department of Labor says there are massive system problems in the states. And so given that we are entering a recession at this moment, and we're going to have lots and lots of needy Americans, the calls on these state departments of uninsurance benefits are substantial right now. And so I would just say, taking you uh, at, at good faith, that you'd like to upgrade these systems so that we could do this thing which doesn't accidentally stimulate unemployment by disincentivizing work, I've been trying all afternoon to get people on that side of the aisle to say, hey, maybe we can't get this solved by day one of the new unemployment insurance benefits, but by week eight or nine, maybe we should have been able to get to a place where the Department of Labor had the resources to help these state departments of unemployment insurance deal with this. So I'll follow up with you offline uh, because I would like to work with you on trying to upgrade these systems. I have one more thing to say, but if you want to get in a word, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I would. In the, in, the, in the nature of a question through the chair, which I believe is the appropriate procedural the presiding officer is very liberal on these things. He, he's well, pretty easy. This is actually <laughs> turning out to be a, a debate on the floor of the Senate. It's almost historic. But uh, I would just say this. We disagree on one basic premise. I don't believe giving people $1,200, as the president has suggested, for each adult, or if they ended up with a net gain out of our approach of $2,000, that we've now turned them into lazy people who will not go back to work. They'll just wait for the next government check. These aren't the people I know, and they aren't the people you know. By and large, these are hardworking people who, with an additional $1,000, may finally be able to buy that refrigerator, may finally be able to get that car fixed, may finally be able to get some um, dental work done. Um, so I don't think paying them a little extra here is going to change their lifestyle and attitude toward hard work. Yeah, so I think it's pretty, we, we were agreeing for a while, but I think it is pretty important here to underscore that your math isn't real. Um, the reality is, in lots and lots and lots of states in the country, where people are earning 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 dollars an hour right now, the unemployment option they're going to be offered is going to be more like 24 or 25 dollars an hour. We're not talking about a thousand dollars over the course of these four months. We're talking about cases where people might have an annualized wage right now of 30 thousand dollars and be looking at an unemployment benefit of a thousand dollars a week, which is 50 thousand dollars annualized. So your math isn't real. Um, the reality is, it isn't 600 dollars total. It's 600 dollars on top of what the unemployment benefits already were in that state. And so there are lots of people who are struggling to work hard, to love their neighbor. We got a lot of health aides in Nebraska who make 16 bucks an hour. That's a $32,000 a year job. Their work is important. That's a vocation. People need them. There are sick people from COVID-19 and other diseases right now in Nebraska that need the benefit of those health aides. And you've just told them in this bill, we've just told them in this bill, yeah, your work's a little bit important, but look at this. You could make substantially more money if you didn't do the hard thing of trying to figure out what do we do with our kids today when school's closed and I don't know how to do daycare and my sister agreed to help take care of my kids, but did I really put the burden on her when I don't actually have to go to work to get this same money? In fact, I can get substantially more money by going on the unemployment insurance program. That's a disincentive to work that I don't think you believe in. I know I don't believe in it. I know nobody in my state believes in it. It's not a Republican versus a Democratic issue. This is an American issue. We believe in workers, and we believe in work, and we don't believe government should come in and say, it's much better off to be a non-worker than a worker. You can make a lot more money being a non-worker than a worker. We're not talking about people who suffered layoffs last week. We're talking about creating a system here which will incentivize more unemployment next week. That's a mistake by this Congress, and we could and we should be doing better than that tonight. I know the senator from Texas has been trying to get in, so Mr. President, I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Texas. Mr. President, this bill is going to pass overwhelmingly. It may pass unanimously tonight, but I think this amendment would make it substantially better. I expect we'll see a party line vote on this amendment. I think that's unfortunate because the consequence of the system, the unemployment insurance system in this bill right now, is that we're going to substantially disincentivize work, and it's going to hurt 
workers, it's going to hurt small businesses. Let me give you a concrete example. In Texas right now, the maximum unemployment insurance is $521 a week. After this bill passes, that will rise from $521 a week to $1,121 a week. That is nearly, that is just over $58,000 a year. That means in the state of Texas, we're going to be paying people, offering them basically 28 bucks an hour not to work. Now listen, every one of us recognizes people are hurting. The problem is the incentive. We're creating an incentive that will hurt small businesses. If you've got a waiter or a waitress who's lost their job for a few weeks, they're on unemployment and they're making $25, $26, $28 an hour, suddenly the prospect of going back to that job and seeing, seeing the money they're making going down substantially, that doesn't seem too attractive. And suddenly the restaurant owner that's trying to make the small business work can't attract those workers back. And that's bad for everyone. Incentives matter. We want people to work. And so I, I would ask the senator from Illinois, you, you said the problem with implementing this principle, that we shouldn't pay people more not to work than they make working. You said the problem was administrative, that the Department of Labor and the states couldn't do it. Would the senator agree with this amendment and would the Democratic Party agree with this amendment if it simply had language inserted to the best uh, extent practicable? So acknowledging that it may not be practicable, but would you agree with the principle that in implementing this, the states and the Department of Labor should try to make sure we're not paying people more not to work than they would make if they were working? Is that a question directed to me through the chair? I'll, I'll yield to the senator from Illinois. All right, let, let me just say at the outset, we are talking about people who did not voluntarily leave their jobs. These people did not voluntarily leave their jobs. They were terminated, they were laid off, they were furloughed. These are not people who are gaming a system. These are people who are victims of a system that is hurt by this national emergency. And secondly, if we are erring on the side of giving struggling, hardworking families an additional $1,000 a month, $1,000 a month, for goodness sakes, I'm not gonna apologize for a moment. These people are living paycheck to paycheck in many respects if they're making $15 an hour, that's $30,000 a year. And for us to say, well, they're going to end up with 1000 bucks. now they'll never go back to work, those people. I don't believe that. And we've been contacted in this world of social media and such by nurses who say, so you think we're going to quit our jobs so that we can take on advantage of the unemployment benefits? No. We go to our jobs and we do what we have to do, and the amount of money is secondary. So if I could re reclaim my time. I'll be happy to, and I thank the senator from Texas. But I would just say this. Yes, in this respect, I agree with you. Take a look at the state systems of paying unemployment benefits. We are told by the U.S. Department of Labor, many of them are way behind the modern technology and cannot meet what you uh, have stated as your goal here. If we want to work toward that goal of improving those state systems, as Senator Scott said earlier, uh, I'll join you in that effort. But let's not apologize for perhaps sending an extra $1,000. And one last point, we're asking these people to stay home. We're asking them to help us defeat this virus by not working. Stay with your family. So one of the incentives here, if there's a good unemployment benefit coming in, is that they can keep their families together while they obey this directive, at least, from government, state, and federal. So these quarantines are going to end. The period of staying at home is going to end. But under the policy favored by the Democratic senators, there's going to be an incentive that's going to end up with more people being unemployed. It, let's say you're a restaurant owner, and if you keep your employees on, maybe through a small business loan, you can pay them, say, 10 bucks or 11 bucks or 15 bucks an hour, whatever you're paying. But if you let them go, they can go on unemployment and make a whole lot more money. You don't think there are going to be a lot of small business owners that have their employees saying, wait a second, I can make more money? That's a bad incentive. We want to create incentives. I agree people want to work, but government can mess that up if we make it more profitable, I'd much rather, look, the checks we're sending, the $1,200 a person, that doesn't create an incentive. It's not $1,200 if you do X conduct. We want incentives that bring people back to work so that these small businesses that are closing their doors every day don't stay closed. They open up again. They have opportunity again. And, and, and it is a perverse incentive 
to pay people more not to work than to work. Yes, we should help them, but we shouldn't trap them, and, and that's what this policy... Senator Deal, for a question. Of course. Is the Senator, I'm sure you're acutely aware this is a four-month program. We are not offering people this benefit indefinitely. I hope we don't have to renew it. But to say that I'm going to change my lifestyle and give up returning to the place where I've worked forever, where I was just laid off because they closed the restaurant, because of a four-month program, I don't think so. I think people are more loyal to the workplace if they're treated fairly. And if we end up giving them an additional $1,000 a month at the end of the day, I think it's the right thing to do. The incentives matter. And we don't want to delay a recovery from this crisis by four months. Hopefully, we stop this global pandemic and we stop it soon. You don't know how soon that will be. I don't know. And, and one of the benefits of this bill is we're flooding more resources and we should be into testing, into preventative gear, into ventilators. There's a lot we need to do to stop this pandemic. But when it ends, and it will end, we will get through this. We want people to go back to work, not four months from now. We want them to go back to work as soon as they're able to go back to work. And, and, and that's what our economy needs to be strong. I would note again that I posed a question to the Senator of Illinois, would he take a modification that acknowledged the administrative problems, but said this is the principle we should follow, that you shouldn't be paid more not to work than you are paid to work, and the Senator from Illinois did, didn't answer that. Deal for a question. Does Happy the Senator day. support the Trump administration's cash payment to these families, which comes to them whether they work or not? Uh, I do. I'm going to vote for it, but it doesn't create an incentive because it's not. Th th this is where too many in the Democratic Party don't understand the incentives of trapping people out of work. Incentives are future looking. Sending these checks right now, if, you're ma if you make $75,000 or less, you're going to get a check in the mail in the next couple of weeks. That's help and relief, but it doesn't create an incentive for conduct tomorrow. What I don't want is people to be sitting there making a choice, make a very rational choice. Look, if you're sitting there and saying, well, gosh, I can make a lot more money staying at home with my kids and not working than if I go back to the job, that's not an irrational decision. If you're making a 28 bucks an hour to stay at home, we're causing that problem if we're incentivizing people not to work, and that's not ultimately in their interest or in the economy's interest. This is hurting workers to pay them more not to work than they would make if they were working. Just comment and say this. I don't think President Trump's cash payment or an additional $1,000 a month or whatever it is under the unemployment benefit is going to make a worker lazy and government dependent. These are not the people I know. These are people who get up and work hard every darn day. And if they get an extra helping hand out of this, so be it. We're trying to deal with a health crisis and help these families get through it. That's where we started on this side of the aisle. We may talk about something in the future and approach it a little differently, but I don't think it makes him lazy to receive the president's cash payment or to receive an extra payment from this unemployment benefit. So with respect, the senator from Illinois is suggesting this is somehow some negative moral judgment that it makes them lazy. I'm, it's exactly the contrary. I'm saying people behave according to rational incentives. We don't want to... Look, our, our girls are... are, are, are 11 and 8 at home. We have incentives all the time. Positive incentives, negative incentives. Incentives work. We don't want to create a system where someone being perfectly rational and reasonable says, well, gosh, I can make a lot more money for my family staying home than I can going to work. If I go to work, my family makes less money. That's not a question of being lazy. That's a question of the government is putting me in a position where if I want to care for my kids, I can do a better job of that by staying home. That is really foolish, and that unfortunately is the position right now of, of, of what I expect to be the Democratic senators who will vote no on this. That is a bad policy for workers, it's a bad policy for small businesses, it's a bad policy for the economy. We should support jobs, not paying people not to work. Give them a safety net, yes. Give them relief, yes. But don't create incentives that make the problem worse and that's what this democratic policy will do. I yield the floor. Senator, the senator from Delaware uh, spoke first. Thank you. And is recognized. Thanks, thanks very much. 
I'll go. To, uh, to my, uh, my colleagues, I think uh, Senator from Nebraska and South Carolina know that uh, I have great uh, affection and respect for them and have from the day they got here. Um, I uh, used to be state treasurer. I was uh, elected at the tender age of 29. And uh, Delaware had the worst credit rating in the country. We were dead last. And we couldn't balance our budgets to save our souls. And uh, we had pretty much no money in our unemployment insurance fund. Over time, uh, we straightened out our finances, had elected a guy named Pete Dupont as our governor. Uh, I was treasurer for a while and had a Democratic uh, and a Republican legislature split. And uh, we learned how to work together, something we call the Delaware Way. And uh, the, uh, what uh, I, I, later on, I, as a, I get to be governor, succeeded not Pete Dupont, but Mike Castle, who was his successor. But I, I was very active in the National Governors Association. They even let me be chairman for a while. I was the lead Democratic governor on welfare reform when I was uh, a member of the National Governors Association. I was raised in a coal mining town in West Virginia. We, uh, parents, not much money, deep faith, hard work. And my dad used to say to my sister and me, I don't care if you have to work three jobs to pay your bills, work three jobs. That's really the way I was raised. And I suspect that most of, most of us here were raised that way. Strong work ethic. When I was uh, involved as the lead Democratic governor on welfare reform, I, I, used, I used to say, people ought to be better off uh, working than they are on welfare. Bill Clinton said that often. I really believe that. And the, the thing that was wrong with welfare, our welfare system, was people were actually better off staying home than they were working. It's sort of kind of the same principle we're talking about here. The, uh, every state has its own unemployment insurance fund. We have one in Delaware, we have one in Nebraska, one in Texas, one in Illinois. They're different. And uh, different benefits are calculated in different states. And uh, in Delaware, the, uh, I, just, I just got off the phone, uh, colleagues, with a fellow named Saran Cade, used to be a member of my team when I was uh, earlier in my time in the Senate, and he's now Secretary of Labor. And I, I said, Saran, what, I said, Mr. Secretary, um, uh, what do we pay people in Delaware on unemployment insurance? Like, what is the replacement rate? And he says it's uh, somewhere between 25 and, and 50 percent of what people were, were earning. And, uh, but he said there's a $400 cap uh, per month, or excuse me, per week. There's a $400 cap per week on the benefits that we will pay anybody, regardless of what they were making. $400 a week. And if you think about it, $400 a week for four weeks is like $1,600 a month. Add to that the $600 benefit, and we're talking about $2,200 per month. If somebody's working full time, yeah, excuse me, yeah, there you go. Uh, if, if you, but if you add the numbers, if you add the numbers, I'm not sure we end up with 24. $24 per hour in Delaware. They, they, uh, they, uh, it might be the case, but I would have to, to see those numbers. Um, my Secretary of Labor said he thought that the, the number that we're looking at here was uh, something like $13 an hour in Delaware when you add it all in, as opposed to 24. So we'll go back to, we'll go back and, and do the our math. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah. How happy to you. Yeah. Uh, so just, I, I don't think any of us think that a math debate is the most productive way to spend our time in the Senate, but just so we are all talking on the same song sheet, $400 a week, add $600 is $1,000 a week, divided by a 40-hour week, that's $25 an hour. I don't know how you explain that to people who are making 15, 16 bucks an hour in Delaware, that you're now going to pay them $25 if they become uninsured. And the senator from Illinois said, this is a program only for people who are involuntarily separated. If that's the way the program worked, it would be great. But anybody who's ever spent any time with unemployment insurance programs in your states knows that's not how it works. How it actually works is once you create a disincentive to work, employers regularly work with employees to say, I kind of would like to drive you off the system, and I think you should recognize that this would be better for you, too, if you can casualize it. That's actually what happens. And so I'll, I'll give the floor back to the, uh, thank the you, gentleman. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we'll go back and I'll re-engage with our, our Secretary of Labor and make sure we have our math right. Now, the other point that he made was, uh, I asked him, how hard would it be to administer? Is it something we could stand up in, in a couple of weeks or we're talking about months or, or what? He said this would not be an easy uh, thing administratively to do. And, uh, and the time when we're anxious to get the benefit out the door in a hurry, uh, this would not be easy. And I would just ask us to keep uh, that in mind. One, one of the people I talked to last week when I was trying to figure out uh, really the, what kind of big packages, legislative package number three should be, Leon Panetta was one of the people I talked to. And uh, he told me about the three T's, uh, timely, targeted, and uh, temporary. Those are the three that, uh, that, that, that he talked about. And uh, timely means like making sure we figure, calculate the right benefit, but we're able to turn around and pay it in a timely way. And what I gathered from my Secretary of Labor is we're not going to be able to incorporate what they're doing at the state level, you know, feed into that the, uh, the state, the federal benefit, and do it in a timely way. I think if we could do that, uh, you'd have a, a, a probably a fair amount of bipartisan support. But it's that delay, and we just don't know how long that delay would be. The, uh, this is a... Uh, uh, Ted Kennedy used to sit behind me when I first came to the Senate. And uh, I, I, I was new in the Senate. I, I knew some senators, like Dick Durbin, we and I had served in the House together, and other people who had been governors together. I didn't know Ted Kennedy. And he said, uh, one day, I, I said to him, I said, I'm new, new here in the Senate. I don't really know you very well. And what I was doing was going to meet with, um, have a cup of coffee with the senators I didn't know well. And I asked if I could maybe have a cup of coffee with him. He said, we'll do better than that. We'll come to my hideaway and we'll have lunch together. I said, that's great. I didn't think we ever would, but it was a nice offer, a nice idea. Two weeks later, we had lunch together. And his hideaway was like a Kennedy Museum. Some of you have been there before. It's an amazing place. And I remember I asked him, I said, how is it that uh, so many Republicans here want you, Ted Kennedy, the most liberal Democrat maybe we had at the time, how many, they want you to be their, their lead co-sponsor on um, their bills. Why is that? And he said, I'm always willing to compromise on policy, never willing to compromise on principle. I think that the policy here is that when people are unemployed and they need help, we want to help them, we help, help them in a, in a timely way. Would the senator I, yield for a let question? Let me just, just, just finish my, my thought and I'd be happy to. But uh, in a timely way. And the, uh, I'm just uh, concerned Second, second concern, uh, that, uh, along with my first concern. I'm just concerned that the idea to, to deal with this in a timely way is going to be uh, diminished, uh, maybe significantly. We just honestly don't know. Uh, I'm happy to yield. Uh, a, a question for the senator. Uh, you said that you were concerned about implementation, that it may not be timely at the state level to implement this. Uh, I think just prior to when you came to the floor, uh, I suggested a possible amendment to the senator from Nebraska's amendment that would add a qualifier something like to the best extent practicable. So it doesn't slow the program down, but it acknowledges that both the Department of Labor and the states should endeavor to implement this in a way that ensures people don't get paid more not to work than to work. And so it, it puts a qualifier. Now you just suggested there might be bipartisan agreement with the senator from Delaware uh, be be a, a, amenable to such a change. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to discuss that with you online and try to better understand what you offered. I wasn't here when, when you spoke. Yeah, thank you. And I, I yield the floor. Senator from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, for over 200 years, the American people have shown resilience in the face of great challenges, from civil wars, international conflicts, and yes, pandemics. We have faced these challenges united, and with resolve. And like the challenges of the past, the novel coronavirus pandemic is a crisis that together we can and we will overcome. As the cases of COVID-19 increase each day, my top priority is protecting the health and the safety of Michiganders and people all across this nation. There's no doubt we're facing an unprecedented public health emergency and an economic crisis at the same time. Families in my state of Michigan and Americans all across this country are worried about their health and their safety and whether or not they're going to be able to make ends meet during this emergency. We must act quickly 
to provide relief for struggling families and small businesses and health care providers. And even as we move with the urgency that this difficult time demands, we must ensure that this bill is done right and that we're getting the right help to the people who need it the most. We must act aggressively, and now we must do everything to provide relief to workers and families in Michigan and across the country. Americans are facing an unprecedented personal, health, and financial challenge. Workers in my home state of Michigan who are forced to stay home from work due to coronavirus shouldn't need to worry about whether or not they can pay their bills or put food on their table. That's why I authored legislation that's included in this package before the Senate to expand unemployment assistance. We've never had unemployment benefits in response to a public health crisis, but we have never seen an emergency on the scale of what we are seeing right now. We must support workers who are not receiving a paycheck or have been laid off due to coronavirus. That's why I fought to create an unemployment compensation program to provide federally funded benefits to people who are unable to work during this pandemic. It would expand unemployment benefits to workers who have exhausted their state unemployment benefits. And it would make unemployment benefits available to people who don't usually qualify, including small business owners, freelance writers and workers, independent contractors, seasonal workers, and people who have recently started or were about to start a new job. And it provides workers with extended unemployment insurance so that hardworking families can have some certainty that they can stay afloat financially during this crisis that is likely to last a while. Our small businesses have been hit especially hard, and some are at risk of having to close their doors or lay off their employees. Our small businesses are the backbone of our economy, and they need support now more than ever. That's why I worked with my colleagues on the Small Business Committee to craft legislation to expand funding available for small business loans. And as a result of those efforts, this package now increases the funding for the popular and successful 7A small business loans to $350 billion. I also pressed for additional funding, $240 million for small business development centers and women's business centers that increase the funding for minority business centers as well. These funds will go a long way towards helping small businesses pay their rent and keep their lights on. This le legislation also includes significantly more funding that will go to our hospitals and health care system. This funding will ensure that our overstretched hospitals can make up for lost revenue keep their doors open, and make payroll for the dedicated nurses, doctors, and healthcare professionals who are on the front lines fighting day in and day out to stop this pandemic. I've been working closely with the hospitals and healthcare providers in Michigan, and they cannot stress how critical this funding is to their ability to continue providing the care and comfort during this pandemic. I will keep fighting to ensure that they have the resources, the supplies, the gloves, the mask, and the medical equipment that they need to protect themselves and their patients from coronavirus. Finally, as the ranking member of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, I work closely with Chairman Ron Johnson to ensure that this legislation has strong oversight provisions in place. We must ensure that the funds we are authorizing are going to the people, the small businesses, and the health care providers who need them the most. Our oversight provision creates a Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, a, a board that is made up of agency watchdogs who will be charged with auditing and investigating the administration's coronavirus response efforts and how Americans' hard-earned tax dollars are being used to address this serious crisis. We are also requiring the Government Accountability Office to audit where these funds are going and keep Congress and the American people up to date through real-time, publicly available reports. This model was used to successfully track spending from the 2009 Recovery Act during the Great Recession. And I was proud to work with my Republican chairman to get this important accountability measure included in this bill. This bill is an important step forward to addressing this crisis head-on and ensure our nation can get back on track once we have address the serious public health threat and the resulting economic crisis as well. It's an important step, but it's not the last action we'll need to take before this pandemic is over. 
I'm going to do everything possible to continue working with my colleagues in a bipartisan manner to ensure Michigan communities and families have the resources and the support that they desperately need. I will also continue working closely with Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, local leaders, public health experts, and national security officials. It will continue to take each and every one of us doing our part and working together to prevent the spread of this pandemic, protect public health, and continue to address this economic crisis. But together, Mr. President, I know that we will get through this, and we will come out stronger on the other side. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Vermont. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, let me be very honest and tell you that there is much in this bill, and we have not yet seen the printout yet, uh, that I am concerned about. I am especially concerned uh, that the administration will be able to expend $500 billion uh, in virtually any way they want, any corporation they want, uh, with virtually no strings attached. Uh, the American people, at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, do not want more corporate welfare. Uh, and they do not want policies which will allow corporations, in some cases, to receive loans or grants and then do stock buybacks to enrich their stockholders, uh, provide dividends, or, or maybe raise the compensation benefits of their already wealthy CEOs. What the American people want right now is to us, for us to use our taxpayer dollar in every way that we can to protect the working families of this country, to protect the middle class, to protect the 50 percent of our people who are living paycheck to paycheck. And as we speak tonight, half of our people in this country, in the richest country in the history of the world, are living paycheck to paycheck. And they wake up in the morning and they're saying, you know what, I can barely make it on the paycheck that I got because I'm making 12, 13, 14 bucks an hour. And now that paycheck has stopped. How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to put food on the table for my kids? How am I going to make sure that the lights remain on? How am I going to pay my student debt? How am I going to pay my credit card debt? Somebody in the family gets sick. How am I going to pay that? Now, this bill uh, has been worked on extensively in the last few days. There are elements in it that, in my view, are positive, don't go far enough by any means. Uh, but one of the things this bill does do is provide the largest expansion of unemployment benefits in history, expending about $250 billion of federal funds. And what it does, importantly, the bill understands that for all kinds of absurd reasons, having to do with Republican attacks on workers for many years, fewer than 50 percent of American workers today are eligible for unemployment benefits. What this bill does is says, rightly so, that in the midst of this terrible economic crisis where some people, nobody knows, where some economists are estimating that by June, the end of next quarter, unemployment could be 20 or 30 percent, what this bill does say is that whether or not you are eligible for unemployment today, you're going to get unemployment compensation. And that means many of the gig workers, people who drive Uber cars, many of the waitresses and waiters who make starvation minimum wages, many so-called independent contractors, they will be eligible for the extended unemployment benefit. And that is exactly the right thing. And the other thing that this bill does, which is right, is it says, okay, we are in the midst of a horrific crisis, unprecedented in modern American history. So not only are you going to get your regular unemployment benefits, we're going to add another $600 a week to it. And now I find that some of my Republican colleagues are very distressed. They're very upset that somebody who's making 10, 12 bucks an hour might end up with a paycheck for four months more than they received last week. Oh, my God, the universe is collapsing. 
Imagine that. Somebody who's making 12 bucks an hour, now like the rest of us, faces an unprecedented economic crisis with the 600 bucks on top of their normal, their regular unemployment check, might be making a few bucks more for four months. Oh my word, will the universe survive? How absurd and wrong is that? What kind of value system is that? Meanwhile, these very same folks had no problem a couple of years ago voting for a trillion dollars in tax breaks for billionaires and large profitable corporations. Not a problem. But when it comes to low-income workers in the midst of a terrible crisis, maybe some of them earning or having more money than they previously made. Oh my word, we gotta strip that out. We gotta, we gotta tell those poor people that no matter what, and by the way, when this bill, when the McConnell bill first came up, unbelievably, and I know many Republicans objected to this, they were saying that, well, we wanna give a, whatever it was, a thousand or 1200 bucks, but poor people should get less. You see, because poor people are down here, they don't deserve, they don't eat, they don't pay rent, they don't go to the doctor, they're somehow inferior because they're poor, we're gonna give them less. Well, that was addressed. Now everybody is gonna get the $1,200, but some of my Republican friends still have not given up on the need to punish the poor and working people. You haven't raised the minimum wage in 10 years. Minimum wage should be at least 15 bucks an hour. You haven't done that. You've cut program after program after program, and now horror of horrors, for four months, workers might be earning a few bucks more than they otherwise went. Well, needless to say, this is an amendment that is coming up. I don't think it's gonna go very far. And if it does go far, I will introduce an amendment to deal with the corporate welfare, the $500 billion in corporate welfare, which is, to me, a very serious problem, but I do not think they're going to get the 60 votes, and that will be the end of it. Mr. President, this bill uh, also includes uh, some $250 billion in one-time checks of $1,200 for adults and $500 for kids. Now, I have a couple of concerns there. Number one, I have believed that in the midst of this unprecedented crisis, uh, that we should make this a monthly benefit, not a one-time benefit. And depending on what happens, and I expect very much that this Congress will be reconvening because I think this coronavirus three, the bill we're on right now, is gonna be uh, superseded by a coronavirus four. Because my strong guess is this does not go far enough. But the bill does include uh, a $1,200 check for adults, $500 for kids that will help in the short term. We've gotta do a lot better than that. Uh, as many of you know, uh, in countries around the world, UK, uh, Denmark, other countries, the approach that they are taking, which makes sense to me, is to basically say to employers, if you keep your workers on the job, even if they're not working right now, we will pay, in the UK case, 80% of their uh, salary, other countries a bit higher. I think that is the direction we should have gone. This is a little, little bit more convoluted. Uh, but what we do do here is give $367 billion in loans to small businesses, and those loans could be forgiven if those small businesses don't lay off workers. And I think for a variety of reasons that is exactly uh, the right thing to do. The goal right now is to stabilize the economy by telling workers that they will have their jobs when they come back, when this thing is over, and that in the meantime, they will have all or most of their income. That is my preferred uh, approach. Uh, this bill provides $150 billion to states and cities. And I can tell you that in Vermont, and I'm sure in every other state in this country, uh, states and cities are hurting because we all know there has been a major decline in tax revenue. And that is uh, an important thing to do because, by the way, in the midst of this crisis, a lot of the responsibility is going to fall on local and state government. And one of the concerns of many that I have about this bill is that in the best of times, this bill requires an enormous amount of work by the federal, state, and local governments. How do you get all these unemployment checks out? 
How do you deal with all of these small businesses who may apply for these loans? This is hard stuff, and it becomes even more difficult when so many workers who work for local and state government are not coming into work because of the coronavirus. And one of the issues that we are going to have to focus on big time is the implementation. If anyone thinks just passing this bill, tomorrow everything is going to flow smoothly, you are terribly mistaken. This is a complicated, multifaceted bill, uh, and it is going to take an enormous amount of work to make sure that the money goes where it should go uh, in a cost-effective uh, way. Uh, this bill does a lot of other things as well that I think will help the American economy. So uh, to conclude, Mr. President, uh, this is not the bill that I would have written. Frankly, I don't think it's the bill that most Americans would have written. I think most Americans are very, very apprehensive that one quarter of this bill is going to go to large corporations with very little accountability. And in a political season, let me make the radical suggestion that we have a President of the United States who may end up targeting some of this money to states that he needs to win. So uh, this bill has some good things and has some issues of real concern. But one thing we must not do is to punish low-income workers who might get a few bucks more uh, than they previously earned. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Nebraska. Uh, I've just listened to the Senator from Vermont speech, and uh, there's obviously a lot we don't agree on in life and policy, politics, and economics. Um, he caricatured the entire purpose of this amendment tonight. The purpose of this amendment tonight is to affirm work um, under his vision. I don't know exactly where he thinks uh, the workers who who stock shelves and drive trucks right now would come from, uh, because he made an argument about government subsidies that would be on a permanent basis higher than the wages of all those jobs. So I don't understand how his economic system would ever actually work, but I'd actually like to just praise him here. Um, two things. One, he said something that the politicians usually don't say. Usually when people are going to vote for something, they say the bill's salvific and utopian and going to do everything right. Uh, and if they're going to vote against something, they say it's the worst thing that's ever been written. And Bernie, Senator Sanders uh, just said that this bill has a lot in it. It's big. It's clunky. We're in the middle of a national emergency, and there's some good and there's some bad in it, and he's going to vote for it. Uh, I also believe this bill is big and clunky and stinky. There's a lot that's broken in it. There's some that's good and urgent and necessary and important, and there's a lot that's bad and poorly thought out and not going to be implemented very effectively. And on that, I'm also inclined to vote for it. So um, I appreciate his candor in admitting that this is kind of a big crap sandwich. Um, but in addition, uh, I want to praise the senator from Vermont for uh, his candor in saying something that I totally oppose, but I appreciate his integrity and honesty in admitting it. He said, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, sir, please, uh, he said he wishes the $1,200 monthly payment would be made, or the $1,200 emergency payment would be made monthly and permanent. Is that right? No, not permanent, but during the crisis, yes. Okay, uh, that, that's helpful clarification. I, you, were, you were saying a lot of different things, and I thought you were arguing for a, a, a UBI of, of 14 grand. So I, I just wanted to clarify that point, but I appreciate the fact that you, uh, you believe a lot of things very differently, and the senator believes, speaking in the third person, uh, a lot of things very differently than I do, but he argues forcefully for his positions. Uh, and I think that this, this body would benefit from more people uh, who spoke as bluntly and directly as the senator from Vermont. I hope his positions are voted down again and again and again and again, uh, but I appreciate the way he argues for his positions. Thank you, Mr. President.
Senator from Oregon. Mr. President, several senators on the other side have been arguing against the provision in this bill to supercharge unemployment insurance right now, something that Senate Democrats have negotiated with the Trump administration, Secretary Mnuchin, and Chairman Grassley. Based on what I'm hearing from senators on the other side, you'd think that this provision was pretty much going to end Western civilization. Now, supercharging unemployment benefits has long been a priority for Senate Democrats, and we've been fighting for those improvements in unemployment since the process began. In our view, it's the key to getting help to where... Senator from Oregon? Yes. Would you please use your microphone? Thank the President. Certainly. Supercharging unemployment benefits has long been something Senate Democrats have been fighting for. It's the key to getting help where it's needed most. And believe me, colleagues, when you see the unemployment claim numbers tomorrow, if the numbers are accurate, this chamber is going to see that the unemployment crisis is exploding in America. I don't believe anybody in our great country should fall into destitution as a result of this pandemic. So I obviously disagree with my colleagues who oppose our amendment so strongly to improve unemployment benefits. I just want to make a few key points in response to their argument. First, I want to start with an argument I heard that just about knocked the wind out of me when I heard it earlier. It's the idea that nurses are going to quit their jobs as a result of this legislation. Mr. President, nurses are not going to be quitting their jobs to get unemployment benefits because that's not how nurses think when they get up in the morning. By now, everyone has seen the Herculean efforts of our nurses fighting the pandemic. Nurses in America are brave. They care. They're the true professionals. From Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine, they're on the front lines of this fight, putting themselves in harm's way to save the lives of our neighbors, whether it's in South Carolina, Oregon, or anywhere else. They don't cut and run. In contrary to the suggestion of my colleague from Nebraska, retired nurses have been coming out of retirement in droves to help treat patients who are suffering because of the coronavirus. Second, it's a head scratcher to me that my colleague from Nebraska is raising this objection now. I'm the ranking Democrat in the Finance Committee. I learned about his objection when I watched his press conference, and then I called him about it. The proposal's been out there for days. Senators have known about it the whole time. It's not a drafting error. It's not a last-minute surprise. What the senator from Nebraska wants to do in effect, drop now was part of the bill. And Mr. President, you're a member of our committee, and I enjoy working with you. What the senator from Nebraska wants to drop now, in fact, was part of the bill that Republican Leader McConnell introduced on Saturday. He introduced it on Saturday because Senate Democrats insisted on it being part of the package. And as Secretary Mnuchin said this afternoon on national television, we all heard it, Republicans agreed. I'll have a little more to say about Secretary Mnuchin's remarks in a minute. Third, I want to talk about why this is so needed. 
why my Democratic colleagues and I have worked so hard to help the millions hit by this economic wrecking ball get through these horrendous times. For most Americans, the old unemployment rules would cover only a third to a half of their lost wages. That's it. Pretty hard to pay the rent, put food on the table with that. Even before this crisis, even before the crisis, Mr. President, the Federal Reserve found that nearly half of Americans wouldn't have been able to come up with $400 cash to cover costs in, emergen in an emergency. So let's face it, millions of Americans were walking on an economic tightrope, balancing their rent against their food and the food against the fuel, and that was before the pandemic. That's why we on our side feel so strongly, so appreciative of the work of Senator Peters, Senator Menendez, who helped in the negotiations, and of course, the leader. We all said we need an improved supercharged unemployment benefit to replace people's lost wages. Those are people who shouldn't face a choice between homelessness, hunger, or bankruptcy because a virus has shut down our economy and cost them their job. This isn't the fault of any workers in South Carolina or Oregon or anywhere else. And while the consumer economy is shuttered, the Congress has a responsibility to make sure that Americans can bounce back in a matter of weeks or months. Otherwise, millions are going to struggle slowly to recover from the economic crisis, and many might not make it if the Senate doesn't move to help them now, now, now. The panic people feel over the virus is already too much, and the least we can do as lawmakers is to have their backs when it comes to surviving this economic crisis. Now, all my colleagues know we're on the third bill in the fight against the virus. Mitch McConnell's first version of this bill did virtually nothing for those who are losing their jobs. I read it carefully out of 247 pages in the Republican leader's first bill. Eight lines of text, not eight pages, eight lines, and those eight lines only dealt with filing for unemployment online. Now, that bill had an awful lot of corporate goodies, lots of slush funds for big corporations but just a few measly lines for people hurting, for workers hurting, workers losing their jobs. Senate Democrats fought for and won changes that make up this robust, expanded, supercharged program of unemployment insurance. It's based on a bill that our colleague Senator Peters and I introduced not long ago. First, in these punishing economic times, Americans are going to need more weeks of coverage than they would otherwise get from unemployment insurance. The existing length of unemployment benefits will not cover the time this crisis will last. Second, the Senate needed to modernize the unemployment insurance program because it really hasn't changed much since it was developed in Wisconsin in 1932. Mr. President, 1932, nobody was talking about gig workers. And that unemployment program that was invented then hadn't changed all that much. Certainly hasn't been built to take on the kind of challenge our country faces right now. Democratic senators and I looked at that system and said this old system wouldn't be good enough for independent contractors, the self-employed, gig workers, part-time workers, and freelancers. They're a big part of the face of the modern economy. They weren't the kind of workers anybody was thinking about in 1932 when the program was invented. Senate Democrats led the effort 
to get those people coverage. And I'm glad that at one point in the negotiations, we could get bipartisan support for it. For people who still have their jobs but have their hours uh, slashed, we're going to bat for them. For people in the service economy, restaurants, salons, gyms, you name it. All those people who are suffering because their jobs and their businesses have put, been put on pause, we're going to bat for them. We're talking about millions and millions of Americans, people who are looking at hard times ahead, and they need our help now. The old unemployment insurance system wasn't working, so Senate Democrats, Senate Democrats said, we're going to come together and we're going to go to bat for all those independent contractors and the self-employed and the freelancers and the gig workers. And now I think not only are we going to help them over the next four months, but I think we have developed some ideas that can be part of reforming the unemployment compensation system after those four months. Now, I want to turn to why this agreement raises benefits specifically by $600 per month. I've heard my colleagues and their strenuous objections to that amount. The reason it is $600, Mr. President, is because Labor Secretary Scalia, after meeting with the Senate negotiators, myself, Senator Grassley, a Secretary Mnuchin, Senator Menendez, Senator Portman, big group of us. Secretary Scalia, after meeting with Senator negotiators, left us with no other way to get benefits to workers quickly. Secretary Scalia said that the states had no other way to get the benefits to workers in time. We needed a simple solution. And I know my colleague, the distinguished president of the Senate, and others who are sponsoring this proposal to unravel what Senate Democrats did with Secretary Mnuchin, the Trump administration, and Chairman Grassley may not believe me, but uh, I want to share the words of Secretary Mnuchin himself, and specifically on this question of why we were focused on making sure that workers could get that extra $600 a week. Just today, Secretary Mnuchin said, and I'm going to quote here, most of these state systems have technology that's 30 years old or older. If we had the ability to customize this with much more specifics, we would have. This was the only way we could ensure states could get the money out quickly and in a fair way, so we used $600 across the board. I don't think it will create incentives. Most Americans want what they want. They want to keep their jobs. That is what Secretary Mnuchin said today in defending the language that is in the bill as, in effect, the fastest, simplest way for workers to get their benefits and why we disagree so strongly with the amendment from the senator from Nebraska to unravel that approach. The math shows that a standard payment of $600 is the simplest way to get to full wage replacement without causing, as of now, an administrative train wreck. So I'm going to close on this. I'm sure that everybody here read that unemployment claims are expected to go up by $2.5 million in one week when the statistics are released tomorrow. Let me say that again, $2.5 million. That's almost as many jobs that were lost in the entire year of 2008 when the Great Recession hit our country so hard. It's the single largest rise in unemployment 
since that figure began to be tracked. 12 entire months worth of Great Recession job losses, that's how many unemployment claims economists expect to see in a single week. This country has never faced anything like it. It's not a normal recession. This isn't a normal bill to try to stimulate the economy in which the government tries to give the economy a shot of fiscal adrenaline. This is a time when we face a shutdown of entire sectors of our economy. What the Congress needs to do is keep our economy alive and act now. We're not going to do that by shortchanging workers who are losing jobs, losing hours, or losing gigs. I feel so strongly Americans want to work. Businesses want to keep their employees on the job. Americans want the economy to spring back to life once the pandemic is under control. And that's what supercharging unemployment benefits is all about. So here's the bottom line on the provision that Senate Democrats agreed with the Trump administration, Secretary Mnuchin, and Chairman Grassley on. Our proposal was not a drafting error. It didn't pop out at the last minute. It's not going to bring about the end of Western civilization. I hope my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will review what Secretary Mnuchin had to say this afternoon on national television, supporting what Democrats, Senate Democrats, negotiated with him and the administration, and join us in making sure millions and millions of Americans don't fall into destitution. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Vermont. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I don't wish to delay things, but I just want to make a couple comments. I did speak earlier this afternoon about this. Uh, it's almost a, an understatement to say, to say that America is at inflection point. We're facing a public health crisis unlike any we've seen in generation. Governments at every level, state, local, county, are racing to respond, react, and mitigate the crisis. Hospital systems are soon going to be overrun if they've not already been. The package here is a good one. Does it do everything? No. Is it perfect? No. But is it a lot better where we were? Yes. I think of the Senate as a body that should be the conscience of the nation. And it's time for us to have reality Trump rhetoric. The, we've had enough rhetoric. Let's have something to pass that speaks to reality. The, I think of our own governor, Republican governor, who has worked so hard to help our state. This will give him some tools, as will as it will to our Speaker of the House and our President Pro Tem of our legislature. But with this bill, we support the victims of this terrible virus, the health care providers and first responders on the front lines tending to their care, the essential workers that are keeping our stores shelves stocked, necessities available, the families hit by the fallout from this pandemic. I have been fortunate, been married now for almost 58 years to the best medical surgical nurse I've ever known. I hear her tell what it is Marcel tells me what the doctors and nurses face in a situation like this. 
Mr. President, I pray that neither you nor I nor any other member of this body would have to face what they face on the front lines. We should go forward and pass this bill. I'd ask that my full statement be included in the record. Without objection. I yield the floor. I suggest the absence of a court. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Mr. President. Senator from Maine. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that proceedings under the call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, I see that the Senator from Maryland is on the floor, and I think he arrived a minute or two before me, so if he'd like to go first, I would want to give him that opportunity. I'm grateful. Thank you, Senator from Maine, but I'm happy to have you go first. Thank you. Mr. President, all across the country, Americans are stepping up in response to the coronavirus pandemic sweeping our nation. Doctors and nurses are working endless hours and putting themselves at risk to care for the surge in patients. Manufacturers, including many companies in my state, are working overtime and retooling their product lines to produce medical testing swabs, ventilators, and personal protective equipment, 
all of which are vitally needed. Truckers are going above and beyond, missing time with their families so that they can deliver goods needed to restock depleted grocery sh shelves. People are looking out for their neighbors in a safe way. They're checking on them. They're making personal sacrifices to help prevent the virus from spreading to the most vulnerable members of our society. Help is on the horizon for small businesses and their employees who are facing economic devastation through no fault of their own. Mr. President, I have talked to small business owners all across our state including small mom-and-pop operations like a third-generation diner operated and owned by the Simonis family in Lewiston, Maine. For the first time ever in three generations, they have had to close their doors. They've had no choice. As Linda Simonis told me in tears earlier this week, We've never been unemployed. Our son is unemployed. Our friends who have worked with us for, at this diner for years are unemployed. Mr. President, the agreement finally reached today includes a $377 billion small business economic relief plan that Senator Rubio, Senator Cardin, Senator Shaheen, and I authored as members of the Small Business Task Force. It is intended to help workers and small businesses just like the one owned by the Simonis family in Lewiston. And our group work day and night to get this bipartisan package included in the broader legislation. And I want to do a shout out to our staff because I don't think they've been to bed before 4 a.m. in the morning in any day in the last week. That's how hard they've worked too. Under our bipartisan approach, small businesses would be eligible for a 100% federally guaranteed emergency loan to cover eight weeks of payroll, as well as certain expenses like rent or mortgage payments and utilities. If these businesses keep their employees on the payroll, in other words, if they keep issuing those paychecks, their loans would be completely forgiven. Here's how it would work. Small employers with 500 employees or fewer would be eligible to apply for these federally guaranteed loans. The loans would be available immediately through existing Small Business Administration certified lenders, including certain banks, credit unions, and other financial institutions. And a streamlined process would be created to bring other additional lenders into the program. The size of the loans would be tied to a formula based on the small business's average monthly payroll, and that would go back to February 15th, since that's when the coronavirus really started to come to our country and have an impact. The maximum loan amount would be $10 million. So as long as these small businesses retain their employees and issue those paychecks, which keep in mind also means in many cases that those employees will get their health insurance as well. The portion of the loan used to cover payroll and mortgage interest, rent and utility patients would also be forgiven. Furthermore, and this is important to states like those of the presiding officer and mine, which have large numbers of tourists coming each year, 
employers with tipped employees would receive forgiveness for the additional wages paid to such employees. In addition, I want to point out that workers who have already lost their jobs due to this crisis can be rehired and paid under our program, and that should be our goal. Mr. President, this vital assistance cannot come a moment too soon. There are so many small businesses that have already shut down or are on the verge of doing so. They are trying to hang on just a little longer to avoid laying off their employees who are like members of their own family. In fact, in many cases, they are members of their own family. Without this package, we face an unemployment tsunami that could reach as high as 20 percent, according to the Secretary of the Treasury. Not only would this cause tremendous harm to millions of families, but it would also take a massive toll on the federal budget, far exceeding the $377 billion that we're using for this small business assistance program to keep workers paid and employed. What we want is to make sure those small businesses survive, that they're here when we've transcended this crisis and that their employees are still able to come back to work for them. We don't want to break that link, that connection. We don't want those small businesses to give up and shutter their doors forever, decimating our downtowns and causing permanent job loss for the workers that are so much a part of their business. Now, larger businesses that are facing cash flow issues would be eligible for certain loans so that they can avoid laying off their workers. However, unlike the small business assistance programs, which would have their loans forgiven as long as they keep their workers employed, the larger businesses would be required to repay these loans in full. And I want to make clear that these large businesses would be barred from stock buybacks and increasing executive pay for the duration of the loan. And I fully support those restrictions. Of course, many of those small businesses don't have shareholders, so the idea of a stock buyback uh, doesn't exist. Now, some of them, subchapter S may, uh, but many of them do not. I'm also pleased to say that we would cover the sole proprietor, the independent contractor, those many individuals who we rely upon to make our economy work. Mr. President, Following my advocacy, along with members uh, from other coastal states, I'm also pleased that the bill includes $300 million to assist workers and businesses in our nation's fisheries, which support thousands of jobs in the great state of Maine. With this legislation, harvesters, fishing communities, aquaculture operations, and other fishery-related businesses will be eligible for this $300 million in assistance, which may include some direct relief payments. This helps protect our food supply chains, and this targeted release, relief will help ensure that the families and the coastal communities that depend on our fisheries can emerge from this crisis. Similar assistance is provided to our farmers as well. Mr. President, this bill also provides more than $30 billion for states, school districts, colleges, and universities to help them meet the unexpected expenses that have flowed from the coronavirus crisis. Our schools, our K-12 schools, 
will have access to $13.5 billion, which will help them support remote learning and meeting the needs of their students. And I want to take a moment to recognize the dedication of those teachers, administrators, school food service workers, and bus drivers who are not only making sure that students have access to remote learning, but are making sure that students have access to meals off-site. This bill provides funding to help them provide those meals in creative, but unfortunately, more costly ways, such as delivering prepackaged meals along bus routes or directly to students in their homes so that they won't be hungry. We all know how important the school breakfast and school lunch programs are to our low-income families. When colleges and universities made the very tough decision to send students home for the semester, I spoke with several presidents in Maine, and they told me about the steps they were taking to make sure that their students could still receive a quality education, albeit online or remotely. They were also taking steps, as well they should, to reimburse students and their families for room and board. And they've shortened travel study programs. They're investing in the software and hardware infrastructures to bring classes online quickly. They're doing even more than that, Mr. President. The University of Maine, for example, has partnered with the state to prepare its dorms and its facilities for emergency uses, if necessary. So the direct aid to colleges and universities is needed to help these institutions offset these sudden revenue losses and unexpected costs. There's also temporary flexibility applied to student aid, to student loans, that also will be very helpful. This agreement, Mr. President, is not only a lifeline for workers, small businesses, and schools. It builds on the previous two packages that Congress has passed to promote the health and safety of Americans. It makes substantial investment in our nation's health system, biomedical research, and education, including a $130 billion infusion for our hospitals and healthcare providers that are struggling to cope with this influx of patients, and it provides $20 billion for additional resources for veterans' health care. It authorizes an $11 billion catalyst toward the development of an effective vaccine and therapeutics, effective treatments for those struck by this virus. It provides a billion dollars for community services block grants to support critical social service programs for millions of low-income individuals. It gives the Centers for Disease Control additional funding to enhance its vital work. It assists communities responding to greater services with an increase of $5 billion for community development block grants. That comes from the subcommittee that I chair. It helps with transit systems. There's widespread help for those who are homeless or are among some of the Vul most vulnerable in our population. It strengthens the low-income home heating assistance program. That's something that Senator Jack Reed and I have long worked together on. We don't want families and seniors making impossible choices between heating their homes and buying food or medicine. This package also contains two additional pieces of legislation that I've introduced and championed. First, it contains provisions from the Mitigating Emergency Drug Shortages, or MEDSAC, legislation I authored that will help prevent a shortage of vital medications. I was shocked, Mr. President, to learn that 72% of the facilities that make 
vital, active pharmaceutical ingredients for our market here in America are located overseas. 13% of these facilities in China. We just can't have that, and we need far greater visibility into that supply system. It also contains a bill that I have long advocated for, the Home Health Care Plan Planning Improvement Act. It will allow nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and others to certify patients as needing home health services. Now it's just a physician that can do it. Even though a physician might not be the primary care provider, particularly in rural areas. So that will remove needless delays in getting Medicare patients the home health care that they need. That's a critical improvement at a time when our health care system is being put to the test and when people are being told they need to stay in their own homes to avoid spreading the virus. The list of benefits that will be felt in communities across the country goes on and on. Mr. President, it's imperative that we pass this bill tonight. Every day, more small businesses are forced to close their doors. Every day, Americans are losing their jobs and their income. Every day, medical professionals are increasingly overwhelmed by the exponential rise in cases. The package we are voting on to advance tonight will bolster our health care system, infuse funds into biomedical research that will ultimately produce a vaccine and effective treatments, shore up our economy and our businesses, support those who are unemployed, strengthen the link between employers and their employees, save millions of jobs of those employed by small businesses, and help prevent a devastating recession, perhaps even a depression, in this country. Let us not squander this momentum when we're so close to getting this done for the American people. I urge my colleagues to join me in passing this critical legislation. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President. The Senator from Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. As other senators have mentioned, uh, we see our fellow Americans uniting around the country to fight uh, the coronavirus, to help those in need. Most of all, we're grateful to the men and women in health care the healthcare workers on the front lines of this fight, the nurses, the doctors, all the other staff in hospitals, in community health centers, in clinics, who are putting themselves and their own health at risk to help their fellow Americans. And we in this Senate, like our fellow Americans, must come together to do the right thing for the country at this moment in time, to provide a surge of help to those on the front lines of the coronavirus fight and to help those who are suffering from the economic fallout. Workers and small businesses and mid-sized businesses and others who are absolutely getting clobbered as we all try to fight this virus together. And so Congress must unite this evening as we have on two prior occasions during this emergency. 
when we came together to pass phase one to provide emergency immediate health care support to public health entities, to provide more funds to do research on a vaccine for the coronavirus, more funds for research on antivirals to address the coronavirus. And then we passed round two, the Families First Act, where we made sure that that testing was free because we don't want any American to say, I'm not going to get tested even though I feel like I might have the symptoms. I'm not going to get tested because I can't afford it putting both themselves and others in the community at risk. So we said we've got to make sure these tests are free. And we also provided sick leave. Sick leave because we don't want anybody going to work when they feel sick and may have the virus if going to work is the only way they can put food on the table by getting a paycheck. So we said, look, stay at home and we'll provide for paid leave. Now there was a gap, a big gap in that that still needs to be addressed. But we took some important measures in phase one and phase two, and now here we are this evening on phase three, where we're not only providing additional dollars to fight the coronavirus and the health emergency, but also dealing with the economic fallout, which is growing by the day. And I'm not gonna go through all the provisions that do that, and I will say that this bill is far from perfect. This is not a bill that I would have written. I dare say it's probably not the bill that any one senator would have written. But with all its flaws, it does some very important things and things that are absolutely necessary during this national emergency. There's been a lot of talk tonight about the uninsurance compensation provision. Those are absolutely essential as a lifeline to workers who each day are losing their jobs around the country in many industries. And it is absolutely essential that in that process, people who are out of work through no fault of their own are still able to pay their bills, their rent, or their mortgage, or to keep the lights on, or for food. And that's why we're working to make sure that they have real replacement income during this four-month emergency period. And the provisions regarding small businesses and middle-sized businesses, those are very important too. I'm sure we're all hearing from folks who's or, who already had to close their doors because when there are no customers coming in the door, there are no sales, no income, and so if you're a small business, you can't make your debt payments and you can't make payroll. So this bill does have a lot of very important provisions in it with respect to small businesses, and I'm really glad that we moved with respect from small businesses to loans only, to loans that would be forgiven so long as the small businesses spent those monies to one, maintain payroll or rehire people if they've already had to let them go, and to pay essential bills. Because just adding more loans and debt onto small businesses would only be like an anchor around their necks at the end of a four month or whatever period it may be. They wouldn't be able to dig themselves out of that hole. So that was very important to have loans that will be forgiven so long as the loans are used for the intended purposes. And we also made important provisions for nonprofits who hire millions of Americans and as well for mid-sized businesses. With respect to some of the largest industries in the country that have been hard hit, it's appropriate to also give them help, but it's also important that as we do that, we safeguard the American taxpayer and the public interest. And when the proposal first arrived here in the Senate from the White House, we were looking at about a $500 billion slush fund with no strings attached. No real accountability, no real transparency, and so we've tried to tie that down so that we will have an inspector general with subpoena power so that we will ensure that there will be no stock buybacks with these emergency funds. Now, we're going to still look at the fine print, but we've come a long way from the proposed blank check to the President and the Secretary of Treasury, which was in the bill as it arrived here as proposed by the administration. 
There's another thing that's in the bill that's before us tonight that was not in the bill proposed by the administration, and that is badly needed help for states and cities and towns who are on the front lines of this battle across the country. We heard about five, six days ago from the majority leader, oh, well, let's just wait. Maybe we can do that sometime down the road. Well, we've heard from a bipartisan group of governors through the National Governors Association that they need that help now. And if I'm sure you've all been fielding calls from your elected officials, your governors and others, about how they desperately need additional help to fight this virus. And so I'm glad that this bill contains $150 billion to help those states. Now, Madam President, I, I want to raise tonight something that I discovered about this bill just a few hours ago that gives me real heartburn and actually, I believe, reflects badly on this United States Senate. Here's how we distributed the funds to the states. Each state, regardless of population, gets $1.2 billion. And then the remainder of the money, up to $150 billion, is distributed to states based on population. Now, you can question whether that's the best and most effective way to, to essentially allocate resources when you're fighting a coronavirus like this, which is more intense in some places than others. But that's not my overall point this morning, right now. Here's what we discovered that the people of the District of Columbia, the people of the nation's capital, were left out of that formula. They are fighting the coronavirus just like Americans in every other state and city. They are part of other federal formulas, for example, Title I for Education, highway funds, and other federal formula dollars go to the people of the District of Columbia. They have a population that is higher than two of the 50 states. There are more residents of the District of Columbia, the nation's capital, than the state of Wyoming and the state of Vermont. But they were left out of that category that they're usually put in. And instead, they were put into a formula with Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa, and some of the territories. And the net effect of that, the net effect of putting the people of the nation's capital in that formula versus the formula with the states will cost the District of Columbia about $700 million. And that's because that other formula is based entirely on population. And Puerto Rico has about 3 million people in it. And so when you put the District of Columbia into that funding kettle, into that funding pot, they get shortchanged $700 million. And that's the case even though the people of the District of Columbia, the people of the District of Columbia send the federal treasury more tax dollars than the people of 22 other states. Let me say that again. The people of the District of Columbia send the IRS more tax revenues than the people of 22 other states. And yet, when it came time to write the formula for distributing emergency funds under the coronavirus, they weren't part of the kind of funding formulas they normally are. Now, I asked about this because I thought maybe this would be a simple fix. I mean, surely in a bill of $2 trillion in emergency relief, we can do right by the people of the District of Columbia and not shortchange them $700 million. And the answer I got back was no. No, no, this was not a mistake. 
This was not an oversight that Republican negotiators insisted on shortchanging the people of the District of Columbia. And if I'm wrong about that, it would be a very easy fix in an amendment that could be offered by the majority leader and I'm sure accepted unanimously. Accepted unanimously except for the fact that this actually was a point that was negotiated. Now, Madam President, I'm not going to hold up a $2 trillion emergency rescue package that is urgently needed by the country for this, but I think it's shameful. I think it's shameful that in a $2 trillion emergency rescue package, we would shortchange the people right here in the nation's capital. People who we see coming into work every day. Many of the federal employees who work day in and day out for the federal government. Many of them live here, many of them live in surrounding states, many of them live all over the country. But for the people who live here, to shortchange them and to do it intentionally is really outrageous. And so here we are coming together, and that's, that's the right thing to do. As I said, this bill has many, many flaws and many, many problems. I certainly wouldn't have written it this way, and I would never have done wrong by the people of the District of Columbia the way this was intentionally done, apparently, in this bill. But overall, we need this bill for the country. We need it because we have a national emergency, both on the health care front and the economic front. So I hope going away from here as we come together, and I hope we'll do the right thing with a, with a large vote, I hope there'll be some senators, whoever were part of negotiating that deal, who said, no, we're going to shortchange the people of our nation's capital. I hope they will feel a little bit ashamed. And I think all those people who didn't want to change this provision, which is easy to change just like that, should feel ashamed. This is our nation's capital. The people who live and work here deserve to be treated by, with respect. There's no United States senator who represents the people of the District of Columbia. Some of us who live in the surrounding areas work hard to do so. I just wish senators from the rest of the country, and especially in this case, apparently, our Republican colleagues, would show a little respect for the people who live in the capital of this great country. And I yield the floor.
<clears throat> Madam President. The majority leader is recognized. I ask unanimous consent the cloture motion with respect to the motion to proceed to H.R. 748 be withdrawn. Is there objection? <clears throat> Without objection. I ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.R. 748. Further, that the only amendments in order be amendments to be offered by Senator McConnell, 1578, and Senator Sass, 1577, or their designees. Further, that the Senate vote on the Sass Amendment with a 60 vote affirmative threshold for adoption. Further, following disposition of the Sass Amendment, the McConnell Amendment as amended, if amended, be agreed to. The bill as amended be read a third time. And the Senate vote on the passage of the bill as amended with a 60 affirmative vote threshold for passage. Finally, if passed, the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table, and that all roll call votes in this series be 30 minutes in length. Is there objection? Without objection. <clears throat> the clerk will report the bill. Madam Pre Calendar number 157, H.R. 748, an act to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 and so forth. Madam President, I ask consent that I proceed under my leader time. Without objection. So here we are, colleagues, for, for the information of all of our senators. We will first vote on the adoption of the SAS Amendment at a 60-vote threshold. And then our second and final vote will be on passage of the CARES Act, also at a 60-vote threshold. We're going to pass this bipartisan relief package, send it over to the House, so they can put it on the president's desk. When the Senate adjourns this evening, our next scheduled vote will be the afternoon of Monday, April the 20th. Of course, during this unprecedented time for our country, the Senate is gonna stay nimble. <clears throat> As always, we'll convene regular pro forma sessions, and if circumstances require the Senate to return for a vote sooner than April the 20th, we will provide at least 24 hours notice. Our nation obviously is going through a kind of crisis that is totally unprecedented in living memory. Let's stay connected and continue to collaborate on the best ways to keep helping our states and our country through this pandemic. And let's continue to pray for one another for all of our families and for our country. Madam President. The minority leader is recognized. Now, Madam President, and I'll speak for a little bit briefly. The legislation now before us is historic because it is meant to match a historic crisis. Our healthcare system is not prepared to care for the sick. Our workers, You've ordered, Madam President. Our workers, our health care system is not prepared to care for the sick. Our workers are without work. Our businesses cannot do business. Our factories lie idle. The gears of the American economy have ground to a halt. Our country has faced immense challenges before, but rarely so many at the same time. Over the past few days, the Senate has stepped into the breach. We packed weeks or perhaps months of legislative process into five days. Representatives from both sides of the aisle and both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue have forged a bipartisan agreement in highly partisan times with very little time to spare. It's been a long, hard road with a remarkable number of twists and turns, but for the sake of millions of Americans, it will be worth it. It will be worth it to save millions of small businesses and tens of millions of jobs. It will be worth it to see that Americans who have lost their jobs through no fault of their own will be able to pay their rent and mortgages and put food on the table because we passed the greatest expansion of insurance to the employed to the unemployed in decades. It will be worth it to send gloves and masks to our nurses and to our doctors. 
it will be worth it to send ventilators and beds to our hospitals and begin rebuilding the public health infrastructure in America, a Marshall Plan in this new century for our medical system. It'll be worth it to save industries from the brink of collapse in order to save the jobs of hundreds of thousands of Americans in those industries. It will be worth it to put workers first. It was a long, hard road. Neither side can be completely happy with the final product, but it will be worth it. And I'm damn proud of the work we did over the past few days, because we put in the work, because we tested the limits of exhaustion, because we didn't immediately accept a bill drafted by only one party, the legislation before us tonight is better. Better for our health care system and the 65,000 Americans now afflicted with COVID-19. Better for our workers, better for our small businesses, better for our Indian tribes, better for our economy, and better for the American people. And so I must thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, especially the chairs and ranking members, and their staffs. The past few days have been filled with drama. The past few hours were no exception. I know a few of my Republican friends still harbor reservations about voting for this legislation. But when there's a crisis of this magnitude, the private sector cannot solve it. Individuals, even with bravery and valor, are not powerful enough to beat it back. Government is the only force large enough to staunch the bleeding and begin the healing. This is a time when the American people need their government. This is what we were elected for. The oath we swear to the Constitution means we must protect the general welfare of the people. So let us marshal this government into action. There are millions of Americans watching us right now at home on their televisions, separated from friends and family, fearful for their children and their livelihoods, unsure of when the time will come when all of our lives may return to normal. Let us tell them tonight that help is on the way, that they are not truly alone, that this country, that this Senate, that this government is here for them in a time of dire need. This is a strange and evil disease. There is much we still don't know about it, and it is keeping us apart. When we pass this bill, instead of hugging each other, we'll wave from a distance. None of us can know when this plague will pass. The only thing we know for sure is that we must summon the same spirit that saw previous of generations through America's darkest hours. Fellowship, sacrifice, fortitude, resilience. That is what it means to be an American. With that spirit, this nation faced down war and depression and fear itself. I have no doubt that once again, America will ultimately prevail. Yield the floor. Madam President. Majority Leader is recognized. I call up the substitute amendment 1578 and ask that it be reported by number. Without objection, the amendment will be reported by member. Senator from Kentucky, Mr. McConnell, proposes an amendment number 1578. The Senator from Nebraska is recognized. I call up amendment number 1577 and ask that it be reported by number. Without objection, the amendment will be reported by member. The Senator from Nebraska, Mr. Sass, proposes an amendment numbered 1577 to amendment numbered 1578. Questions on the Sass amendment? I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There appears, be there appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye.
Mr. Blunt. Mr. Booker. Mr. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Lankford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mrs. Leffler, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, thank you, Ms. Rosen, Ms. R Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, 
Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Barrasso, Blackburn, Blunt, Braun, Kramer, Danes, Enzi, Fisher, Hyde Smith, Inhoff, Johnson, Leffler, Manchin, McConnell, Purdue, Risch, Rubio, Sass, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, and Wicker. Senators voting in the negative. Durbin, Schatz, and Schumer. Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Tester, no. Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Lankford, aye. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mrs. Murray, no. Ms. Ernst, aye. Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Murphy, no.
Mr. Booker. No. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Merkley, no. <laughs> Mr. Young, I. Mr. Heinrich, no. <laughs> Mr. Cruz, aye. Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Rish, aye. Ms. Smith, no. Ms. Cortez Masto, no. Ms. Hassan, no. Ms. Rosen, no.
Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Tillis, aye. Thank you. Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Udall, no. Mr. King, no. Mr. Leahy, no. Ms. Harris, no. Mr. Gardner, no. Mr. Jones, no. Mrs. Feinstein, no. Ms. Warren, no. Mr. Sanders, no.
Mr. Hoven. Aye. Mr. Cardin. No. Ms. Klobuchar. No. Mr. Warner. No. Ms. Cantwell. No. Mr. Burr. Aye. Mr. Bennett, no. Ms. Stabenow, no. Mr. Reed, no. Mr. Cassidy, aye. Mr. Wyden, no. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Coons, no.
Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Kane, no. Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Carper, no. Ms. Hirono, no. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mrs. Shaheen, no. Ms. Cinema, no. Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Markey, no. Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Shelby, aye.
Mr. Menendez. No. Mr. Grassley. Aye. Mr. Brown, no. Ms. Collins, no. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or to change their vote? If not, the yeas are 48, the nays are 48. The 60 vote threshold having not been achieved, the amendment is not agreed to. Under the previous order, amendment number 1578 is agreed to. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the third time. Counter number 157, HR 748. An act to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to repeal the excise tax on high-cost employer-sponsored health coverage. The question is on passage of H.R. 748 as amended. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The court will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin. 
Final Amendment 1782. Okay. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons. Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde-Smith, Mr. Inhofe, 
Mr. Johnson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee. Mrs. Leffler, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Markley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue. Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, 